The story begins with the Sacred Lord's furious roar echoing throughout the glorious hall of the Taekshuan Sacred Land, where many people had gathered. However, the youth in front of their eyes retorted and questioned how shameless the so-called Taekshuan Sacred Land, one of the six sacred lands, really was. With clenched fists, the youth expressed how the Sacred Lord took advantage of the weak and curried favor with those in power. He pointed out that everyone did not consider the will of the saintess and married her to someone she had never met before. Rage flashed in his eyes as he declared that he did not want to be known as a disciple of Taekshuan Sacred Land if justice was not served today. Despite seeing him as brave, the disciples judged him as crazy and audacious, fearing that his actions might anger the one who came from the higher realms, and everyone would suffer in the end. The Sacred Lord remembered the youth, whose name was Yi Chen, and he came from the Tianqing region. Now that Yi Chen declared his intention to give up as an inner disciple, the Sacred Lord was enraged. His aura erupted, and a huge pressure surged throughout the room. The disciples around were affected and hurriedly braced themselves. Yi Chen, on the other hand, firmly stood his ground. Despite the immense pressure he received, Yi Chen was still righteously proclaiming his good intentions of preventing the saintess from falling into the pits of hell. This time, irritation appeared on the sacred prince's face upon hearing the youth compare the young master to a fiery pit of hell. With worry on her face, the saintess called out the young master on her side. However, the young master, Gu Changji, remained indifferent to his surroundings. The reason was that he had just woken up in this situation after possessing his current body. He calmly took the cup of tea on the table beside him. After he surveyed his surroundings, he realized his role appeared to be a villain who would be a stepping stone for the main characters and would constantly get face slapped and humiliated by them. However, he was a different villain. He had obtained a mysterious game-like system. According to the system, the fortune levels were divided from low to high, red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, blue, and purple. In front of him, he noticed Yi Chen's fortune value was green, a fortune's chosen, while he, a villain, had a dark fortune value. This color was a constant reminder for him that he did not have long to be alive. Witnessing Master Gu's silence, Yi Chen confronted him with a pointed finger as he shouted to stop being pretentious, daring him to say a word. At that moment, the sacred prince was alarmed after noticing a frown on Master Gu's face. How impudent! He immediately condemned Yi Chen's disrespectful act. The elders around further rebuked his words and accused him of having bad intentions. As more and more people complained about his pretentious behavior, Yi Chen was in disbelief. The talent he had was the highest within the sect, making it unacceptable for him to hear their words. Yi Chen was left dumbfounded. Even Su King Ji, the saintess, was not speaking up for him despite their close relationship. Meanwhile, Master Gu kept his indifference but was quite satisfied after seeing the fortunes chosen being humiliated. As Yi Chen did not receive a word from Master Gu who was lost in thought, he was further stimulated and asked what else he could do aside from taking advantage of others. Realizing Yi Chen was heedless of the consequences, the Sacred Lord's face turned grim. Seeing his chance to get on the good side of the young master had arrived, the Sacred Prince decided to take down Yi Chen. Without hesitation, he immediately made a move, and a dense aura spread out of his body as he charged at Yi Chen, who remained unmoved. In the next second, fire blazed out of Yi Chen's hands, and he challenged the Sacred Prince to bring it on. Yi Chen, engulfed in fire, received the Sacred Prince's powerful attack. As they moved, energy converged in chaos, and a massive shockwave unrolled throughout the hall as their punches met. The disciples and elders confidently believed that Yi Chen, who had the strength of the Soul Palace realm, had no chance of winning against the Sacred Prince whose cultivation had reached the pseudo-transcendent realm. Contrary to their beliefs, Master Gu thought everyone was naive. He believed that if Yi Chen could not even win a simple cross-realm battle, he would not be worthy of the title fortunes chosen. Sure enough, Yi Chen's attack intensified, and the Sacred Prince was in disbelief after realizing he was at a disadvantage. Even the remaining force pushed him back, and as his arms turned numbed, he looked at Yi Chen with incredulity in his eyes. Yi Chen was unbothered and complimented the Sacred Prince's skill with a hint of sarcasm. Even the Sacred Lord was shocked and could not believe what he had seen. The girls around turned red at how handsome and strong Yi Chen was, but they were immediately reprimanded by a male disciple who was afraid that Master Gu would take offense once he hears them. Opposite to their thoughts, he was not offended and believed it was normal for the main character to have the highest level of humiliating and face-slapping people. His eyes drifted towards Su Qingji, who had a yellow fortune value of 350, and he branded her as the female lead. 
Then he looked at Yi Chen's smug face and concluded that he had already offended the main character. A smile appeared on Master Gu's face. He asked Su King Ji if her confidence in Yi Chen was high, which made her eyes widen in surprise. However, she remained silent with narrowed eyes. Master Gu revealed his thoughts of her acting indifferent to let him think she had no relationship with Yi Chen. He asked her if she was afraid he would eat Chen and concluded she was a clever woman. Su King Ji remained still and deep in her thoughts. This time, Master Gu brought his cup down and revealed it was empty. Only then did Su King Ji look to his side. She helped him refill his cup, but due to her nervousness, she spilled some tea. Grasping her trembling hands, Master Gu claimed he was not a wolf nor a tiger and asked why she was so nervous. Despite her fearful appearance, she denied his words. However, he brought her hand and asked her to leave the tea for the servant to work on as it would be a pity if she injured her hand. In the end, Su King Ji was moved by his care. It was then that he received a system prompt that Su King Ji had a subtle change of heart, and Yi Chen's fortune value was deducted by 10. Master Gu was stunned, realizing what he had done. After Master Gu saw that his fortune value had decreased, Yi Chen's face distorted as anger rose in his heart, witnessing how the young master took advantage of his crush. An evil smile appeared on Master Gu's face, realizing the situation had become interesting. While calling for Master Gu, Yi Chen was overcome with rage and his aura erupted once more. The sacred prince massaged his wrist and claimed he was not finished yet. However, Yi Chen was infuriated and threatened to kill. Seeing how the situation had developed, Master Gu assumed Yi Chen would eventually defeat Chuck Xuan. After that, Yi Chen would issue a challenge, rely on his fortune to safely retreat, and in a few years, with his talent for cultivation, come back knocking and avenge today's shame. At that time, Master Gu knew he would be as good as dead. However, he would not leave his life in the hands of some bullshit scriptwriting. How boring. Therefore, Master Gu finally made a move that shocked the sacred lord and his daughter. With elegant and graceful strides, he floated in mid-air. Everyone's eyes widened in surprise. While everyone was stunned, Master Gu arrived in front of Yi Chen and took over the matter. Yi Chen's anger erupted, and he was not afraid of anyone. With a calm face, Master Gu replied with a question of his own. While smiling, he asked Yi Chen if ignorance was the cause of his fearlessness. At that moment, Master Gu revealed his enormous strength. Even though he declared Master Gu's actions were insignificant tricks, Yi Chen was withstanding the overwhelming aura with the utmost difficulty. Seeing that Yi Chen could still stand, Master Gu let out a disdainful sound and intensified the pressure once more. The aura was so vast that it passed beyond Yi Chen, arrived at the door, and the momentum did not stop. The door was slammed open and the aura radiated outside. The next moment, Yi Chen fell to his knees. With great difficulty, he heard Master Gu ask him if he wanted to receive a word. The other disciples were frightened at Master Gu's strength, yet they were amazed at the same time. Even Su King Ji lost control of herself and braced herself against the table as despair painted on her face. The sacred lord was determined not to offend the young lord. As for Yi Chen, he glared at Master Gu with hatred in his eyes. However, Master Gu was unconcerned since he had face slapped the fortunes chosen in public, and Yi Chen's fortune value had decreased by 10 while his fate value increased by 50. Knowing his fate value could be increased, Master Gu assumed it would raise his cultivation as well. He closed his eyes and gathered his thoughts. Soon, he appeared in a mysterious place and asked the system how much his fate value would increase if he killed Yi Chen right now. However, the system answered that those with great fortune would get heaven's protection. Taking his current fortune value into consideration, his fortune would be at risk of being eaten away. Master Gu was annoyed after knowing he would get bad luck after offending the fortunes chosen and realized his fortune value of black represented him as a villain. The system explained that fortune is an unpredictable and inexplicable factor, and it was not difficult to kill Yi Chen with his strength. However, it would trigger unknown variables. As for the reason, it was because Master Gu himself was the biggest variable. So he would not kill Yi Chen, but he would gradually increase his fortune level and strike when the time was right. The system agreed, saying the same method applied to those with a close relationship with the main character. Obtaining the information he wanted, Master Gu gathered his thoughts again. This time, he realized that forcing Su King Ji would not work against Yi Chen. A laughter of satisfaction was heard as the Sacred Lord complimented Master Gu for his fathomless cultivation. The elders also added their flowery words one after another, saying that the young master was a god among men. Despite their words of praise, Master Gu remained humble and did not think highly of his strength. On the other hand, the Sacred Prince was saddened by his poor cultivation forcing Master Gu to make a move. Still kneeling on the ground, Yi Chen's anger rose after he heard everyone's ridicule. 
With rage filling his mind, he shouted Master Gu's name and charged forward with all his might to punch that smiling face. The elders, who were flattering Master Gu a while ago, were brought into a fit of rage once again. However, Yi Chen's punch was blocked. In between, there stood a barrier Master Gu had erected as a testament to his strength. A sense of danger crept into Yi Chen's senses after his sneak attack did not succeed. He saw Master Gu lift his hand. In the next moment, as if swatting a fly, Yi Chen was smashed towards a pillar. Su King Ji covered her mouth, shocked at the scene she was witnessing. As his blood flew into the air, Yi Chen dropped limply to the ground. Seeing him sprawled on the floor, the elders condemned him further, leaving his punishment for young Master Gu's decision. Even his fellow disciples mocked him for launching a shameless sneak attack despite being spared. While Yi Chen desperately pleaded with righteousness, Master Gu turned around with a smile. After a tap of his foot, his body was lifted into the air. Passing next to Su Kingji, he invited her to watch the beautiful moon tonight. As Yi Chen continued to cry for his crush's name, the sacred lord was happily giving her away. Upon seeing the disappointed look on her daughter's face, the sacred lord frowned. The sex future for the next hundred years was in Master Gu's hands. Knowing she could not make the wrong decision, Su King Ji accepted her fate with reluctance. Realizing the situation ended with what he was most afraid of, Yi Chen was in despair. Finally, his mental state could not take it, and he passed out with extreme grievance. The system prompted again, and Yi Chen's fortune value decreased by 100, while the host's fate value increased by 500. Master Gu now knew how it worked. The fortunes chosen was nothing but a crop for his system to harvest. It was quite troublesome, but for him, the process of slowly torturing an ant till its last breath was fun. Under the bright moon, an entity wrapped in a cloak stood atop the roof, eavesdropping on the conversation between the sacred lord and Su King Ji, who had decided to accept her fate after her father explained the current situation. The sacred lord sighed helplessly as they discussed visiting the young master. However, every word they said did not escape the cloaked man's ears as he listened attentively. Afterward, the cloaked man disappeared on the spot, and in his room, Master Gu asked for a report. The cloaked man appeared before him and reported about the sacred lord and Su King Ji's meeting. Learning about it, Master Gu's interest was piqued. The cloaked man explained that while the Supreme Elder, the strongest individual in the Taekshuan sacred land, had passed away 300 years ago, the outside world had yet to learn of his death and they needed the support of the young master. Furthermore, the wife of the sacred lord, a noble from the upper realms, had been caught and brought back, causing the sacred lord to search for her using Master Gu. This brought a smile to Master Gu's face as his guess was right. He commanded the cloaked man to keep an eye on Yi Chen, who was in prison, which made the cloaked man wonder why his young master was interested. Master Gu answered that Yi Chen was blessed with great fortune and might bring him opportunities. The man did not ask further and left to complete his mission. Alone in his room, Master Gu sighed tiredly, realizing he could not easily harvest the two characters with great fortune, even though they were right in the palm of his hands. Out of the blue, the system display was distorted, and the system prompted him to receive the reward for successfully passing the beginner phase after completing the first phase slapping of the day. Seeing the starter pack, he clicked the box without hesitation and received three items, one array destroying talisman, one rainbow cloak, and one broken third of the world seed. Master Gu stared at the broken third of the world seed and realized he did not know the item. The system informed him that after he refined the complete world seed, he could nurture a world within his body and would have endless good luck and be in control of his own life and death. Realizing he could create a world within his body and escape death, Master Gu was interested. The next moment, he decided to use up all his points and increase his strength. As a magnificent aura surged around Master Gu's body, engulfing him from head to toe, he felt his body had strengthened once more. His closed eyes opened, and with a flash, his aura burst forth throughout the room. The pressure was overwhelming and it destroyed the surrounding walls. Instead of slowing down, his aura shot through the sky and could be felt even from a distance away. The disciples sensed the atmosphere getting heavy, and the terrifying pressure forced them to burst into cold sweats. Even the sacred lord, who was silently thinking about how to sell her daughter for the greatest benefits, was shocked. In another corner, Su King Ji was also affected by this overbearing might. While she was in a daze, looking at the sky with a hint of fear, light laughter resonated. A soul appeared out of her body and convinced her to accept the powerful Master Gu, who had a tranquil mind and heart. The soul believed Master Gu was more interesting than Yi Chen. However, Su King Ji turned her back and scolded the soul to shut up. In Master Gu's room, the chaos caused by destructive energy had already settled down. 
he had successfully broken through the sacred emperor realm, allowing all his talents to advance further. Although his cultivation technique, the Immortal Taoist Code, had consumed many fate points, it was worth it since the technique was high level. As long as he had the system, he would get more fate points in the future. Laughing evilly, Master Gu thought of Yi Chen, who would cultivate with all his might only to be extorted of his fortune. With a contented smile, he hoped Yi Chen would contribute a lot of fortune. After he harvested Yi Chen's fortune, it would be his death. In another place, Yi Chen's loud sneeze spread throughout the array of prison cells. Looking at his wretched appearance, he could not believe what was going on. In the past, no matter the challenge he faced, he could always escape a bad situation. When had he ever experienced such humiliation? With immense hatred, he punched the wall. His eyes glowed with anger, and he could not accept his present condition and blamed it all on Master Gu. Suddenly, his ring gleamed, and a woman's soft voice called his name. As Yi Chen looked at his side, the woman had already come out. Yi Chen stared at the woman and called her master. The woman floated in the air as the fire blazed around her body. Yi Chen straightened himself and faced his master, asking her where she was and why she had not come out to help him. The woman explained that she had sensed a powerful presence and suspected it was her enemy from the past, so she decided not to reveal herself. She asked Yi Chen not to be careless, but he was enraged and questioned her if he should just give up on his crush, especially since her physique was special. Before Yi Chen could reveal more of their secrets, the woman asked him to be silent and explained that Master Gu not only had terrifying origins, but also had powerful people as backers. They could not afford to confront him head on. However, Yi Chen dismissed her cautions and believed he was only unlucky for being defeated. The woman was disappointed after noticing Yi Chen's immaturity, but his master still cared for him and assumed there might be many powerful masters imprisoned in the dungeon with them, and there might be a way to escape. A smile finally appeared on Yi Chen's face as an idea came to mind, which dumbfounded his master even more. Yi Chen wanted everyone to know that the Taekshuan Sacred Land's Supreme Elder had already died, and no one was protecting the sect. If he spread the information, the sects coveting the dragon veins would attack and give him the chance to escape amidst the chaos. His master was worried about the Taekshuan sacred land's fate once they were destroyed and expressed that they had sheltered and nurtured Yi Chen for many years. However, Yi Chen dismissed her words, as he felt they were the ones who treated him badly, so he would let them taste the consequences of offending him. In the end, his master could only sigh. Unknown to them, their words did not escape the cloaked man's ears. Later that night, Su King Ji was having a good time with Master Gu. She was amazed after learning about the upper realm and how huge it was. Her soul also beamed with joy after she had proven that Master Gu was a thoughtful man and much better than Yi Chen. As for Su King Ji's question, Master Gu told her to see for herself whether it was big or not. She laughed dryly and said he must be joking since without the strength of a quasi-god, the realm barrier could not be broken. And nowadays, nobody would be able to reach the realm. Master Gu questioned if the quasi-god realm was really powerful, and retorted that once she reached the upper realms, they would be considered insignificant. Right then, Su King Ji leaned forward and showed her shiny pearls. She asked if he could protect her in the upper realms. Master Gu's interest was piqued, and he asked what she meant. She explained her willingness to serve him for the rest of her life. At that moment, the system prompted that Su King Ji's temperament toward him had changed, and Yi Chen's fortune value decreased by 40 while the host's fate value increased by 200. Master Gu realized that the characters related to Yi Chen could affect his fortune value and in turn, increase his fate value. He smiled with confidence knowing that things had become much easier. He expressed how her attitude changed so quickly and asked if she was sacrificing herself to him in exchange for releasing Yi Chen. Su King Ji's eyes widened in shock at his conclusion. She hurriedly denied and said she only wanted to express her sincerity, hoping he would forget what had happened in the Great Hall. Master Gu was intrigued by her words and questioned if this was how she would pay Yi Chen back despite being so infatuated with her. Su King Ji reasoned that she was incapable of resolving Yi Chen's mistakes and was only sacrificing herself for the sake of her father and the sect. Master Gu remained silent and closed his eyes. In the end, Su King Ji plucked up her courage and confessed that her bodily constitution was of the Nine Yin Mystic Beauty physique, and no one else knew about it. Right then, the system prompted that Su King Ji had begun to show slight intent of submission, and Yi Chen's fortune value decreased by 40 while the host's fate value increased by 200. However, Master Gu's hand froze not because of the rewards he received, but by the words he had heard from her. The Nine Yin Mystic Beauty Physique was an excellent physique for refining, and he was shocked at how generous she was to willingly share her secret. 
he realized she was an incredibly cunning woman who valued the bigger picture before making a decision. Master Gu could not help but laugh inside. He could exploit others, reap the benefits, and enjoy hanging out with a pretty lady while being a villain. Seeing him lost in his thoughts, Su King Ji called out to him, bringing him back to reality. He said the Nine Yin mystic beauty physique was best for refining and wondered why she told him about it easily. Su King Ji clenched her fists, knowing that her sect was built upon the painstaking efforts of her ancestors for thousands of years, and her life paled in comparison. As long as Master Gu could save the Taekchuan Holy Land from its demise, she would offer herself to him. A fascinated sound escaped from Master Gu's mouth. Delighted, he asked the system if eating her would not result in any backlash of fortune since she had willingly offered herself. To his disappointment, the system replied that the backlash of fortune would be high due to Su King Ji's and Yi Chen's current fortune. Master Gu was annoyed. Damn the heavens and his shitty fortune. He knew nothing would come so easily. He forgot about his evil thoughts and asked Su King Ji if she was not scared that he would leak her secret. She replied that her belief in his character was firm. Right then, Master Gu stood from his seat. Turning around, he clarified that he would act as if he did not hear about her secret. If she thought he would be moved by her because of it, she would be better off returning home. She was shocked after hearing his words. She stood and tried to reach for his departing visage. However, he deflected her hands away. He turned his head and, with his eyes filled with coldness, he asked her to have some self-respect. Retracting her hands, Su King Ji was left stunned on the spot. As she looked at his departing back, the words he left continued to ring in her ears. Sitting on the chair again, Su King Ji let out a sigh while her other soul was amazed at how Master Gu refused the beauty who was sent right to his doorstep. Su King Ji considered it carefully and realized he did not even do anything wrong, and it was she who thought of him as a bad guy. Under the moonlight, her sigh echoed softly. Was she wrong about him? Right then, the system prompted that Su King Ji had changed her views. Fortune value increased by 20, and fate value increased by 100. After knowing Su King Ji's character development, the villain decided to harvest Yi Chen. In the dungeon, the cloaked man reported that Yi Chen was accompanied by a remnant spirit of a once powerful master. Soon, Master Gu arrived outside Yi Chen's cell. His eyes immediately reddened in anger. Growling in hatred, he asked Master Gu's reason for coming to him. Keeping his calm, Master Gu answered he was there to visit him, but then changed his words and said he came to pay respects to his master. Yi Chen's eyes nervously darted to the side and denied knowing what he meant. Master Gu asked Yi Chen to stop pretending since he could not fool anyone with such an expression. While looking at Yi Chen's ring, Master Gu called out Senior and expressed it was unbecoming of a master to keep on hiding. Soon enough, a woman's soft voice was heard in Yi Chen's ring, declaring she did not plan on becoming enemies with Master Gu. While he sat there in shock, his master explained there was no reason to put her in a difficult situation. Contrary to her expectations, Master Gu was only curious about her since she could guide Yi Chen, who was idiotic trash. Enraged by the insulting words, Yi Chen screamed at Master Gu with an infuriated face. Not minding the main character, Master Gu continued to talk to the woman, saying there had always been incidents where pearls were put before swine and staying with Yi Chen was a waste of her talents. The woman narrowed her eyes and thought Master Gu was sowing discord between her and Yi Chen. In contrast to the woman who remained calm, Yi Chen flew into a fit of rage. Master Gu stole his crush, and now, he had his eyes on his master. Master Gu chuckled after hearing his words. He was not to blame since she did everything on her own accord. Unconvinced, Yi Chen's hatred shot through the sky. As if he could not hear Yi Chen's expletives, Master Gu brought his hand forward. As his fingers tapped on the prison's cage, cracks started to appear. With a slight push, the prison crumbled, and debris spread through the air. As Yi Chen covered himself from the aftershock, he heard Master Gu's words asking him not to hold his master back. As he stepped inside, Master Gu revealed that a remnant soul could not remain in this world for long. If the woman was willing to follow him, he could help her regain a physical body, and even return to the peak of her prime. Like a chained beast, Yi Chen exuded ferocity. He wanted to tear Master Gu's mouth apart for poaching his master in his presence. Right then, the system prompted that Yi Chen's mental health state had been continually damaged. His fortune value had decreased by 20, while the host's fate value increased by 100. He was successful, but it was not enough. Master Gu declared that he was more outstanding than Yi Chen, even without mentioning his background. And right now, Yi Chen was more of a confinement for her despite his capability of providing her with soul energy to nourish her soul. As though he could read her mind, Yi Chen asked his master to stop listening to Master Gu's words, or she might get tricked. 
However, his master's mind was in a mess. Master Gu was strong enough to kill Yi Chen without trouble, and she thought she was overthinking things as he might only be asking her to join him. She knew Master Gu had done nothing wrong, and in the end, Yi Chen was the one provoking and causing trouble. After a while, Master Gu asked her again. This time, she shook her head and declared she would not leave Yi Chen, who had saved her from her demise. Master Gu sighed after hearing her answer. He gave her some time to think it through, and once she changed her mind, he would let Yi Chen go. He could retract Yi Chen's punishment, restore his position as an inner disciple, and give him his most desired crush. Grinding his teeth, Yi Chen was about to scream once again. However, his master beat him to it and pleaded with Master Gu to stop as she appreciated his sincerity. Right then, Master Gu made a hand seal. Soon, a box appeared in his hand. He would leave a present to her before leaving. After the box was given to them, they were asked to open it. Inside, they saw the ancient soul repairing sacred medicine, the mind convergence pill. Subsequently, Yi Chen remained furious at his master for conceding to their archenemy over a single pill. Yanji, feeling irritated, questioned his accusations. She clarified that her actions were solely to secure his escape from that place. However, Yi Chen retorted that if she truly had his best interests, at heart, she should obey him and disclose the information he wanted to disseminate. Yanji could only sigh internally as disappointment welled up within her. She never anticipated that Yi Chen would say such things. With a disheartened expression, she complied with Yi Chen's demands. The system interface reappeared, confirming that a rift had emerged between Yi Chen and his master, causing Yi Chen's fortune value to decrease by 80, and the host's fate value to increase by 400. In the meantime, Ming Lao was in Master Gu's room, inquiring if the remnant soul was all he truly needed. He asked why Master Gu hadn't simply killed Yi Chen. Master Gu reminded Ming Lao of their purpose in the lower realm, to obtain the Eight Baron Demon Halberd, the ancient weapon of the Eight Baron Demon God. If Master Gu's assumptions were correct and the regular plotline unfolded, Yi Chen would likely stumble upon an ancient ruin due to his luck, gain the evil weapon's approval in the nick of time, and ultimately turn the tables against Taekshuan. However, Yi Chen now served merely as Master Gu's treasure-seeking rat. Master Gu then instructed Ming Lao to keep a watchful eye on Yi Chen before entering seclusion. Following that, Master Gu accessed the system interface and opened the system shop. He scrutinized the available items, which were divided into three primary categories, divine talents, art techniques, and supporting items. Upon noticing the second category, he swiftly selected it and instantly acquired the primordial spirit technique. A revitalizing sensation washed over him, accompanied by a terrifying roar echoing in his mind. A chaotic aura surged around him, otherworldly sounds resonated, and golden beams emanated, enveloping his body in a mystical aura, a truly extraordinary sight. Three days later, numerous formidable figures gathered outside Taekshuan's sacred land from all directions. Whether on flying boats, enchanted carriages, or riding beasts, all the forces appeared immensely intimidating. The sacred lord commented on the spectacle of having three individuals of such superior caliber, only a few steps away from the sacred emperor realm, personally leading their forces. The three lords had arrived because they heard Supreme Lord Su had perished, and they sought the dragon veins. The sacred lord angrily proclaimed that the spiritual veins had been the foundation of his sacred land for millennia, and could not be handed over so easily. He accused the three lords of hypocrisy, and questioned if they genuinely believed Taekshuan's sacred land was an easy target. Despite being unsure of the source of their information, he asked if they truly thought that, without the Supreme Elder, Taekshuan's sacred land had no one to rely on. Miss Su knew her father referred to Master Gu, which made her hesitant to disclose her last encounter with him. However, the Sacred Lord inquired if Master Gu had emerged from his seclusion. Left with no alternative, Miss Su reluctantly shared the news of her falling out with Master Gu and her uncertainty regarding his willingness to assist them. This revelation stunned the Sacred Lord. Concurrently, Kai Wuji confidently dismissed the Sacred Lord's reliance on Master Gu, claiming that the Upper Realms had long been disconnected from the sacred lands of the Eastern Wilderness. Boasting about his own abilities and the Great Sun Empire's limitless tower, he asserted that even a Sacred Emperor Realm's individual would be no match for him. As he spoke, he activated the tower, causing light to flood the sky and leaving the other lords in awe of the Imperial Artifact. As Miss Su detected something unusual near the Taekshuan sacred realm, she informed her father that she would seek Master Gu's help. Just as Kai Wuji prepared to attack, a sudden surge of energy was felt by everyone present, leaving them shocked and fearful. 
Even the flying beasts reacted, and the three lords assumed it was the work of Supreme Elder Su. The sacred lord, however, recognized it as Master Gu's aura and felt relieved. The scene then shifted back to Master Gu, who had just experienced a breakthrough. Noticing that everyone had already gathered, he grinned maliciously and prepared to make his grand entrance. Before that could happen, the story returned to Miss Su, who was hurrying to find Master Gu. Unexpectedly, someone grabbed her, it was Yi Chen. Surprised, Miss Su asked what he was doing there, but Yi Chen replied that he would explain later and insisted they had to leave immediately. Miss Su released Yi Chen's hand and declared she would never abandon Taekchuan's sacred land. Confused and frustrated, Yi Chen questioned Miss Su's stubbornness and asked if she honestly believed Master Gu could single-handedly save Taekchuan's sacred land. Doubt and disbelief clouded Yi Chen's mind as his eyes reddened with anger. He asked Miss Su if she had been coerced into this situation. In response, Miss Su forcefully told Yi Chen to be quiet, asserting that young master had never pressured her into anything. She confessed her own ulterior motives and her attempts to gain his favor by leveraging her appearance in exchange for peace in Taekchuan's sacred land. This admission devastated Yi Chen, leaving him speechless. Miss Su continued, asking Yi Chen if he would be satisfied after stripping her of all dignity. She questioned his assumption that she would betray the sect and leave with him, and what right he had to label Master Gu as the villain. She also asked if he had ever considered helping in this dire situation, expressing her disgust at his ego and selfishness. In denial, Yi Chen muttered that it couldn't be true, and he suspected Master Gu had cast a spell on her. Amidst this exchange, an interface appeared above Master Gu's head, indicating that the female lead had rejected Yi Chen, causing his fortune points to decrease by 50 and the host's fate points to increase by 250. Miss Su noticed that Master Gu was about to exit his room and worried about being seen with Yi Chen. In desperation, she gritted her teeth and stabbed Yi Chen. Yi Chen was stunned and shocked. Miss Su apologized to him, explaining that she had to sever their ties. As Yi Chen retreated, a fiery aura emerged from his wounds. Glaring at Miss Su, he declared that he understood everything now. He vowed that they would meet again in the future as he turned and fled. Miss Su, taken aback, suddenly heard Master Gu's voice calling her name. Turning to face Master Gu with a serene expression, she admitted that she had disappointed him. Master Gu, however, was visibly overjoyed, praising her for a job well done. He reminded her that the next time she encountered Yi Chen, they would have to fight to the death, asking if she would regret her choice. Miss Su confidently replied that she wouldn't, as she knew this day would come eventually when she chose Master Gu. Master Gu pulled her into an embrace, reassuring her that she could share her burdens with him from now on. Hearing these words, Miss Su's eyes widened and she dropped the sword she had been holding. This was her first time being so close to a man, especially one as apathetic, fierce, and striking as Master Gu. His comforting words left her flustered. Meanwhile, Master Gu considered that since Miss Su had decided to end things with Yi Chen, there was no need for him to keep his distance. After all, she was blessed with great fortune, and if she could prove her usefulness to him, it would be beneficial. Suddenly, a system message appeared, stating that a fortune incident had been triggered. The host's fortune points had increased by 60, and fate points had increased by 300. Realizing that he could also gain fortune points by subjugating people blessed with great fortune, rather than just targeting the chosen ones, Master Gu saw an alternative way to level up. The story then shifts to a confrontation among the elders, who questioned the sacred lord about the fluctuations they felt. If it wasn't the supreme elder, then who could it be? Although Zayajo suggested that the Taekchuan sacred realm was playing tricks on them, they would soon find out once they forced their way in. A sudden booming voice echoed from afar, telling them to shut up and alerting the three lords to his presence. Master Gu appeared swiftly before the sacred lord, insulting the three lords. Zayajo laughed and dismissed Master Gu as a brat, underestimating him. The sacred lord cautioned against this, but Zayajo still lunged at Master Gu. Effortlessly blocking his attack, Master Gu twisted his hands and pushed him back, leaving the three lords in shock. They decided to attack simultaneously. As Master Gu blocked two of the lord's attacks, the third activated his treasure and trapped him inside. Just as the three lords celebrated their victory, the treasure cracked and shattered with a mere flick of Master Gu's hand. He then proceeded to kill all of the allies of the three lords, shocking both his enemies and his allies. Before their demise, the three lords asked who Master Gu was. He revealed that he was an immortal from the upper realm. 
half a month later, he defeated the three lords in the outskirts of Jiangzhou. Legends about Master Gu spread far and wide, and gossip about Yi Chen's foolishness circulated. Upon hearing this, Yi Chen burned those who insulted him, vowing to return the humiliation he felt 100 times over to the Taekshuan sacred land. In a grand hall, the three lords of the sacred land praised Master Gu for sparing their lives. Miss Su couldn't help but laugh at their childish behavior. Master Gu mentioned that if she enjoyed it, they could have the three lords perform more. Before she could respond, an invitation arrived from the Xiao dynasty sent by the third royal prince. The invitation was extended to prominent sons of various regions for a meeting to discuss political affairs. Lost in thought, Master Gu considered the mark he left on the pill he had given to Yanji. He decided to make arrangements, and in three days, they would depart. Elder Ming Lao revealed that he was from Jiangzhou, so Master Gu told him the good news and offered him the opportunity to visit his family. Ming Lao expressed his gratitude. Three days later, the scene shifts to an academy in Jiangzhou. A teacher was discussing a lesson with her students when one of them, named Lin Chen, was caught sleeping. As the teacher scolded Lin Chen, he suddenly burst out of his chair, shouting gibberish and claiming to be a king. The other students laughed at him, but Lin Chen was still confused, asking who they were and where he was. A student sarcastically answered, insulting him while revealing that Lin Chen was possessed by the Heaven Destroyer Divine King's remnant soul which had taken control of the child's body. As this happened, a flying boat appeared in the sky, with Master Gu aboard. The system interface notified Master Gu that a new fortune's chosen had been detected and was coming for him. Master Gu and his companions were en route to Jansu. As they prepared to descend, Master Gu learned that Yi Chen's fortune value was only at 230, and he was informed about the system backlash. As a host's fortune value increases, the backlash will also gradually decrease. He now understood that an unknown variable made it difficult for the heavens to protect the chosen one. Miss Su appeared, and he noticed that her fortune value had increased, concluding that she still had secrets yet to be uncovered. He inquired about the central power in the area, and she explained it to him. Meanwhile, rumors circulated about the Lin family's ancestors returning from the lower realm to visit. Even Yi Chen heard about it. He contemplated hiding there but had plans to find the treasure. Master Gu and his companions then arrived and were welcomed by the Lin family. As the family pondered the identity of the young man who was highly regarded by their ancestor, they concluded that he was an important guest they could not afford to offend. Master Gu asked Ming Lao to enjoy his time with his family while he explored the area with Miss Su. Before the Lin family could even say farewell, Master Gu strode past them, displaying his power. The family had offered Han as a guide to escort their esteemed guest, and she eagerly accepted, introducing herself to Master Gu. He complimented her name while observing her fortune value of 200. Lin Chen, watching from the side, suddenly felt a pang of pain in his heart. He deduced that the original owner of his body had been infatuated with his own sister. However, no one could blame him. Lin Chen then noticed Miss Su's beauty and impressive physique. He was excited to see the valuable assets before him. Now able to cure his heart ailment, Lin Chen could only envy Master Gu's luck in possessing such treasures. Master Gu, noticing Lin Chen's envious gaze, observed his fortune value of 500. However, he also sensed ill intentions toward him despite having done nothing to provoke them. Master Gu believed it must be due to his sister, and thought of Lin Chen as a total weirdo. Deciding to let him live a little longer, Master Gu listened to Qi Yuhan's stories about her brother as they strolled. Qi Yuhan described how Lin Chen was once irresponsible but had recently started cultivating seriously, making a breakthrough in his cultivation and demonstrating a great talent for medicine and formation. He even corrected an elder's mistake once. Master Gu consoled her, acknowledging that Lin Chen changed because of her successful persuasion. Although she was harsh, her intentions were genuine. Kiyuhan appreciated being understood so easily. As Kiyuhan marveled at Lin Chen's transformation, Master Gu sowed seeds of doubt by questioning how he could refine pills without breaking through first and asking if she had taught him some lost ancient technique. Kiyuhan became slightly suspicious of her brother's sudden change. The system interface informed Master Gu of the rules for clearing a chosen one's fortune value and receiving additional heavenly rewards. With this knowledge, he put his plans for Yi Chen on hold to focus on Lin Chen. Later, Kiyuhan made spirit cakes for Master Gu and personally delivered them. Miss Su accepted them on his behalf, and Kiyuhan left to avoid disturbing them. Miss Su thought about how Master Gu had managed to win Kiyuhan's affection so quickly, and as he appeared behind her, he asked if she was jealous. She replied that he had a mysterious way about him, and if he wanted, he could keep Kiyuhan by his side. In another scene, Lady Lin encountered Lin Chen as she headed home. 
He warned her to stay away from Master Gu. She argued that Master Gu was humble, polite, and warm-hearted, whereas Lin Chen had nothing. If he possessed even a fraction of Master Gu's qualities, she wouldn't have to worry. Lin Chen called her stupid, and she walked away. Reflecting on Lin Chen's changes, she concluded he must have guidance from an expert. Meanwhile, the system interface informed Master Gu of Lin Qiyuhan's change in attitude and her growing suspicion of him. Lin Chen's fortune value decreased by 50, while the host's fortune value increased by 250. Master Gu surmised that Lin Chen would attack him sooner or later. Indeed, Lin Chen prepared to strike, using various means and sacrificing 15 years of his life to cast the heavenly demon outlaw curse. Sensing the attack from afar, Master Gu recognized the skill and saw it as more of an insult than a threat. He easily blocked it, breaking the curse for all to see. The curse backfired on Lin Chen, leaving him crippled, while Master Gu strengthened his soul and increased his lifespan. The system notified Master Gu that Lin Chen's lifespan had decreased significantly, and his fortune value had dropped by 150, while the host's fate value increased by 750. Smiling, Master Gu considered Lin Chen to be his own worst enemy. As people gathered outside Master Gu's abode seeking forgiveness, the clan elders decided to find the culprit to redeem themselves. Master Gu knew Lin Chen's state and enjoyed the situation. As the family members were called together, Qi Yuhen knocked on Lin Chen's door and asked him to come out. Knowing he was in trouble, Lin Chen decided to fake his death and lay low, planning to revive himself later using forbidden soul arts. He stopped his heart, and when everyone gathered to report the situation to Master Gu, they informed him that Lin Chen was already dead and asked for forgiveness. Master Gu, noticing the system hadn't notified him of Lin Chen's death, concluded that he was faking it. As events unfolded, Miss Su's other soul reveled in the power Master Gu held. A system interface appeared, notifying him that Lin Chen's fortune value had decreased by 100 due to his rejection by the entire Lin family, while the host's fate value increased by 500. Realizing he had no other choice, Master Gu decided to bind himself to Qiuhan as the elders awaited their punishment. He assured them that Lin Chen's actions were strange, suggesting that he might have a different soul in the same body. Master Gu generously chose not to blame those unrelated to the matter and let it go for Ming Lao's sake. The grateful elders left, but Master Gu asked them not to cremate Lin Chen's body. Later, Master Gu invited Qiuhan for a stroll. Over the next few days, she accepted his invitation. He wondered whether his fate value would increase if a woman related to the fortunes chosen willingly submitted herself to him, and whether the fortune value would gradually increase along with his or if that was unique to Miss Su. Three months later, young masters from the eight cities gathered in Jiangju to exchange praises. Jin Yang bragged about his little brother, whom he met in exchange for a hundred blows, and claimed he had been framed. The others were intrigued and asked for his name. Before Jin Yang could answer, Master Gu appeared with the most beautiful women by his side. They enjoyed the view and discussed the cultivation of the upper realm. Qiuhen was amazed and imagined what it would be like to go there. Master Gu invited her, but Qiuhen hesitated because of Lin Chen's actions. Master Gu suggested that if she still felt guilty, she could help him by watching over her brother's corpse, explaining that Lin Chen might try to resurrect himself. This revelation shocked Qiuhen, as it was all part of Master Gu's plan. Once she witnessed Lin Chen's resurrection, their concern for each other should end, causing Lin Chen's fortune value to drop to zero and making it pointless to keep him alive. As a servant informed Master Gu that disciples from the eight cities had come to greet him, he allowed them to enter. Qiuhan, standing beside Master Gu, noticed his indifference towards the disciples, even as they offered praise and flaunted their assets. Qiuhan's experience with Master Gu reminded her of how he treated her, making her feel special and deeply moved. An unexpected system quest interface appeared, instructing the hosts to subdue Qiuhan in order to gain 200 fortune value and 1000 fate value. Consequently, Master Gu accessed the system shop and decided to nurture Qiuhan by purchasing a beginner's alchemy manual for her. Shortly after, another quest was triggered, revealing that someone related to the fortunes chosen was nearby and the objective was to suppress the fortunes chosen's sworn brother. Master Gu deduced that Yi Chen was the target, not Lin Chen. He inquired about Yi Chen's whereabouts, and another individual from Jin Yang's past betrayed him. Master Gu confronted Jin Yang, who initially denied any knowledge. However, a sudden surge of energy filled the room, terrifying everyone. Faced with this power, Jin Yang admitted to having a sworn brother named Yi Chen. 
Although Master Gu asked for Yi Chen's location, Jin Yang remained loyal and refused to snitch. Instead, he questioned whether Master Gu might be misunderstanding Yi Chen. In response, an unseen force forced Jin Yang to kneel while his guard pleaded for mercy on his behalf. Undeterred, Master Gu summoned Ming Lao to eliminate the Jialu sacred land. Both Miss Su and Qi Yuhan witnessed Master Gu's ruthlessness, but because he completed the sudden quest flawlessly, he was rewarded with 40 additional rewards, increasing his fate value by 700. Meanwhile, the Jialu sacred land met its demise. The story then shifts to Yi Chen, who discovers his sworn brother's death through a broken pendant. As Master Gu and his companions walk outside, he asks Qi Yuhan if he frightened her. She admits she was scared, but she understands that he has been kind to her. He apologizes and presents her with the textbook. Miss Su also confesses her fear, but Master Gu dismisses her. Inside the jail, Lin Chen revives and realizes he will soon have a chance to confront Master Gu. When they eventually meet, Lin Chen feigns ignorance, but Master Gu sees through his act. As Lin Chen continues to lie unconvincingly, a heartbroken Qi Yuhan demands to know her real brother's fate. The genuine Lin Chen soul emerges and battles the imposter within his body. As a final request to his sister, Lin Chen asks her to kill him. With his fortune value reduced by 200 and the host's fate value increased by 1000, Lin Chen is left with zero fortune, activating a kill drop. Qi Yuhan is left in shock and disbelief over her brother's fate. Master Gu acknowledges that he knew she couldn't kill Lin Chen and asks her to leave and assume the role of the villain. After she departs, Master Gu reveals to Lin Chen that he was aware of his deception, faking his death to gauge Lin Chen's reaction. Master Gu's true nature surfaces as he fills the room with an oppressive aura, ultimately killing Lin Chen, absorbing the remnant soul of a divine king. Master Gu's spirit strengthens significantly. He receives his reward, along with a bonus of 150 fortune value and 500 fate value from the first kill chest and the heavenly reward chest. Now, he can convert fortune value to fate value at a rate of 1 fortune value to 10 fate value. He opens the chest and obtains three fortune plundering talismans, one broken third of the world seed, and one system reward crit talisman. The fortune plundering talisman enables him to plunder the fortunes of the chosen, with the success rate dependent on the chosen's current condition. If successful, the chosen's fortune value will drop to zero, while the host gains the corresponding fortune value. The system reward crit talisman, on the other hand, can multiply random critical hit rewards by 1, 10, or even 100. Master Gu plans to use the talisman when he confronts Yi Chen. As for the fortune plundering talisman, it's a rare item worth 10,000 fate value in the system shop. To profit from it, he must plunder someone with more than 2,000 fortune value. Master Gu concludes that he will likely encounter a fortune's chosen with a substantial fortune value. After opening the heavenly reward chest, he acquires a chosen's aura band that automatically transforms into a faded villain's aura band and one supreme heart. The difference in fortune value will be disregarded when harvesting fortunes chosen, allowing him to defeat them without facing backlash. However, Master Gu chooses not to do so, as it may result in missed opportunities and the inability to fully capitalize on the fortunes chosen. The Supreme Heart contains tens of thousands of years of cultivation from a Taoist cultivator in the Supreme Realm. Master Gu uses it and spends 3,000 fate value to increase the level of a moral Taoist code by one. He then leaves the jail, and Qi Yuhan awaits him outside. Master Gu tries to comfort her and suggests burying her brother in the hope that he can reincarnate. While they converse, a group of people from the upper realm arrives, led by Yi Chen's cousin, who aims to defeat Master Gu. They approach the Lin family and dark clouds fill the sky, demanding that Master Gu show himself. As a demon threatens the Lin family's elder, a beam of light pierces the sky, and a colossal finger materializes, reducing the demon to dust. Master Gu permits them to enter, and Auntie Zhu, who has been hiding, feels overwhelmed by a powerful aura upon entering the Lin family's residence. She recognizes the secret sovereign aura behind the strike and deduces that the young master of the Lin family is affiliated with the influential Gu family. She appears before them and tries to persuade them not to provoke someone of his caliber. Master Gu meets Yi Chen's cousin and assesses his next target. Noticing Yi Chen's luck with women and his 800 fortune value, Auntie Zhu greets Master Gu and apologizes. Master Gu inquires about their intentions, but before Auntie Zhu can reply, she asks if he is from the Great Gu family. 
he confirms her suspicion, and they realize he is the sole heir. They beg for forgiveness, but Miss Leolai refuses and insists she will never apologize. Master Gu was exhilarated by the challenge of unraveling the mystery surrounding Miss Leolai and demanded an explanation for her presence. He threatened to end her life, regardless of her ancient celestial family lineage, if she failed to provide a satisfactory answer that moment. As he unleashed a powerful aura to intimidate her, he realized that Miss Leolai remained undeterred. Consequently, Master Gu summoned Ming Lao and instructed him to eliminate one person every ten breaths, with the caveat that any resistance would result in everyone's demise. The companions of Miss Leolai urgently requested assistance in reasoning with her, but she stubbornly refused to listen. Meanwhile, Master Gu received his tea from Miss Su, and ten breaths later, the situation took a turn. Growing increasingly desperate, Miss Leolai's companions pleaded with her to apologize, their noses streaming with snot. Consequently, she offered an apology. Master Gu then instructed Ming Lao to stop, asserting that he was not a villain and would not hold a grudge. Miss Leolai's companions breathed a sigh of relief. Subsequently, Miss Leolai asked Master Gu for an explanation regarding her cousin, Yi Chen. Master Gu clarified that he had no recollection of any wrongdoing towards Yi Chen and questioned whether she desired him to take action. He compared the act of crushing Yi Chen to stepping on an ant. At this point, Miss Leolai began to doubt her assumptions, wondering if Yi Chen had lied to her or if it was all due to Miss Su. As she compared their situations, she questioned why Master Gu had killed those affiliated with Yi Chen, like the Jialu Sacred Land. Amused by her audacity, Master Gu asked if he should explain the reason for crushing an ant, releasing a glare so strong that she changed her attitude, now believing herself to be in the wrong. The system interface appeared, revealing that Miss Leolai's attitude towards the host had changed, causing Yi Chen to lose 100 fortune value, while the host's fate value increased by 500. Aware that he had planted a seed of doubt in her heart, Master Gu knew that things would become easier. He allowed them to leave, but before they did, Auntie Zhu suggested that Miss Leolai and Master Gu communicate frequently. However, he declined, dismissing her as a brat. Eventually, he decided to leave for the hidden realm which was soon to open. He intended to find Yi Chen, as the method he employed granted him knowledge of each person's exact location. In another scene, Yi Chen stood at the entrance of the Hidden Realm, equipped with the ancient key that would grant him easy access to the central region. Confident in his ability to evade any traps, Yi Chen eagerly anticipated humiliating both Master Gu and Miss Su. Yanji, however, expressed disappointment in Yi Chen's plans. In response, Yi Chen detailed his intentions to eliminate Ming Lao, asking Yanji if this would be an opportunity for revenge. Yanji acknowledged that Yi Chen's plan seemed flawless but raised the possibility that Master Gu had an alternative means of entering the central region. Yi Chen interpreted this statement as evidence that Yanji favored Master Gu over him. Heeding Yanji's warning about the servant accompanying Miss Leolai, Yi Chen decided not to confront her until he reached the Quasi God Realm. He concluded that Yanji was concerned that he would join forces with Leolai to defeat Master Gu. Subsequently, they passed through the barrier, and the hidden realm was revealed. Ning Lao informed Master Gu that the cultivators above the omnipotent realm who entered the hidden realm experienced suppression in their cultivation. Master Gu surmised that the hidden realm's opening was specifically tailored for Yi Chen, which signaled that it was time for the harvest. In due course, Yi Chen encountered his cousin, Miss Leolai. As he gazed at her with desire, Anti Zhu admonished him to suppress his lustful intentions. Yi Chen retorted that his future remained uncertain prompting Anti Zhu to express doubt about his unpredictability compared to Master Gu. Yi Chen, aware of Miss Leolai's encounter with Master Gu, inquired if she had been taken advantage of by him. Miss Leolai vehemently denied the accusation and warned Yi Chen about Master Gu's powerful family background. Undeterred, Yi Chen arrogantly dismissed Master Gu's background as inconsequential, asserting that no one in the hidden realm could rival him. Inside the ring, Yanji learned about Master Gu's background and pondered why someone of his status would allow Yi Chen to live after being publicly provoked. She deduced that Master Gu had spared Yi Chen's life to win her over. As Master Gu and his companions arrived at the Hidden Realm, they remained cautious of potential illusions and traps. Master Gu reassured them that he had devised a secure route, thanks to the imprints he had left on the pill he had given Yanji. In doing so, he effectively turned Yi Chen into his personal treasure hunter. Eventually, Yi Chen arrived at the central region, 
where he and his allies were suddenly confronted by numerous monsters. This Li Lai opted to stay behind, allowing Yi Chen to pursue the inheritance. Yi Chen agreed, and after he departed, Master Gu appeared, swiftly defeating the monsters and subduing Yi Chen's allies. Meanwhile, Yi Chen managed to open the palace door, only to find himself perplexed upon entering. He loudly questioned the whereabouts of the inheritance, and a familiar voice responded, leaving Yi Chen stunned. He asked Master Gu how he had managed to arrive there, and Master Gu cryptically replied that he had been led by Yi Chen to that location. This statement fueled Yi Chen's suspicion of betrayal, and he was convinced it couldn't have been Miss Liu Lai. He concluded that the traitor must have been his master, Yanji. Simultaneously, Master Gu greeted Yanji, further confirming Yi Chen's doubts. Outraged, Yi Chen accused Yanji of betrayal and threw the ring away. Yanji, deeply disappointed, materialized before them. With a broken heart, Yanji listened as Yi Chen continued to berate her, accusing her of betrayal over a pill. Unable to bear his harsh words any longer, Yanji decided to sever their master-disciple relationship. As a result, Master Gu gained 1,000 fate value points, while Yi Chen's fortune value decreased by 200, reaching the lowest possible value. Master Gu complimented Yanji's beauty and complexion, to which she credited the pill he had given her. She expressed gratitude for his help, acknowledging that without it, her soul might have dissipated before she could form a mortal body. Master Gu noted that it appeared Yi Chen had genuinely misunderstood Yanji's intentions, but she no longer cared. Master Gu feigned guilt, claiming responsibility for Yi Chen's misguided beliefs. Yanji appreciated Master Gu's consideration and contrasted it with Yi Chen's treatment. Despite this, Yi Chen continued to hurl accusations at Yanji, prompting Master Gu to chastise him for his treatment of his former master. He clarified that Yanji had never colluded with him and praised her character. Master Gu then revealed that he was not after the inheritance, but had come for Yanji. Moved by his words, Yanji agreed to follow Master Gu, while Yi Chen cursed them both. Master Gu struck Yi Chen with a slap before warmly accepting Yanji's allegiance. The system interface announced that Yanji had willingly submitted to him, granting him an additional 400 fortune value points and 2,000 fate value points. Subsequently, Master Gu gifted Yanji a divine soul-nurturing jade as a token of appreciation for choosing to follow him. Yanji entered the jade to rest and informed Master Gu about Yi Chen's possessions. Enraged, Yi Chen threatened the pair and used the key to activate traps and arrays against Master Gu. Unfazed, Master Gu summoned his stand, effortlessly blocking Yi Chen's attacks. Yi Chen noticed his weapon resonating with Master Gu's stand and demanded an explanation. Master Gu coldly dismissed his inquiry, stating that there was no need to inform a dying man. Yi Chen launched another attack, which was easily neutralized, causing the key to shatter. As he lay on the ground, Yi Chen struggled to comprehend why his usual luck had abandoned him and found himself on the brink of death. At that moment, Miss Li Lai reappeared, launching a surprise attack on Master Gu. However, her efforts proved futile, and Yi Chen's life now hung in the balance. Desperate to save him, Miss Li Lai attempted to negotiate with Master Gu, promising to comply with any reasonable demand if he spared Yi Chen's life. Master Gu responded by tightening his grip on Yi Chen, reminding Miss Li Lai that she had no bargaining power. Defiant, Yi Chen urged Miss Li Lai not to submit to Master Gu's demands, which only provoked Master Gu to apply more pressure. Panicking, Miss Li Lai relented, agreeing to do whatever Master Gu asked of her. Master Gu suggests that she open her sea of consciousness, allowing him to imprint a slave seal. She agrees, confident that the slave seal won't work on her due to her family's technique. However, before proceeding, she demands that Master Gu make an oath. If he breaks it, demons will devour his heart, and he will descend into the depths of hell, despised by the world. Master Gu accepts the condition. It's now her turn to keep her end of the bargain. As she looks at Yi Chen, she opens her sea of consciousness, and the image of Yi Chen is replaced by Master Gu. Afterward, Miss Li Lai demands that he release Yi Chen. Before complying, Master Gu inquires about what she should call him. She addresses him as Master, which shocks her, as she had believed a slave mark wouldn't work on her. Master Gu then clarifies that he didn't use a low-level slave mark but rather a more potent technique, the magic bottle method. Through this approach, she will gradually forget the events of today and, over time, become loyal to him. Yi Chen overhears this and curses at Master Gu one last time, believing he has immunity due to Master Gu's oath. However, he is sorely mistaken, as Master Gu reveals a devilish grin and eradicates him. As Miss Li Lai witnesses this, she feels nothing. Following Yi Chen's demise, Master Gu uses the system crit talisman to calculate the rewards. He receives a thousand fortune value and five thousand fate value, five times the original amount. 
Upon opening the chest, he acquires one broken world seed and one void marrow. He then fuses with the void marrow, which grants him both offensive and defensive spells. Afterward, he tosses Yi Chen's corpse aside to claim the weapon. As he stands before the body, the lingering soul of the Supreme Master appears, intent on bestowing an inheritance. The Supreme Master notices the evil within Master Gu and, since his Tao is light, refuses to grant him the inheritance, opting to attack instead. Master Gu attempts to sway the Supreme Master with words, but the latter sees through his lies. As the Supreme Master charges a spell to attack, Master Gu blocks it using a five-colored robe. While the Supreme Being cries out for justice, Master Gu denounces him as a hypocrite. The Supreme Being launches another attack, but Master Gu dodges it with his void skill and releases the halberd from its restraints. As the weapon emits a powerful aura capable of killing a simple cultivator, the Supreme Master charges at Master Gu but is easily defeated. Before he can dissipate, he is trapped in a vase. Everyone leaves, indifferent to Yi Chen's corpse. Meanwhile, in the upper realm, Yu Kong has become the crown princess and awaits her fiancé, Master Gu. In a flashback of her previous life, people scream in disbelief, questioning how the immortal dynasty's peerless and dignified fourth princess could be a demonic cultivator. They express horror at the thought and are grateful to young Master Gu for revealing her true identity on their wedding night. As Yu Kong struggles to defend herself, the crowd calls for the death of all demonic cultivators. Master Gu silences the mob and states that demonic cultivators cannot coexist with them by heavenly law due to their deceit and potential harm. Since he and Yu Kong were to be married that day, he must personally execute her. As he approaches her, she accuses him of cruelty, expressing shock that the person she loves the most would be her executioner. He then stabs her. In the present, Yu Kong suppresses her anger as she reflects on her sacrifices for Master Gu over 3,000 years. She disregarded everything, even going against her father, to help him establish the first immortal dynasty and clear his name as a demonic cultivator numerous times. As she waited for him during those millennia, all she received in return was a mocking smile and scornful glare on their wedding day. She had trusted Master Gu deeply, but she was deceived by his facade, becoming a pawn for him taking on the name of the one who inherited the demonic arts, only to die at his hands. Now reborn, Yu Kong is determined to expose Master Gu and strip him of everything. She plans to make him an outcast, force him to experience the same pain she endured and torture him to the brink of death. She believes their fateful encounter is imminent. Meanwhile, Ming Lao activates the Grand Noble Family's welcoming temple, designed specifically to bring the young master back to his family. It can be used across numerous realms. As they ascend the stairs, Master Gu requests Ming Lao to arrange accommodations for Miss Su and Lady Lin once they reach the upper realm. Upon arriving in the upper realm, Master Gu is greeted by his father, Lin Shen, who inquires if everything went smoothly. He adds that during Master Gu's trip to the lower realm, some old men had been secretly monitoring his actions. Master Gu responds that these individuals probably already knew he had sealed away the demonic weapon while in the lower realm. Lynchin is pleased to hear that countless cultivators have built a statue in honor of his son's achievements. Eager to see the weapon once wielded by the demon lord, Lynchin marvels at his son's good fortune and his ability to retrieve it from thin air, a method he himself cannot fathom. He commends the weapon for possessing a living spirit and advises Master Gu to keep it, as only he and his mother know about Master Gu's possession of the demonic heart. Master Gu agrees. Later, on his way to meet his mother, Master Gu's father informs him that Yu Kong. His fiance will soon accompany her father to discuss their upcoming marriage. Lynchin advises his son not to be cold towards her, as he often is with others, and acknowledges that while he once criticized her methods, he now admires her recent accomplishments. He remarks that she has the demeanor of an empress, and his wife is also quite pleased with her. Lynchin believes that if Yu Kong can assist Master Gu in the future, the entire universe could be within their grasp. Master Gu is surprised by this news, as he does not recall any affection towards her. He thinks it has always been a one-sided love from her end. However, he acknowledges her recent display of talents and wonders if she is the new girl of destiny, a fated one destined to be with the villain. What path will they follow this time? Consequently, the old men of the immortal Gu family discuss Master Gu and express their concerns that no other geniuses or sects will be able to challenge him. They lament that it seems the next lord will still belong to that family, as it has for three generations. Master Gu's cousin, Gu Zioner, speaks with Sister Tao Yao, informing her of her decision to leave. 
Tao Yao questions whether Zionor is certain, as her current cultivation level in the Sacred Lord Realm is lower than those from the Supreme Taoist sect and the descendants of the greater mortal sects. Zionor confidently affirms her decision, expressing her desire to find her family members who were exiled with her grandfather and parents years ago. She doubts she can restore her family's former glory, but she is mainly driven by her desire for revenge against her brother, who stole her Tao bone and abandoned her. Tao Yao tells Zioner that she and her masters will not interfere with her quest for revenge this time, so it will be entirely up to her. Zioner acknowledges this, expressing gratitude for the years of kindness and support from Tao Yao and her masters. As sister Tao Yao sighs with worry, she gives Zioner something to protect her when the time comes and hopes that if someone recognizes it, they will not make things difficult for Zioner. With heartfelt thanks for the gifts and the care she has received over the years, Zioner leaves, promising to return and visit once everything is over. Later, on the outskirts of Xiling Prefecture, Ming Lao speaks with the city lord, stating that he has come to search for an individual from the Gu clan at Master Gu's request. The city lord replies that a few years ago, several individuals from the Gu clan resided in the ancient King City, and some of them were experts similar to Ming Lao. As Zioner secretly witnesses this conversation, she realizes Master Gu has sent someone to find her. Having just left the Divine Barren Lands without much assurance, she decides against confronting him directly. Instead, she mentally warns Master Gu that if he dares to harm her clan members, she will kill him and scatter his ashes. This thought causes Master Gu to sneeze unexpectedly. He then opens the system interface, noticing that his luck value has reached 2,000 points, far surpassing that of other fortunate individuals. Puzzled by the color of his luck value and curious about the consequences of it reaching zero, the system explains that luck value is merely a concept it has created for the host's understanding. It informs Master Gu that his luck value will not affect his life, background, or encounters since he is an anomaly, and the laws of heaven and earth do not apply to him. To increase his luck value, Master Gu must subdue or kill those with higher luck. He concludes that luck value is similar to fate value, and since he can obtain luck value, the exchange rate between luck and fate value is one to one. Therefore, luck value serves as a savings he can exchange at the right opportunity. Grinning at the thought of his next move, Master Gu decides it's time to silence the old men. He calls out to the system, exchanging 1,000 luck values and adds the points. Suddenly, a massive surge of aura pierces the sky, sending shockwaves felt miles away. The elders are alarmed, and Linchen is notified of Master Gu's breakthrough into the Conferred King Realm. Master Gu, astonished by the Conferred King Realm, can now discern some of the temperament within it. He notices that the sets of Dao bones still seem to reject his body and concludes that this is because Zioner is still alive. As he ponders this, he realizes there are many matters that need to be addressed. Being the fated villain, he cannot expect things to go smoothly. However, simply having one advantage over the elders will not be enough to silence them. Given his newfound powerful soul, he decides it's time to learn martial arts related to it. Thus, he purchases the endless divine arts from the system shop. Meanwhile, the elders sense the pure and ferocious key emanating from him and fear there is no one else among his peers in the entire upper realm who can compare. Before they can even finish their thoughts, Master Gu requests a meeting with all of the clan elders at a later time. Master Gu thanks the clan elders for their presence and explains that the purpose of today's gathering is to make an announcement. He believes it is time to decide on the future head of the clan. The elder suggests they need more discussions to decide, as the position of the head of the family is not to be taken lightly. However, Master Gu clarifies that he thinks there has been a misunderstanding. He has invited the elders to inform them of the matter, not to discuss it. He recalls that the family rules dictate that the family head is chosen from among the strongest of the generation. If his skills are doubted, he invites them to spar with him. This angers one of the elders, but Master Gu easily interrupts and continues his speech. He asserts that if it's about his martial arts abilities, there's no need for him to elaborate. He is confident they all know that in this world, the greatest method is martial arts. Since he, Gu Changji, has stronger martial arts than all the juniors, his methods are naturally superior to theirs, as he looks down upon them. This statement angers Gu Chengxing the son of his fourth uncle, who retorts that if any of them had grown up with so many resources, their techniques would certainly be able to compete. He claims that Master Gu's only advantage is his powerful father, to which Master Gu replies that he knows they are all envious of his father. It is a convenient excuse to justify their juniors being weak, only suitable for standing below him. His father informs him that his comment was over the line. 
Returning to the matter at hand, Master Gu wants the position of the family head. He proposes that they either team up to prove their capabilities or remember to walk three meters away from him. He adds that the Gu family headship is not something they can handle. While the descendants are triggered, the elders think Master Gu is quite mischievous. They decide to go along with his plan, eager to see the level of his skills since he has never used his martial arts in public. They suspect he is hiding something. Master Gu's father, on the other hand, is pleased with his son's actions and believes the elders will agree to his request. As relatives, he hopes his son won't go overboard and will exercise some discretion in his actions. Master Gu agrees and invites them all to fight together. He offers to suppress his cultivation, lowering his realm by one or even two if necessary. This provokes Gu Chengxing, who launches the first attack. Master Gu employs his void ability to dodge the attack and counterattacks Chengxing, creating a shockwave. The elders realize Master Gu is far stronger than anticipated and believe he has been hiding the rare and powerful void ability, on par with the ability of time. They wonder if their previous suspicion about him having a demonic heart was wrong. As Master Gu stomps on Chengxing and berates him, he throws him to the side and steps to the center, proposing that everyone attack him at once to save time. So, they charge at him, but he evades their attacks, sending them flying one by one. When another tries to strike him from above, Master Gu steps back to dodge, followed by a barrage of swords chasing him from behind and another attack from the front. Master Gu activates his void skill to redirect the attack onto another opponent, defeating her instantly. He continues to evade, and when the others think he is cornered, he smirks, knowing he has successfully lured them. Master Gu then casts a mystical art called the Heavenly God's Palm, defeating all of them in one swift move. This outcome disappoints and frustrates the other elders, while Master Gu's father struggles to hide his smile. Master Gu reminds them that he did not go overboard, as they had asked, and inquires if they have any objections. The other elders ultimately agree to accept Master Gu as the future patriarch, although some remain displeased. One elder even decides to go into seclusion but is interrupted by the news he just received, questioning Master Gu about his plans to bring back a certain lineage. Master Gu feigns a sentimental expression, responding that they don't need to trouble themselves with this matter. He admits he was young and ignorant back then, and he will take full responsibility and settle past grievances himself. Although skeptical, the elder accepts Master Gu's assurance that he knows what he needs to do. The elders, convinced by his sentimental expression, believe he has recognized his mistakes and is willing to correct them. As Master Gu has proven to be far stronger than the others and has the heart to reconcile with his former kin, they have no further objections. They order the descendants to bow down to their future patriarch, and the descendants congratulate young Master Gu, who assures them he won't let anyone down. After the matter is settled, Master Gu's father discusses the day's events with him, asking if he has thoroughly thought through his decisions. Master Gu confirms that he has. Regarding the 13th uncle's lineage, he assumes his father has already guessed his intentions and knows there is still guilt in his heart. He plans to bring them back not only to pacify them so he can assume the role of the family head as a matter of course but also to make amends. His father appreciates the sentiment, but he can't help but marvel at how much more mature his son's disposition has become compared to before. Master Gu reveals his demonic nature to his father and explains that as his cultivation base rises, he gradually gains more control over it. His father inquires whether he used to be dominated by this demonic nature, and Master Gu confirms that it was indeed the case. However, it no longer affects him as much. In fact, he is grateful for it, as it has sharpened his primordial spirit and will. Upon realizing the hardships his son has endured, his father is relieved to know that the demonic nature no longer dominates him and can finally rest easy. As his father departs, Master Gu reflects on how the previous owner of his body committed numerous evil deeds which has led to his own father's skepticism. Nevertheless, he can conveniently blame everything on his demonic heart. He questions the system about his arrival in this world and whether his demonic nature will pose future problems. The system responds that the hidden dangers of the previous host have already been resolved during initialization. Although not all of his questions were answered, Master Gu feels more at ease, knowing that he is in control of his life. He then moves on to other matters. Master Gu proceeds to his room and summons Yanji, informing her that he needs her assistance. First, however, he helps her regain her physical body, much to her astonishment. Yanji recalls when she began training Yi Chen and how she had always held a glimmer of hope for regaining her physical form, never imagining it would happen so soon due to a series of unforeseen events. Yanji hesitates, prompting Master Gu to ask if she is unwilling to accept his help. 
She clarifies that she is simply puzzled by his kindness, as she has never assisted the young master before. Master Gu reassures her that he has his reasons and proceeds to provide her with flower ingredients to create her physical body. Upon successfully regaining her form, Yanji blushes as Master Gu gazes at her closely. She expresses her gratitude and vows to risk her life for any task the young master assigns. Consequently, Master Gu instructs Yanji to investigate the land of the Forsaken Immortals and report any hidden secrets within its depths. He emphasizes the importance of contacting him if she makes any discoveries. Before she leaves, Master Gu hands her a domain-breaking talisman, advising her not to hesitate in using it to escape if she encounters a formidable foe, as her safety is paramount. Yanji promises to handle the mission to the best of her abilities. Master Gu and his companions arrived at the Supreme Amethyst Pill Sect simultaneously. Lady Kyuhan observed that they indeed lived up to their reputation as a pill sect. As the young master had mentioned, she could detect the enticing fragrance of pills and herbs even from a distance. Standing near the entrance, she noticed the words engraved on the gate, which conveyed a profound sense of alchemy. Meanwhile, Master Gu commented that although the Supreme Amethyst Pill Sect was no longer on par with the ancient immortal Gu family in the Heavenly Dao Immortal Palace, they were not lacking in resources. He believed that, given Lady Kiyuhan's aptitude, if she were to cultivate her skills for a few years, her future achievements would undoubtedly be boundless. As Master Gu pondered to himself, he recalled the once famous pill sect that had faced an accident, leading to a lack of youth within the sect. If it hadn't been for the old timers, it's said that they would have been kicked out of their first class sect position. Now, he was sending them a talented disciple like Lady Kiyuhan as an investment. They would surely be grateful to him. In the future, he would only need to lie in wait for Lin Kiyuhan to bring in more fortune, without him having to do anything. He knew that life as a villain was really boring. Then, an elder rushed down to greet them and was surprised about the girl next to Master Gu. Upon inquiry, Master Gu explained that he had brought Kiyuhan from the lower realm. When he first met her, her talent for alchemy moved his heart, and he thought that the Supreme Amethyst Pill Sect needed disciples, so he decided to bring her to their sect. Naturally, the elder praised Master Gu for his magnanimous heart, and requested to become Lady Kiyuhan's master. Although Kiyuhan was unsure and uncomfortable, she sought Master Gu's opinion. He suggested that there was no need to make a decision so early, as the Supreme Amethyst Pill Sect had many elders, and she should pick the one most suitable for her. Meanwhile, other elders hurriedly approached to get a closer look at the talented seedling that Master Gu had brought to their sect, expressing their gratitude. Despite their stagnant alchemy skills, their hearing ability remained sharp. They marveled at Kiyuhan, who possessed more than one strand of innate pill intent, a talent that hadn't appeared in a million years. The elders believed this meant they could finally hold their heads high when competing with other sects. As Kiyuhan was surrounded by the elders, Miss Su couldn't help but feel envious. They asked for Master Gu's decision while fighting for Kiyuhan, causing her to retreat to Master Gu's side. At that moment, Supreme Amethyst Pill Sect Master Zai Yan appeared and requested that Master Gu give Kiyuhan to her promising to turn her into an alchemy grandmaster within 10 years. In gratitude for bringing such a talented girl to their sect and resolving their urgent need for disciples, Zai Yan offered Master Gu the Supreme Amethyst Order. With this, he could summon any alchemist from the Supreme Amethyst Pill Sect, even an elder or a peak master, but only once. Master Gu gratefully accepted the token. Master Gu then informed Kiyuhan that Zai Yan would be her new master and encouraged her to work hard and learn alchemy. Kiyuhan paid her respects to the sect master, while Master Gu jokingly warned her that he would personally punish her if he heard she was being lazy. This statement left her flustered, and the others felt somewhat perplexed. Afterward, Master Gu and Miss Su departed, and he noticed her troubled expression. He asked her what was wrong, reminding her that she had always wanted to come to the upper realm but seemed less talkative now that she was here. She confessed that she knew it was difficult to please him and now felt that he wouldn't need her anymore. Comforting her, Master Gu assured her that if he didn't want her around, he would have left her in the lower realm. He questioned why she struggled to think clearly about this type of issue, leaving her flustered and at a loss for words. As Master Gu prepared to continue his stroll, he asked if there was anything else she wanted to tell him. Miss Su revealed that she had been different from ordinary newborns since birth, not only being aware of many things but also knowing that another self resided in her sea of consciousness. Intrigued and unable to hide a smile, Master Gu asked if she meant that she had two souls in one body. Miss Su confirmed that it was similar to that. 
Master Gu mused that it was no wonder Miss Su's key had been growing secretly, and even his luck value had increased significantly. This confirmed his suspicions. He then speculated that she not only had another soul but also the memories and wisdom of its past life. He asked if the memories of the other soul were the same as her original soul. She explained that they were symbiotic, but the fog that had obscured some memories was slowly dissipating after arriving in the upper realm. This feeling had become much stronger. Despite the other soul's angry protests, Miss Su continued to share her experiences. She often dreamt of an ancient battlefield where she was like a totem, worshipped by many unseen beings. In the dream, she was hideous, cruel, and ruthless, a demon who wanted to destroy everything. As Master Gu listened, he couldn't help but think about the blocked memories and wonder if she had suffered heavy trauma in the upper realm. Helplessly reincarnated as a person from the lower realm, she became the female protagonist of the favored son of heaven. However, her origin was far from simple. After comforting her, he reassures her that everything will be alright. Although they don't know much about her unique condition yet, he already has a general idea. She possesses a rare phenomenon where one body houses two souls, each with exceptional intelligence and wisdom, difficult for ordinary people to attain. If she manages to truly fuse the souls, she could potentially gain great benefits that might help her ascend to another realm. This prospect brings her immense happiness. Meanwhile, Master Gu contemplates the situation. As for the demonic figure, if news of his demonic heart were to surface in the future, he could use her as a cover for himself. He decides that, to be on the safe side, he should inquire about the origin of her other soul. He plans to ask his mother, who is a member of the Primordial Divine Sect. If she knows something about it, she will definitely help her out. After all, the predecessors of the Primordial Divine Sect were the Primordial Demonic Sect, and he inherited his demonic heart from them. It seems that he really needs to take the time to visit his mother soon. Three days later, Master Gu is busy refining. Since he used up the entire demonic bottle last time in order to obtain the eight desolate demon halberd, he didn't expect it would take a full three days just to refine a small demonic bottle. Recognizing its effectiveness as a means to control people, he resolves to refine more of them in the future. Reflecting on his recent return to the upper realm, Master Gu acknowledges that he has taken care of most of his affairs but remains unaware of the movements of his fiancée, the favored daughter of heaven. Just then, a servant informs him that the emperor of the supreme immortal dynasty has arrived with the fourth princess, and the patriarch has commanded him to appear in the main hall for an audience. At the same time, Lin Chen greets and welcomes his brother Yu and Yuaming Kong. As they exchange pleasantries, Yuaming Kong can't help but think about her previous life. Her father had treated her harshly, but her uncle had always been kind and treated her as if she were his own daughter. She pities her uncle, who has always felt guilty about Gu Zioner. He couldn't overcome his inner demons, and his cultivation suffered a backlash when he was on the verge of making a breakthrough. Tragically, he ended up with shattered cultivation, which led Aunt Gu to fall into depression and become ill. No medicine or treasure could cure her. As Yuaming Kong reflects on the lives Master Gu has destroyed, he arrives and greets them and Yuaming Kong. They have important matters to discuss, so Yuaming Kong and Master Gu go for a stroll. While walking, Yuaming Kong notices Master Gu's stare and questions him about it. He smirks, observing her assets of 8,000 fortune value, and replies that he almost thought she was there to break off their engagement. She retorts that it was he who wanted to break off the engagement since he had always hated her. Master Gu clarifies that he was merely asking and tells her not to be so serious. Yuaming Kong thinks to herself that she is no longer the naive Yuaming Kong who is easy to coax. As for breaking off the engagement, she believes that would be too cheap for him. She plans to maintain a humble appearance before him, just like her past self, to gain his trust little by little and lower his guard. Then, she will slowly devour him. As they continue their conversation, Master Gu mentions that he has noticed significant changes in her over the past few months. She asks him what he is talking about and how she could have changed in any way. She asserts that he is the one who is different, as he never treated her with such gentleness before. Master Gu sighs with regret, admitting it was wrong of him to treat her that way in the past, and assures her that he will not do so in the future. She smiles but remains cautious, thinking that his sudden change of behavior could be deceptive. She reminds herself of her goal after regressing and wonders if he could be testing her. While lost in thought, Master Gu approaches her and embraces her to comfort her, silently acknowledging her impressive acting skills. He compares them to Lynchens, but since the system has not reacted yet, he knows something is up. At the same time, Yuaming Kong's eyes fill with sorrow as she remembers her past. She asks to leave first, and suddenly, a system interface appears, stating that the host has triggered Yuaming Kong's event. 
Yuomingkong is the favored daughter of heaven, an empress who regressed from the future. Her love for him is as deep as the ocean, but her hatred for him is rooted deeply in her bones after her past experiences. The task content offers two options. Task 1 Subdue the favored daughter of heaven, with a reward of 5,000 points of luck value and 25,000 fate points, or task 2 Kill the favored daughter of heaven, with the same rewards. Additional rewards will be settled separately. Master Gu initially considers task 2 but changes his mind, as it is not the best choice. He grew up in the family and has a good relationship with the Supreme Immortal Dynasty. Furthermore, Yuomingkong is a valuable person. He selects task 1 and receives the system's aid, which reveals Yuomingkong's identity and past to him. As he looks at her memories, he now understands why she reacted so strongly to his words earlier. In her past life, she was murdered by her beloved husband on their wedding day. Only a few can let go of a grudge as heavy as this. From what he can see, he had been taken over by his demonic nature in that timeline, and he had neither awakened the system nor his memories of his past life. However, it is now confirmed that she loved him dearly in her previous life. She must also know a lot about him. It's possible that she even knows about his demonic heart. It'll be very difficult to gain her trust, and she might even suspect that he has also been reborn given the difference in his behavior. Trying to explain himself now will only make him appear more suspicious. Consequently, he decides to change his strategy for resolving her hatred towards him. What follows next will be the immense game between husband and wife. Later, Yuoming Kong is eating with his father and uncle. Master Gu's father notices that she's gloomy and asks if that rascal Master Gu has bullied her again. Yuoming Kong is thankful and clarifies that he is worrying too much. Master Gu didn't bully her. She was just a little sad after recalling some past matters, that's all. However, Lin Chen thinks she's still protecting him even now, and wonders if he would bully her endlessly after the two of them were married. At the same time, Master Gu appears and replies that his father must be joking. Yuoming Kong is his future wife, he plans to dote on her as much as he can, and questions why he would ever bully her. As he puts food in her mouth, Yuoming Kong thinks he's putting on a lovey-dovey act to deceive their fathers. Meanwhile, the fathers see this and decide to give them enough space, pretending to be drunk already and leaving. After that, Yuoming Kong stands up and asks if he is still going to continue the act. She adds that their marriage is set in stone, and it won't change even if he treats her with the same indifference as before. She inquires about his intentions behind all this, to which Master Gu replies that she didn't use to be so wary of him in the past. He wonders what made her change so much in the last six months and asks if her weakness and fragility have been an act all along. If so, he will have to praise her for her scheming. Yuoming Kong now believes that Master Gu doesn't know about her regression and was not reborn with her. She realizes that Master Gu's probing today was all to find out why she has changed recently. If that's the case, then it seems she has been a bit hasty. She asks herself why she always loses her composure when Master Gu is in the picture. At the same time, she feels an attack, so she blocks it, while the food is sent flying all over the place. Master Gu now knows she's at the peak stage of the conferred Lord Realm, so he pulls her closer, causing her to be flustered. Yuoming Kong then steps away from Master Gu and states that he was right. Everything she did previously was just an act to get close to him. But she soon realized that it's better to strengthen herself instead of wasting her time and efforts on moving a heartless man. After all, one's own strength speaks for oneself in this world, where only the strong rule. He is amazed that she's already learned how to respond on the fly, so he approaches her. Yuoming Kong advises Master Gu to stop trying to deceive her and adds that she knows full well what he's like deep down. He asks her what he is like deep down, which makes Yuoming Kong angry, and she launches an attack. Master Gu blocks it and pins her against a pillar. She asks what he wants, and he replies that the night is still young. What does she think he wants with his wife? Consequently, they spend the night together. After that, the sun has risen, and Master Gu wakes up on his bed alone. He thinks it's fine if she leaves, but did she really have to take the bed sheet? He can't help but think that her mentality is quite outstanding and finds her to be an interesting character. If it weren't for the grudges they've had in their past life, he'd really like to be able to treat her unbiasedly. Then the system interface notifies him that Yuoming Kong's thoughts on killing him have wavered, and the host receives 500 fate value and 2500 fortune value. It seems the situation is exactly as he thought. The current Yuoming Kong is now unsure why he is so different from her past life. She might even suspect that the changes in him are due to a regression. Whether she is the rational or emotional type, most women trust in their sixth sense. As long as he leaves her a few hints, she'll naturally come to her own conclusions. Even Yuoming Kong is not immune to her own over-imagination. 
Now that the trivial problems are solved at the moment, it seems like it's time to bring forward the matter of going to the Taoist Immortal Palace. While Yuoming Kong is on the carriage, she thinks that during this trip to the Gu family, many unexpected things happened. But why is it that the advantage of her regression doesn't seem to give her the upper hand on him? Although she has lived through two lifetimes, she can't see through him at all. Meanwhile, Yanji is running away from an attack and thinks to herself how her young master knew that there would actually be a mysterious village here and that the peach tree should have disappeared centuries ago. As she activates her domain-breaking talisman to escape the attack, she intends to report this to the young master immediately. Later, Zioner is walking through the market, trying to find something she can afford. The more she thinks about it, the more furious she gets. If not for her cousin Master Gu, she wouldn't be in this situation where she can't even afford roadside stall goods. Then a man named Jin Yu appears before Zioner and introduces himself, asking how he should address the young lady in front of him. But before he can finish, Zioner tells him that there's no need to trouble himself because she's not interested. Despite her disinterest, Jin Yu continues to pester her and even asks if she knows who he is. She still doesn't care, so he decides to take a more aggressive approach. Suddenly, a dragon descends from the sky, and Master Gu can be seen riding it. The people welcome him, and he thinks to himself that Yanji just reported back to him on the situation of Peach Village. What are the odds of him running into her here? Just as he predicted, there is indeed a heaven-defying existence behind her. But right now, it seems she has encountered a bit of a sticky situation. Jinyu orders his men to take down the girl in front of him, but Master Gu instantly defeats them. This angers Jinyu, but Master Gu says it's been a long time since they've met. Jinyu, thinking that Master Gu is talking to him, greets him but is ignored as Master Gu goes over to Zioner directly. He quickly states that she has already grown this tall and become this pretty. Jinyu, embarrassed, asks Master Gu what the meaning of this disrespect is, but he's instantly slapped. Master Gu asks him who he thinks he is to dare interrupt him when he's talking to his little sister. The bystanders are shocked by this revelation. Zioner tells him to shut up, arguing that if he truly cared about her as a sister, he wouldn't have been able to do such a thing back then. Meanwhile, Master Gu couldn't help but smile as he looked at her 9000 fate value. He mentioned that they were finally meeting after such a long time, yet she treated him with coldness, which hurt his feelings. She retorted that if he had come all this way just to show that he controlled her whereabouts, he needn't have gone through all that trouble. The difference in their strength was far too great, and she had no intention of making a move against him for the time being. Acknowledging her self-awareness, Master Gu responded, and then Jin Yu angrily reminded him that they were both head disciples so it was unreasonable to insult him in this manner. Was he looking down on his family name? In response, Master Gu teleported in front of him, stating that Jin Yu wasn't even worth looking down upon. He reminded Jin Yu that only he could bully his sister, and if Jin Yu dared to bother her, he would have to pay with his life. He then swiftly eliminated the two goons accompanying Jin Yu, while Jin Yu himself used a talisman to escape with his soul intact. Yanji asked young Master Gu if it was okay to let Jin Yu escape like that. Master Gu replied that Jin Yu was still useful and would eventually die by his hands, so it didn't matter when. Bystanders were amazed at how easily Master Gu defeated Jin Yu, even though they were both head disciples. They admired his breakthrough into the conferred king realm at such a young age, making him the only young supreme in that realm. However, they were also worried because Jin Yu had a powerful older brother rumored to be in seclusion. Their family was known to be protective of the younger ones. Zioner then rebuked Master Gu, stating that she wouldn't thank him for his actions. He replied that he didn't need her gratitude, as he simply wanted people to know that only he had the right to bully her. Irritated, Zioner told Master Gu to stop being so fake and asked about his motives. Master Gu approached her and suggested that perhaps he felt guilty and just wanted to make amends, which made her blush. However, he added that it might also be because he enjoyed seeing her hate him but was unable to do anything about it. She vowed that sooner or later, she would make him suffer and go through the pain she once endured. Master Gu encouraged her while patting her head. Suddenly, the Taoist Immortal Palace's law enforcement team arrived at the scene and asked Master Gu to cooperate. They explained that, as a head disciple, he knew the rules of the Immortal Palace and hoped he wouldn't keep them waiting concerning the day's incident. Master Gu complied, saying he might as well go and pay his respects to the elders. As Master Gu was taken away, Zioner wondered about his motives and whether he really came that day just to toy with her. If he truly offended the other head disciple because of this, it would be too big a price to pay. Zioner noticed that Master Gu's actions were more peculiar compared to the past, though he was still as ruthless as ever when executing those men. 
His eyes didn't even falter, as if taking their lives was as simple as stepping on a few ants. Regardless, she knew she must be careful when practicing in the Taoist Immortal Palace in the future. On the other hand, Jin Yu ran to his brother, asking for vengeance and claiming that Master Gu went too far. If it hadn't been for the magic talisman left behind by the clan elders, he feared he and his brother would have been separated forever. Jinju responded that he had already been informed of what happened and believed Jin Yu was partly to blame. However, as this concerned the pride of their family name, he would seek justice for him. After all, the Golden Horn clan couldn't be easily messed with. Yet, his ancient arts were now at a bottleneck, and he was no match for Master Gu. So, he advised Jin Yu to stay underground for a while, assuring him that once he broke through, Master Gu would merely be a stepping stone in his journey to becoming the strongest of his generation. Later, Master Gu arrives at the Boundless Mountains and was welcomed by everyone. He asked if anything had happened during his absence, and they replied that other than a few head disciples and elders sending people over to check on his whereabouts, not much had happened in the boundless mountains in the past six months. They were, however, uncertain about what opportunity had befallen the eldest prince of the great Chu Taoist Empire, who had broken through to the peak of the conferred Lord Realm after returning from the Celestial Tombs. He was now one of the first elite head disciples. In addition, Yinmei from the Nine-Tailed Fox Clan asked them to convey to Master Gu that she had matters to discuss when he returned, and she would pay a visit again. So he was intrigued by the news. Later, Master Gu discovered he had broken through using 8,000 fate value to upgrade his cultivation to the mid-stage conferred King Realm. In order to act covertly outside, his father planned for the immortal Gu family to take over the Taoist immortal palace by making him the designated heir. With all the head disciples, including Chu Yunian, far less capable than him, this shouldn't be an issue. However, even as the heir, taking over the palace meant dealing with the annoying elders, especially the Great Elder, who had a fearsome reputation in the upper realm. The Great Elder was unyielding like iron and seemed to be aware of his demonic heart. Having supported the Taoist Immortal Palace for millions of years, this towering and immovable pillar was not someone to be trifled with. Ever since he returned to the Upper Realm, the demonic force in Master Gu's body had been increasingly trying to force its way out. He believed it was because he had swallowed the origin spirit of the ancient Emperor and Lynchen. The immortal devouring demonic art allowed him to swallow Emperor Origins and devour worlds. Determined to see how far his demonic body's cultivation had reached, Master Gu had activated a formation to seal its presence. A terrifying aura gushed out from him as he broke the chain of the demon within, releasing its power for him to see. The palace was flooded with demonic ki as his cultivation increased, reaching a quasi-heavenly god realm. Now, Master Gu saw his greatest trump card, a quasi-heavenly god realm. This unbelievable cultivation speed was enough to make enemies with the whole world. Devouring beings as nourishment to strengthen oneself was a method even more fascinating than the system's extra points. Making enemies of the whole world. To hell with that cannon fodder villain route. Master Gu decides to be the final boss. A beautiful nine-tailed fox woman came to greet Master Gu. As Master Gu approached her, he couldn't help but think that, given her current demeanor, it was hard to believe she once tried to kill him in the past for the position of the true heir. However, after he cast a demonic spell on her, she became much better behaved. While caressing her tail, Master Gu mentioned that the half-year period for her symptoms was nearly due, so he gave her some medicine, which she happily accepted. Subsequently, he inquired about her collections. She reported that during the past six months, she had gathered the source blood of many individuals with special bloodline physiques. These individuals were all currently residing in the treasury. In addition, she had preserved numerous ancient corpses stolen from various clans, keeping their essence intact for her master. Recently, she heard of a young teenage girl at the foot of the mountains with exceptional innate talent who was being favored by the Great Elder. If everything went as planned, it seemed that the Taoist Immortal Palace would be welcoming a new disciple. Master Gu was aware of this girl named Zioner, and it appeared her journey up the mountain had been quite smooth. At this moment, Zioner was with the Great Elder, who acknowledged that her purpose for coming here was to outshine her brother and reclaim what was once hers. She responded that she already had new Dao bones and didn't need to take back anything. However, she vowed to make her brother pay for the years of pain and seek justice. The elder laughed, praising her ambition and deeming her worthy of being the favorite. 
He then mentioned that young Master Gu's devilish nature was too deep-rooted. He wanted to use the Dao bones to mask his demonic nature, and the Elder could sense it from the day they first met. The successor's position at his Taoist immortal palace could never be handed over to someone with evil intentions. So, he asked Zioner to prove that she was capable of surpassing her brother. When she inquired how she could prove herself, the Elder responded that she must beat young Master Gu's record on the heavenly Dao path. She was already aware that her brother had surpassed all his peers and set a new record that had remained unbroken for 100,000 years. With the termination, Zioner declared that she would definitely break that record, which delighted the Great Elder. Just then, a dragon appeared, which turned out to be Chu Wunian of the Great Chu Taoist Empire. The dragon transformed into a human and greeted the Great Elder. Chu Wunian noticed Zioner, acknowledging her extraordinary talents. The Great Elder asked him to guide Zioner to the Heavenly Dao Road, and Chu Wunian agreed. As they flew to their destination, Chu Wunian engaged in small talk, sympathizing with Zioner about her past and how cruelly her brother had treated her. Zioner, however, told him to focus on leading the way and that he should express his grievances to her brother directly not involving her in their family matters. Her words made Chu Wunian ponder. He wondered why Zioner would consider Master Gu as her enemy, given her unusual attitude when his name was mentioned. Soon after, they arrived at their destination. Chu Wunian warned Zioner one last time about the pressure on the Heavenly Dao Road. Suddenly, Master Gu appeared, teasing that he hadn't seen her for a few days and she already had a suitor. He jokingly suggested that she should let her big brother evaluate the newcomer. Zioner was undeniably a natural beauty, but she was curious as to why Master Gu was there. He reminded her that she had yet to answer his question. She clarified that Chu Wunian was merely her guide, not her suitor. Master Gu expressed disappointment, as he had hoped to test the suitor's worthiness, ensuring no unworthy individual would gain her attention. Chu Wunian requested that Master Gu cease his cynicism, as Zioner was following the Great Elder's orders to challenge the Heavenly Dao Road. He asked if Master Gu intended to obstruct them, to which Master Gu scoffed at the notion of using the Great Elder's name to pressure him. He questioned if Chu Wunian really believed he would interfere in trivial matters involving the younger generation. Moreover, he was speaking to his sister, so Chu Wunian had no right to interrupt. Chu Wunian warned Master Gu not to think he could push people around. In response, Master Gu provoked him. Fellow disciples discussed how Master Gu was clearly attempting to assert dominance. Although Chu Wunian's strength was far superior to theirs, they feared Master Gu was even stronger. Chu Wunian's chances of winning a fight were slim but he could recover from a defeat. If he backed down without fighting, his Dao heart would be damaged, leaving no chance for a comeback. Thus, he had no choice but to fight. Chu Wunian decided to test Master Gu's abilities and attacked with his royal dragon palm. However, Master Gu effortlessly dodged the attack. He taunted Chu Wunian, asking if this was the source of his confidence. Then, with just a finger, he broke Chu Wunian's arm, sending him flying into a column, defeated in an instant. Onlookers were in shock at Master Gu's strength, now at the mid-stage conferred King Rel. His title as the strongest head disciple was truly deserved, and his power left them speechless. Meanwhile, Chu Wunian, undeterred by the mid-stage conferred King Rel, activated his dragon transformation skill, the true dragon body. He launched another attack at Master Gu, determined to defeat him and prove his Dao heart. Master Gu merely smiled and, with a powerful slap, knocked him out with a single blow, leaving him unconscious on the ground. The bystanders were left in shock, and Zioner couldn't help but admire her brother's strength. Master Gu looked down at the defeated Chu Wunian, while Yin Mei asked why he didn't just kill him. Master Gu replied telepathically that Chu Wunian was the heir of the great Chu Taoist Empire and killing him in public would inevitably invite trouble. Today's action against Chu Wunian served not only to assert authority in public, but also to warn the elders of the Taoist Immortal Palace that no one else was qualified to fight for the position of the heir as long as Master Gu was present. As he looked at Zioner, he stepped forward and asked if she was moved by her brother, who had taught him a lesson. She responded that she didn't need his help in her matters. Master Gu reminded her about the things he had told her. Chu Wunian had schemed this, and on her way here, he secretly spread word of her intent to challenge the Heavenly Dao Road. This brought the disciples of his sect to gather here and seize the chance to mock her. As a despicable schemer, Master Gu thinks he deserves to be punished. Then, Master Gu warned everyone present that only he could bully his sister. Should anyone else dare to do so, they would pay with their life. While he pondered the situation, he realized that, 
According to the normal trope, after being rejected by Zioner, Chu Yunyan would feel resentful, scheme against her, and have the entire sect come and mock her. Zioner would then put on a spectacular performance, slapping everyone across the face. At the same time, she would seize the chance to challenge her brother. However, he planned on doing the exact opposite of this, completely messing with her little head. Master Gu, excited to see her performance, thought it wouldn't be difficult for her to reach his record. Hearing this shocked her, she couldn't believe that her brother had faith in her. He responded that she was being a silly girl because he had seen her hard work over the years, asking who else would believe her if not him. This wasn't what she had expected, which played with her mind a bit. Did that mean he knew what she had been through all these years? Did he know where she was hiding but never thought of coming to kill her? And what he did back then, was it forced upon him by some hardship? But she came to her senses, realizing that something so abominable could not be justified with the word hardship. Master Gu called out to her because everyone was waiting for her to challenge the Heavenly Dao Road. So she went over to start the challenge. The bystanders were all surprised, asking if all Gu family members were freaks because she climbed past the 10th level like it was nothing. On the 15th level, even Chu Wunian had only managed to reach the 14th level back then, and she was still going strong. On the 18th floor, the previous record of True Disciple Gu seemed destined to be stomped on. While nearing her brother's record, she realized the Dao Bones and the Heavenly Dao Road had the same Dao principles. The reason her brother thought she would easily surpass him was that he already knew about this. He had Dao Bones within him back then, and he probably had more than enough strength to keep going. So even if she broke his record, it proved nothing. Therefore, it was no longer necessary to continue, and she jumped down from the Heavenly Dao Road. This shocked the bystanders, who questioned her actions. After she descended, Master Gu teased her, saying that he wasn't going to care, but she had let her brother down. Her brother had high expectations of her, but was that all she was capable of? This annoyed her completely, as she said that sooner or later, she would beat him fair and square. He responded that he would be waiting. Meanwhile, at the Obsidian Sky Ancient Immortal Clan Z family, Auntie Zhu asked her lady if she was still angry about the matter with Yi Chen since a few months had already passed. She asked what Auntie Zhu was talking about, because Yi Chen was merely a malicious ant, so why would she be bothered by him? She just felt that ever since coming back from the lower realm, something was missing from her memories, and yet there was something extra. Then, the young master of the ancient immortal Yi family, Yi Langshan, appeared. She asked if he had recently heard anything about the young master of the ancient immortal Gu family, Gu Changji. Indeed, it was him, so he asked why his little sister mentioned Master Gu again. He had heard that some time ago, Master Gu had descended to the lower realms to find something, and by chance, she encountered him. Now, she was so concerned with him. Did that kid bully her? She replied, asking what he meant. She was just a bit curious about him, after all. He was regarded as a young supreme on par with her elder brother. She had heard that not too long ago, he easily crushed the young master of the great Chu Daoist Empire. He had also already broken through to the mid-stage of the conferred king realm. So, she warned her elder brother that he shouldn't treat him lightly. This made him smile and say he had heard a lot about Master Gu. Everyone called him the reincarnation of an ancient emperor, but Master Gu was known as the reincarnation of a true immortal. Ancient emperors were pioneers of new lands, bearing the weight of heaven's will, and supreme emperors of all. Having the title of an ancient emperor or a true immortal already said a lot. Master Gu had already broken through to the mid-stage of the conferred king realm. While he had just stepped into the conferred king realm, the gap between them was significant. Suddenly, a servant appeared, informing him that a young man by the name of Yi Ling had come again, and he wished to challenge him to make a name for himself. Many people had already gathered at the martial training field. She asked who Yi Ling was, and Yi Langshan explained that Yi Ling had won first place in the clan competition recently, so the clan promised him three rewards. One of them was to have the chance to challenge him for a duel. He wished to seek justice for hurting his father back then during the struggle for the position of heir. She asked again because her elder brother had already compensated them for this matter, and she remembered them accepting the compensation. He agreed that she had not misspoken, but fate was on his side, causing his cultivation to soar. Now, he was taking the opportunity to claim that the main branch looked down upon the outer branches, sowing discord within the clan. It sounded respectable on the surface, but in truth, he was taking this opportunity to make a name for himself. Therefore, he decided to go, because no matter his intentions, the clan's promise must be honored. 
In another place, inside the Supreme Immortal Dynasty's Eternal Day Imperial City, Yuamengkong was deep in thought. According to her previous life, the extreme heaven would soon appear. It was an ancient realm that would manifest in many areas. This matter would become the highest priority for all races and heritages. All the great teachers from all factions would collaborate to form the True Immortal Academy where they would select the best disciples from every faction to raise into true immortals. The immortal road of the Taoist immortal palace should appear soon as well, and her good husband must have schemed for so long and entered the Taoist immortal palace for this reason. Back then, the appearance of a heavenly treasure, the immortal spirit, sparked a mad rush among the most powerful figures to claim it, but it disappeared at a crucial moment. Now that she thought about it, the immortal spirit must have been swallowed up by Master Gu using some secret trickery, right under the noses of those terrifying ancient supreme monsters. As she thought about Master Gu, she knew that he possessed a forbidden demonic art, and his real cultivation wasn't as simple as it seemed. Even Zioner's unfortunate fate, having her cultivation base stolen and her disappearance, was likely linked to Master Gu. Therefore, she decided to use Zioner as a pawn to unveil Master Gu's true intentions and expose his mask. She was confident that she would protect her in this life. Moreover, she believed that the successor of the ancient emperor of reincarnation would appear at this time. She knew she must obtain the ancient reincarnation talisman he held. She remembered that he was called Yileng. Meanwhile, Master Gu was with Sayaner and the Great Elder, creating an awkward atmosphere. The Great Elder urged him to speak his mind, asking him not to beat around the bush. Master Gu responded that he simply wanted to express his gratitude to the Great Elder for accepting his little sister, Zioner, as his disciple. The Elder assured him that Zioner was a gifted child and that he would guide her with the utmost care. However, the Great Elder appeared to harbor some prejudice against Master Gu. As her older brother, Master Gu naturally hoped Zioner would one day surpass his achievements, and he did not feel the need to pretend to be good. The Great Elder questioned Master Gu's intentions, asking why he had stolen Zioner's Dao bones back then. Master Gu insisted it was a personal matter within the Gu family, and that he would find a way to repay Zioner. He urged the Great Elder to focus on his role in guiding Zioner. The Great Elder decided to let go of his grievances, and asked if there was anything else on Master Gu's mind. Master Gu shared his concern that the Great Elder might be too harsh on Zioner because of his own actions. This statement angered the Elder, causing the atmosphere to darken. He asked if Master Gu was questioning his character. Zioner intervened, trying to defuse the situation. She reassured her brother that her master was kind and not what he was implying. Master Gu responded by questioning Zioner's understanding of the dangers in the world, adding that some old men could be very bad. His words triggered the Great Elder, who couldn't believe that a junior would dare speak to him in such a manner. Although he knew Master Gu was deliberately provoking him, the Great Elder agreed to train Zioner until she could easily surpass her brother. He even vowed to step down as the Great Elder if he failed to do so. As the heir of the Immortal Palace, Master Gu knew this was not impossible. He smiled, thinking that he had achieved his goal. Zioner believed that her brother had provoked the Great Elder to ensure he would be more attentive in teaching her. However, she couldn't help but wonder if there was an ulterior motive behind his actions. As she pondered this, the system informed Master Gu that his fate value had increased due to his actions. Master Gu thanked the Great Elder and assured Zioner that he wouldn't disturb them any further. As he left, the Great Elder acknowledged that Master Gu was skilled at scheming, and it was no wonder he had risen to his current position. He believed that Master Gu would one day be among the world's elite. Zioner asked her master if he was alright, and he responded that her brother's actions had truly angered him. He urged her to train hard to defeat her brother. Zioner then asked her master about the hidden secrets surrounding her brother's demonic nature. The Great Elder admitted that he couldn't see through the mystery, but suspected that Master Gu's demonic nature was influencing his actions. Meanwhile, Master Gu prepared for the imminent opening of the Immortal Road. He focused on developing his inner world, created by the world seeds. He learned that fate value could be used to evolve anything, and he used it to create a temple within his inner world. He felt a sense of control and fascination with the inner world he had created. However, he still needed one crucial piece of information, the exact date when the immortal road would open. He suspected that only his fiancée, who had regressed, would know this. If she was truly seeking revenge, she would not miss this opportunity. At this moment, Yuaming Kong was seen riding a divine phoenix across the ancient city of Black Rock. Someone appeared, impressed by the prestigious mount and wondering if Yuaming Kong was some sort of royalty. Suddenly, the amulet reminded the man, Yuling, not to be distracted by mere appearances and to focus on seizing the lucky chance inside the heavenly palace. Yuling asked the amulet not to worry, as he was only taking a brief look. 
They were not far from the immeasurable heaven ancient city, and it wouldn't take much time to get there. He mused about catching a glimpse of a beauty being a fleeting dream and wondered if she would even be his type. Meanwhile, Yu Ming Kong pondered the significance of the location. According to her memory, this was the place where the descendant of the ancient emperor of reincarnation first made a name for himself. From the ancient immortal Yi family, Yi Langshan, had also suffered significant losses during their challenge. He was later completely defeated in battle and even had his title as heir snatched away. In one fell swoop, the individual gained fame, made numerous friends among the ancient clans, and even surpassed Master Gu's limelight. However, his current cultivation should, at most, be in the conferred Lord Realm. This presented the perfect opportunity to seize the ancient reincarnation talisman. This area was the only entrance and exit point to the ancient city of Black Rock. Yu Kong was confident that she would obtain the ancient reincarnation talisman eventually. When Yu Ling arrived at the ancient city, he noticed a sudden feeling of unease. He asked his turtle bro if he felt it too. The turtle mocked him, as he was typically quite bossy when flirting with arrogant girls, and asked if he was chickening out. But before Yu Ling could respond, he noticed an attack being cast upon him. He managed to block it with his amulet just in time. Yu Ling quickly realized the situation was dire as he saw the sacred realm masters. He asked them why they attacked him when there was no bad blood between them. Yu Kong appeared from above, answering that he was merely guilty of having too much talent. While Yu Ling blushed to see her up close, Yu Kong added that she needed to borrow his reincarnation talisman for an important matter. This surprised him as he had never revealed it to anyone. Yu Kong responded that he didn't need to know how she knew and that she wouldn't discuss it with him. The sacred realm masters had already aimed for him from all sides. The turtle warned Yu Ling that if he wanted to live, he should use his secret technique quickly. With no other choice, he activated his trump card, and a great sacred realm aura burst into the sky. Realizing he was using a secret technique, the sacred realm masters decided to protect Yu Ming Kong. However, they were too slow. Yu Ling was already in front of Yu Ming Kong, who realized the immense power he was capable of controlling. Enraged, Yu Ling launched a ferocious attack on her, as he had painstakingly collected and refined such energy for tens of years to finally reach so high, only to lose it all here. The turtle suddenly urged Yu Ling to retreat, as a powerful aura descended from the sky. It came from an actual great sacred realm cultivator. Taking advantage of the jade talisman's blessing, they hurriedly escaped. Yi Ling cursed at them and vowed to return for his revenge. Yu Ming Kong, now realizing that it was no wonder Yi Ling had escaped from Master Gu's grasp in her previous life, lamented her underestimation of his trump card. She had failed this time and feared that it would be harder to succeed in the future. Her subordinates arrived late to protect her, and she thanked Yanji for saving her. Yu Ming Kong then inquired about the senior's origin. Yanji informed her that young Master Gu had instructed her to tell Yu Ming Kong to go to Boundless Heaven. If she did not go to see him, he would personally come and take her there. Heavenly Dao Ancient City was about to host a banquet at Heaven Facing Tower's Myriad Dao, and young Master Gu hoped she would not delay. Shock was evident on Yu Ming Kong's face, as she wondered when her fiancé had acquired a great sacred realm woman by his side. This had never been the case in her previous life. As soon as she entered Boundless Heaven, he had sent a great sacred realm expert to invite her. As a regressor, she should have been ahead of every opportunity, but now she had failed to acquire the reincarnation talisman, and even her own whereabouts seemed to be under Master Gu's control. She pondered why the number of variables had increased ever since she returned from the lower realm. It was as if all her actions were being calculated by him. With a sigh, she realized that she would indeed have to figure out his true intentions later in Heavenly Dao Ancient City. Master Gu, meanwhile, was thinking about the Taoist Immortal Palace. The Immortal Road would be opening soon, and those old bastards must have been very busy. Yet, they were still hosting a myriad Dao banquet to assess each major power. Although the Taoist Immortal Palace had controlled the Immortal Road for thousands of years, countless opportunities lay within. This time, it was even rumored that the birth of an immortal spirit would occur. In the face of such benefits, even the Taoist Immortal Palace had no choice but to open their doors to talented youths from different large powers, so as to avoid being the target of many powerful groups. In the Tao Palace of the five most powerful true disciples, after discounting those who were injured and in seclusion, Master Gu wondered who else was there. Since this was a competition among the younger generation, the Great Elder would certainly weigh the pros and cons that his entrance to the Immortal Road would bring. At least during this period, he wouldn't overtly oppose Master Gu over his position as heir. Suddenly, Yanji appeared before Master Gu, reporting what had happened and that Yu Kong seemed to want something from Yi Ling. Intrigued, Master Gu asked if they had succeeded. 
Ganji responded that they had not and explained the events that had transpired. Master Gu thought about the information he had received from Yanji, the strange venerable youth, and the familiarity of the situation. The system then notified him of the appearance of a new faded one, with a new mission in progress. This excited Master Gu, who instructed Yanji not to scare the prey away, and to avoid being spotted for the time being. So she agreed, since the system recognized the presence of the faded one, Master Gu knew he would certainly meet this person. However, as the system had not yet given him a mission, it must mean that the Faded One was still quite far away. This was not a bad situation, as the Myriad Dao Banquet was near at hand, and Master Gu had some time to spare. He could meet a few acquaintances and probe around for more information on this new Faded One. Meanwhile, a group of non-immortal palace disciples was conversing about the Myriad Dao Banquet. Their sect had sent them to attend, and they must have had some sort of assurance for them to enter the Immortal Road. Normally, non-immortal palace disciples would never have such an opportunity. The lady responds, stating that if only it were that simple. She adds that the so-called Immortal Road is more like a part of an ancient, immoral continent, teeming with hidden opportunities. Who wouldn't want to monopolize it? This time, the Taoist Immortal Palace is incredibly generous. It's astonishing how they have given in to the pressure of great powers like their sect. The Dragon Lady interjects, mentioning the Taoist Immortal Palace and the young master of the Gu family. With him around, it is nearly impossible for the rest of the younger generation to seize any opportunities on the Immortal Road. The Lobster Humanoid exclaims that they are seizing all the opportunities and challenges the others, questioning if they think Master Gu can seize everything. With a united effort, even an elephant can't withstand the bites of a thousand ants. His companions find his bravado amusing, especially since he accidentally compared himself to a mere ant. Suddenly, their attention is drawn to Langshan's arrival. Upon his arrival, Miss Leolai asks her brother if he thinks Master Gu will come. He reassures her not to worry, as Master Gu represents the Taoist Immortal Palace, it's only natural for him to be present. The young master of the White Tiger family, Bai Lai, welcomes them, only to mock Langshan. He laughs at him, asking if he is ashamed to be here since he had heard Langshan suffered a massive loss at the hands of a branch disciple a few days prior, ending the fight in a draw. He then adds that there is no need to feel ashamed. After all, Bai Lai and Yiling are sworn brothers and are well aware of each other's strength. Miss Li Lai retorts, asking what Bai Lai is so proud of. Master Gu suddenly appears and greets everyone. He acknowledges Brother Yi who is often mentioned alongside him as one of the two young supremes. He didn't expect to meet him today. Langshan welcomes Master Gu with a smile, stating that his arrival is just in time. As the representative of such an important event, it's only natural for Master Gu to be present. Bai Lai stares intently at Yinmei, while Master Gu greets Miss Liolai. Langshan bows and expresses his admiration for Master Gu's strength, saying that their reputations are well justified. However, he believes that being named together with Master Gu is falsely praising him. Miss Lilai chimes in, explaining that her brother's mindset has been affected by the tricks of a branch disciple. She adds that Yiling has gone too far, using the pretense of seeking justice for his father to manipulate public opinion within the clan, tricking her brother into suppressing his cultivation and accepting his challenge. This revelation prompts Master Gu to think about Yi Ling's manipulative tactics. Master Gu then addresses the gossip surrounding Yin Mei's and Bai Lai's relationship. He inquires about Yin Mei's silence, asking if it's due to his presence that she is acting so reserved. The bystanders wonder about the relationship between Yin Mei and Bai Lai. They have heard that Master Gu is domineering in the Taoist Immortal Palace, and many of the elders dare not offend him. Since Yin Mei also cultivates there, perhaps she is holding back for fear of the consequences. This provokes Bai Lai, who tells Master Gu not to harass Yin Mei and to back away from her. Master Gu questions Bai Lai's statement, asking if there is a problem with showing concern for a sect peer. Bai Lai warns him not to underestimate his resolve. Master Gu then challenges Bai Lai, staring him down and asking if he is looking for a fight. Yin Mei intervenes, pleading with Master Gu not to make things difficult for Bai Lai, and asking him to forgive any offense Bai Lai has committed for her sake. Bai Lai realizes that Yin Mei was pretending not to recognize him in order to protect him from Master Gu's wrath. The bystanders speculate whether Bai Lai and Yin Mei will face dire consequences, as Yin Mei has just stood up to Master Gu for Bai Lai's sake. However, they believe that since Yin Mei is from the same sect as Master Gu, he will not raise his hand against her on this occasion. 
The lobster humanoid scoffs, thinking there is nothing great about Master Gu and believes that the group of humans are all cowards. Master Gu decides that since Yinmei has begged for mercy on Bai Lai's behalf, he will let the matter go. Yinmei thanks her senior brother Gu and assures him that this will not happen again. Master Gu then orders Yinmei to come with him, further angering Bai Lai. Yinmei agrees, admitting that her senior brother is right to scold her. Bai Lai feels helpless, cursing at Master Gu in his mind and vowing that when he breaks through to the mid-stage of the conferred king realm, he will make Master Gu pay for the humiliation he suffered today. As the two leave, Yinmei asks Master Gu if he plans to attend the Myriad Dao Banquet, where the prosperous youngsters from various regions are currently dining. Master Gu replies that there is no need for that anymore. He wonders if Yinmei is curious about why he involved her in such a dramatic act with him, only to let Bai Lai go in the end. She confirms his suspicion, adding that Bai Lai was the one who started the conflict in front of everyone. Even if Master Gu had given him a harsh punishment, she doubts that the White Tiger Clan would have intervened to help. Master Gu clarifies that Bai Lai is not an idiot. Even without the events that transpired, he would not have taken the initiative to offend Master Gu. However, because Yinmei protected Bai Lai, everyone now sees him as a coward who can only argue while hiding behind a woman. In any case, the young, aspiring Supreme could only ride and watch as his fiancé was played around with by another man. He couldn't take this humiliation lightly. After all, hadn't he said before that Yiling was his best mate? To save his fiancé and avoid humiliation as quickly as possible, he decided to team up with Yiling the brand new Supreme whom everyone was unfamiliar with, who had just revealed himself. Master Gu chimed in, stating that this was exactly what he had hoped for. After that, he revealed it was about time for her to discreetly greet her fiancé. He guessed he was probably not feeling well right now. She informed him that she understood. Meanwhile, Bai Lai was furious as his servants tried to comfort him. Stubbornly, he believed that if it weren't for his limitations, he wouldn't have allowed Master Gu to humiliate him to such an extent. When the right time came, he would ensure Master Gu tasted the same humiliation. Later, upon seeing his fiancée, Yinmei, Bai Lai happily greeted her and asked if the bastard had done anything inhumane to her. Tearfully, she responded that what had happened was her fault. She hadn't expected Master Gu to do such things. Before she could finish, Bai Lai comforted her, saying he understood where she was coming from. Master Gu could only be so outrageous within the Taoist Immortal Palace, and he was moved that she had stood up to help him. Yinmei explained that she couldn't move around easily during the Myriad Dao Banquet, and was afraid he would misunderstand. That's why she had come to see him. She leaned on him, saying she was scared and asked if he could take her home when the Immoral Road opportunity ended. He embraced her, assuring her not to worry. When the Immoral Pathway opened, he would definitely team up with Yiling to seize the opportunity. By the time he ascended midway through the King's Realm, he would make Master Gu suffer the same way she did. He then took out a jade charm from his inventory, telling her that he would always be in the Taoist old city. If she felt wronged in any way, she could contact him through the charm at any time. He gave her the charm to protect herself and advised her to return if there were no more matters to discuss. He didn't want Master Gu to embarrass her if he discovered her missing. With that, he pushed her away, closed the doors, and cried emotionally. On the other side, Yinmei felt indifferent and left without a problem. Meanwhile, Bai Lai was still in his loving moment, thinking that Yiling had probably arrived at the Taoist old city by now. He decided to go and reconnect with him. Later, Yinmei reported what had happened and gave the jade to Master Gu. Master Gu thought Bai Lai was head over heels and laughed. If the charm could reveal his location at any time, it would make it much easier to locate Yiling. He praised Yinmei and instructed her to keep an eye on Bai Lai's location at all times, informing him immediately if Bai Lai came into contact with Yiling. Suddenly, Yuamingkong arrived, riding a phoenix. Witnessing this, Yi Ling concluded that the one who had ambushed him was Yuamingkong. He decided to settle new and old matters with her later. Master Gu greeted Yuamingkong, mentioning that it had been a long time since they last met, and teasingly asked if she had come because she missed her fiancé so much. She responded with a straight face, telling him to quit dreaming and not think too highly of himself. He feigned hurt, and annoyed, she asked him why he had sent that woman to inform her to visit. Caught off guard, he jokingly asked if he detected a hint of jealousy in the air. She pushed him off, and he explained that Yanji was a capable woman he had brought from the lower realm, and she could also be considered one of his admirers. He then inquired if Yuaming Kong was jealous, to which she replied that he was too self-obsessed, and urged him to get to the point about why he had asked her to visit. Master Gu playfully accused her of being boring, mentioning that he had heard from Yanji that Yuaming Kong had led four sacred realm masters to capture a man who had ascended to the conferred lord realm but had failed. 
He asked her what the man had done to offend her and suggested discussing it with her fiancé. With a grin, he added that he would go kill him and avenge her. Hearing this, Yu Mingkong was surprised that a person as cold as Master Gu would be concerned about her. She believed he didn't know about Yuling's special abilities yet, so why did he want to kill him? She asked if he was going to kill him without knowing whether he was right or wrong. He replied that it wasn't important if she wanted him dead. He would help her kill him. Yu Mingkong was shocked that he would help her kill whomever she wanted. She couldn't help but smile, thinking that Master Gu was probably the only person who could say something so sinister while being so at peace. She now believed that if she was the only reason he wanted to kill Yu Ling, that meant he actually cared about her, even if just slightly. The system informed him that the favored daughter of heaven, Yu Mingkong, had changed her attitude, resulting in an increase of 800 luck points and 400 fate points. He tried to ask her again, and she shyly replied that she had happened to catch a glimpse of the inheritance of the ancient heavenly emperor of reincarnation in some old scrolls. However, when she went to look for it, she found out that Yu Ling had already gotten to it before her. He pretended to be shocked, jokingly saying that meant she wanted to kill someone and steal their treasure. He expressed his surprise at Yuan Mingkong's ruthlessness, saying he had thought the other party had offended her, but it turned out she was the one plotting to murder him for his opportunity. He hadn't thought Yuan Mingkong would be such a person. Embarrassed, Yuan Mingkong stared at the ground, realizing that he wasn't in a position to scold her. She tried to hit him, saying he was hardly a good person himself and that he was the ruthless one. How could she even compare to him? He continued to annoy her, blocking her attack and holding her hand. He told her that he meant that if she wanted to do something like it, he would handle it for her. He couldn't let such a small inconvenience dirty the hands of his precious lover, making her blush. Meanwhile, the elders were in a meeting, discussing the opening of the Immortal Road, which was now an inevitable event. Young geniuses from various major heritages have gathered at the ancient heavenly city, eager to enter it. This prompts the elders to discuss their thoughts on the matter. One elder believes that the issue needs further discussion, as the Immortal Road is a mysterious and dangerous place. If the disciples were to be injured or lose their lives while venturing there, it could lead to awkward situations for the elders who may be blamed for not providing sufficient protection. This sentiment is supported by a female elder. Although there are many opportunities within the Immortal Continent, numerous dangers also exist. Different regions of the continent can be unpredictable and potentially harmful. Even the female elder would need time to adapt to the structure of the place, let alone the younger generation entering it for the first time. The possibility of a large number of them getting hurt or even dying is significant. The fiery elder suggests that if it were up to him, he would let the young disciples go at their own risk. Since they are eager to join, they should not hold the elders accountable if anything goes wrong. This opinion is met with agreement from the other elders. Despite the gathered young supremes being a formidable force, it would be embarrassing for the Taoist immortal palace, as the host, if they failed to achieve success in this event. The fiery elder points out that among the five true disciples in the palace, Chu Yunian has returned to the great Chu immortal empire with a damaged Dao heart, and the other three are in seclusion. In his eyes, the remaining true disciples are not skilled enough to represent the palace, causing the other elders to hesitate. The Great Elder notices their gaze and asks why they are looking at him in this manner. He wonders if they think he would take revenge on a private matter in public or if they cannot think of anyone to choose for this situation. The Elder responds that the Great Elder is a generous person, and they would not assume that he would seek revenge on the younger generation. However, if they were to send young Master Gu, his current position would still be problematic. The Great Elder believes that this opportunity would provide young Master Gu with enough leverage to attain his desires. Despite his elusive and incalculable actions, young Master Gu remains a disciple of the Taoist Immortal Palace. No matter how selfish he may be, he wouldn't dare turn his back on the palace and end the line of ancestors. The Gold Elder adds that, in his opinion, young Master Gu representing the palace is not a bad idea. He is the strongest among his peers and possesses the temperament of someone they can rely on. Thus, he deserves a status befitting his abilities. The position of the heir has been vacant for some time, and it is an issue that must be resolved. However, before the Gold Elder can finish speaking, the Great Elder interrupts, stating there is no need for further discussion. He understands the situation and will take the embarrassment upon himself, deciding to visit young Master Gu. Meanwhile, Zioner breaks through and is visited by Yu Mingkong. Yu Mingkong acknowledged her study under the Great Elder and was bored, so she decided to pay Zioner a visit. She also reveals that her brother, Master Gu, has left the Immortal Palace, and she is not aware of his whereabouts. This news upsets Zioner, and Yu Mingkong notices her expression. Yu Mingkong warns Zioner not to be easily provoked and advises her not to start a conflict with her brother until she has refined her own skills. She promises to think of ways to protect Zioner until she is strong enough. Surprised by her kindness, Zioner thanks Yu Mingkong but declines her help. 
Yu Mingkong admits that she may be trying to alleviate her own guilt and uneasiness by helping Zioner, and perhaps repay some of the wrongs Master Gu has committed. Zioner realizes the depth of Yu Mingkong's feelings and learns more about her one-sided relationship with her brother. She sees Yu Mingkong as someone pitiful and deserving of sympathy. At this moment, Master Gu reflects on his recent cultivation progress. After absorbing all the resources Yin Mei collected for him, his cultivation ascended to the Heavenly God realm. Now, he only needs to monitor Yu Ling's whereabouts, which would make dealing with him from the shadows easier. As a transgressor, Yu Ming Kong's greatest ability is to predict future events, so she likely knows about more opportunities than Yu Ling. Originally, Master Gu wanted to learn more about Yu Ling from her, but she left the Immortal Palace shortly after he departed. Master Gu concludes that she must be visiting Zioner when he is suddenly approached by the Great Elder. Greeting him, Master Gu wonders what brings the Great Elder to see him. The Elder retorts that he doesn't need permission to go anywhere within the Immortal Palace. Master Gu agrees and adds that he is feeling tired and was about to rest. If the Great Elder has no intention, he requests that he return which angers the Great Elder. Young Master Gu advises the Great Elder not to threaten him with Zioner, as it won't work. This further infuriates the Great Elder. As their argument continues, Zioner and Yuomingkong arrive at the scene, questioning the meaning of the commotion. Master Gu accuses Zioner of planning to take revenge on her brother after ascending her realm. Before Zioner can respond, the Great Elder stops her and asks her to remain calm. The Elder then inquired if young Master Gu still remembered the bet they made that day, mentioning that Zioner standing before him today might have the chance of gaining the upper hand. He responded that he, of course, remembered their bet, stating that if she couldn't beat him, he would let her have the position of heir. However, she had only just ascended to the conferred Lord realm. Mockingly, he asked if the Great Elder couldn't wait for him to take up the position of heir or if he was now competent for that role. While the Elder tried his best to control his anger in front of his disciple, Master Gu pointed out that the Elder was putting too much importance on the position of heir, speaking as if he couldn't live without it. The Elder asked if he was asking for more than what he was worth, pondering if he had anticipated this development. Master Gu replied that it didn't need to be framed like that, as this was something beneficial to both parties, how could he be asking for more than his worth? Hearing this made the Elder laugh, admitting he had met many shameless people but had never encountered anyone as shameless as him. He then asked what he needed to give him to secure his agreement, warning him not to overstep. Master Gu's request was simple, he would be the future palace master, and the elder would owe him a favor. He reassured the elder that he wouldn't go overboard with the favor. This made the elder consider that, whether it was the future position of palace master or a personal favor from him, both conditions were reasonable and within his capabilities. There was no reason for him to decline this offer. It seemed that everything that had transpired so far was within Master Gu's calculations and intricate schemes, and the elder had underestimated him. Consequently, he agreed to the requests. Master Gu stated that the Elder's words were reassuring, but he still wanted him to swear on this matter by his Dao heart, which triggered the Elder's anger once more. Zioner tried to defend the Elder, claiming that her master would definitely keep his promises and asking if Master Gu was questioning her master's morals. With a straight face, he confidently replied that she was being silly, for why would he ask the Elder to swear an oath if he didn't doubt his morals? This left them all speechless. Therefore, the Elder swore by his Dao heart that if he violated his promises, he would be struck to death by heavenly tribulation, his soul scattered, his primordial spirit perishing, and he would never be able to enter the cycle of reincarnation again. Angrily, he left. Afterward, young Master Gu called out to Zioner with a gleam in his eyes, alarming them. Yu Mingkong tried to protect Zioner, but she insisted there was no need and told her brother to let them settle all their grievances that day. Master Gu questioned Zioner, asserting that even her master couldn't defeat him in a duel, and asked if she genuinely believed she stood a chance against him. She retorted that he couldn't know if she could beat him if they hadn't tried yet. As she charged toward her brother and leaped to attack from above, Master Gu dodged using the void. However, Zioner had anticipated this move and followed his trail to his next teleportation point, attacking with the blue flames of the three-talent sword. Her attack was blocked by Master Gu's finger as he chided her for being naive. He stated that she had just broken through the conferred Lord Realm and already wanted to kill him, demonstrating that she didn't have a clear understanding of her own strength. He then broke her sword into pieces, leaving shock on her face. Master Gu continued, saying that she talked about wanting to kill him every day but failed even when given the opportunity. He compared her to reckless little children, adding that she had disappointed him greatly. Hearing this, Zioner questioned herself. Why was he disappointed? Wasn't he supposed to be happy because she failed to beat him and he easily surpassed her? What did he mean by encouraging her in cultivation just so she could kill him? As Master Gu pointed his finger towards her, he said he would go easy on her punishment that day. 
With a flick of his finger, she received damage to her forehead. He warned her that if this happened again, he would throw her into a latrine and confine her there for three to five years. He advised her to go back and keep practicing, as he didn't have time to play children's petty revenge games with her. Frustrated, Zioner stood up and shouted that if he had tried so hard to embarrass her just so she would kill him, she would do just that. He advised her to make such a statement when she had the ability to actually do it. Suddenly, a surge of aura came from behind, prompting him to look back and see what it was. It turned out Zioner had activated her trump card, a blade piercing the skies, shocking the onlookers. Even the Great Elder could see it from afar, recognizing the old monster's sword intent, and wondering how Zioner had obtained such a thing. It appeared that Master Gu wouldn't walk away unscathed that day. As Zioner used her soul-shattering slash, Yu Mingkong shouted for her to stop. Regaining her senses, Zioner yelled at her brother to get out of the way. Master Gu, realizing the extent of Zioner's hidden power, chose to directly receive her strike, saying that it would count as payback for her pain. Concern filled their eyes as Master Gu remained motionless, the attack cleaving the land and sky in half. Zioner doubted herself, filled with questions, why didn't he dodge? She had even cut back on the power of her slash. Did he actually want her to kill him? She almost succeeded, had she misunderstood him all along. Yu Mingkong rushed to her fiancé, worried and scolding him for his overconfidence. She told him that even if this was an act, what if Zioner hadn't held back at the last moment? That slash could have been the end of him. He responded that he simply wanted to repay her a little for all the years of suffering she had endured, surprising both Yu Mingkong and Zioner. Yu Mingkong continued to scold him, while the Great Elder acknowledged Master Gu's unparalleled ruthlessness, admitting that he had underestimated him. The following day, everyone was abuzz with talk about Master Gu. He had been named the heir of the Taoist Immortal Palace and had been severely injured by his sister, Gu Zioner. Meanwhile, Master Gu was in his room, tending to his wounds and reflecting on the situation. He thought to himself that it was no surprise the trump card of the fated saintess had such destructive power. However, he couldn't let his wounds heal too quickly or his act wouldn't be convincing. This injury was a necessary part of his plan to earn Zioner's complete trust. Ultimately, she would be the one to remove the Dao bone, setting the final step of his plan in motion. As he changed his clothes, Master Gu mused about Zioner's actions. Despite facing her greatest enemy, she had held back. He thought of her as a naive girl, easily manipulated and unable to escape his control. Recently, it seemed that Yuming Kong and Zioner had joined forces, which likely meant they had reached some kind of understanding. Yu Mingkong, possessing memories of her past life, knew about Zioner's fate and had likely sought an ally to confront him. This strategy was consistent with her usual approach. Just then, Yu Mingkong knocked on the door to meet Master Gu. Upon entering, she inquired about his well-being. To his surprise, she seemed genuinely concerned for him. He playfully pretended to be in pain, and she handed him some pills to aid his recovery. When he asked her when she started caring about him so much, she replied that she had always cared. It was just that he had never paid enough attention to notice. As they talked, she informed him that the heavenly road would open in a few days, and many talented young individuals from various backgrounds were already forming secret alliances. She suggested that he take a walk down the peak when he had the time. Master Gu considered her words, acknowledging the potential threat but confident in his ability to handle it. He needed to create an opportunity for Zioner to accidentally discover his true secret. Meanwhile, others were discussing recent events, including Master Gu's injury and the fact that Yi Ling had fought to a draw with the reincarnation of an ancient emperor, Yi Langshan. They speculated that Yi Ling might even challenge the young master of the Gu family. Although Yi Ling had been in the spotlight lately, it wasn't clear whether he could stand up to Master Gu. In another conversation, Langshan expressed surprise that he had been dragged into the matter with Yi Ling. Master Gu dismissed the issue as insignificant, claiming that Yi Ling was like a little grasshopper that could be easily stomped to death. Langshan admitted that he had initially underestimated Yi Ling, which had led to a draw and fueled rumors of a challenge. Master Gu speculated that Yi Ling might have some strong support or even an inheritance to explain his bold behavior. Langshan agreed, adding that when he had fought Yi Ling, his attacks had been unusual and he had been able to counter Langshan's mystic assaults. Master Gu suggested that both he and Langshan had similar suspicions about Yi Ling. His daring actions were likely due to a powerful figure backing him. Langshan was taken aback to hear that Master Gu also believed Yi Ling had obtained some sort of inheritance. Meanwhile, Yu Mingkong wondered about her fiancé's intentions and whether he planned to reveal that Yi Ling had received the ancient Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's inheritance. Master Gu mentioned that he had heard of many outstanding disciples from various heritages disappearing or having their cores stolen. At this point, Yu Mingkong realized that Master Gu intended to create the same disaster as in his previous life and shift the blame for being the inheritor of demonic arts onto someone else, with Yi Ling as the scapegoat. Yu Mingkong looked extremely mad as she thought of the past. 
she clenched her hands together to suppress her rage. Master Gu noticed her actions and smiled when he realized that Yu Mingkong had finally realized his intentions. He reached out to touch Yu Mingkong's hands, which surprised her. He acted concerned and asked her what was wrong and if she was feeling unwell. Yu Langshan placed his fist over his mouth as he told Master Gu that his relationship with Yu Mingkong was enviable, while Yu Liu Lai, behind her, was crossing her arms and chewing on her hair to suppress her annoyance. Master Gu immediately apologized to Yu Langshan for bearing witness to the scene that just happened and said that the recent disappearance of cultivators frightened Yu Mingkong, for which she shyly apologized as well. Yu Langshan looked deep in thought as he told them that not many people noticed the disappearances when they first began. But after the number began to increase continuously, cultivators started to take note of the matter and have kept everyone on edge. This was particularly because the cultivators who disappeared were not at a high cultivation realm. Yu Lai's eyes widened, and her iris turned purple, a sign that she was under demonic manipulation. She interjected in the conversation, agreeing with her brother and adding that there was an even stranger event where someone dug out various Taoist cemeteries and robbed the ancient corpses within them. Master Gu placed his hands on his chin to appear as though he was deep in thought. He agreed with what Yu Liu Lai just said and suggested that these events had something to do with the taboo inheritance that was destroyed by many Tao cultivators long ago. With a surprised look on his face, Yi Langshan confirmed with him if what he meant was that the taboo inheritance had reappeared. Master Gu responded that it was possible, as he had heard that cultivators who practiced such forbidden inheritance consume the remnant souls of corpses to cultivate, which seemed to be in conjunction with the recent events. Yi Langshan paused for a moment to think, then asked Master Gu if Yi Ling's sudden rise to power had something to do with those events. Master Gu smiled inwardly, as he had been waiting for Yi Langshan to say those words. But he maintained his composure on the outside as he told Yi Langshan that he had done a thorough investigation on Yi Ling, and that he was born a talentless cultivator in a collateral branch of the Yi family. He had no background or resources, so it was suspicious that his cultivation realm had increased so much in such a short period of time. Yi Langshan swiftly stood up and exclaimed that the current matters were of great importance, so he must leave and report them to the elders. While he called on Yi Liu Lai so they could leave, Yi Langshan cupped his fist to Master Gu as he bid his farewell and told him that he would be seeing him again once the path to the heavens was opened. Master Gu responded by giving his farewell too and telling him that he wouldn't be seeing him out. Yi Langshan went to the door and made his way out while Yi Liu Lai lagged behind him, looking back at Master Gu with a sad expression on her face. As soon as they closed the door behind them, Yu Mingkong immediately told Master Gu that his methods were terrifying. Master Gu smiled smugly at her and asked her what was terrifying about his methods when he was helping her by doing them. He added that Yi Ling had to die either way, and it just so happened that it was easier to kill him this way. Yu Mingkong looked at him suspiciously and told him that she hoped what he was saying was true. Master Gu turned his back to her and looked out the window. The space beside him started to warp as he called for Elder Ming and ordered him to find a nearby place to rest for the night. Elder Ming cupped his fist and agreed to his command. Yu Mingkong was surprised that they were not returning. Master Gu smiled sinisterly and told her that he needed to make a breakthrough in his cultivation and watch the show. Meanwhile, at a residence, Yu Ling was politely thanking Bai Lai for all the cultivation resources he had given him. His cultivation would have never increased so much without his help. Bai Lai just laughed and told him that there was no need to be polite between them as they were brothers. Yu Ling and Bai Lai were drinking at a round table with two other men while a huge lobster was already drunk and sitting at the back of the room. Yulin brought up that he had heard about Yin Mei offending Master Gu for him and praised her, saying that there were no other disciples of the immortal Taoist palace that would do such a thing. The other man with red hair added that there were not many women in the world who had come as far as her and Bai Lai was lucky to have her. Bai Lai's face was already beat red as he laughed and proudly accepted the compliments for his woman. He then proceeded to inform them that Yin Mei coincidentally had the time to leave the immortal Taoist palace, so he asked her to join them, and then he asked if anyone had an issue with it. Yu Ling looked extremely excited and said that he could never have an issue with it as he heard that she was breathtakingly beautiful. Bai Lai glared at him upon hearing those words. Yu Ling cleared his throat and immediately changed the topic back to Master Gu. He told Bai Lai that there was no need for him to worry about him, as Master Gu's cultivation realm was only a little higher than his. Once he broke through to the intermediate stage of the sacred sovereign realm, nobody in their generation would be able to rival him. The other guy with horns laughed and agreed. Meanwhile, the huge lobster was still chugging alcohol and drunkenly talking about Master Gu being undeserving of his reputation, and how he was not scared of him. Bai Lai pumped his fist in front of him and said that his white tiger clan was no weaker than the immortal Gu family, so he was not afraid of Master Gu in the least. 
He even added that strong cultivators like him would not be defeated over little losses. He then could not help but wonder and asked Yi Ling why he would challenge Master Gu, to which Yi Ling confidently answered that Bai Lai's enemies were naturally his enemies as well. Thinking of Yu Mingkong, Yi Ling smiled sinisterly and confirmed with them if that woman was Master Gu's fiancée. Bai Lai looked serious and alarmed as he asked Yu Ling if he wanted Yu Mingkong, the fourth princess of the celestial Wushuang dynasty. Yu Lin nonchalantly waved away Bai Lai's concern and asked if anyone wouldn't want her. Then he said that if he had the chance, he would pursue her. But then his expression quickly changed, and his face twisted into anger as he remembered that Yu Mingkong had tried to murder him a while back, so he wouldn't let her off so easily. He then smiled sinisterly as he said that he would have a go at her fiancé first, Master Gu. Yin Mei suddenly burst through the door and called for Bai Lai. Bai Lai's face lit up, and he was extremely happy when he saw her. Yi Ling turned to look at her, and his face was filled with surprise. He immediately stood up and greeted her, calling her sister-in-law. He told her that she had come at the right time as Bai Lai was just talking about her. He offered her a seat and offered to pour her a glass. Bai Lai gestured to the seat beside him and told Yin Mei to sit there. The two other men chorused as they gave her compliments, saying that she was really gorgeous. Meanwhile, Yin Mei apologized that she had kept them all waiting and explained that a lot of things happened at the Immortal Taoist Palace, because it was just announced that Master Gu would be the true heir to the palace, and his initiation ceremony was approaching very soon. Yin Mei turned to look at Bai Lai, and with a downhearted look on her face, she told him that if it weren't for the fact that she left the palace that day, she wouldn't have had the opportunity to see him. Bai Lai was furious, and he cursed Master Gu as he slammed his fist on the table while Yin Mei tried to console him, saying that she was fine. Yu Ling interjected with their conversation and proudly asked Yin Mei if she had heard about his upcoming duel with Master Gu. He assured Yin Mei that nobody would be able to lay a hand on her as long as he was there. Yin Mei smiled brightly as she told Yi Ling that she had heard quite a few rumors. She said that he not only fought against the reincarnation of an ancient emperor, Yi Langsham, but even challenged Master Gu to a duel. Yi Ling was flattered by her words, and he laughed, proudly saying that although Master Gu was extremely strong, he was not afraid of him like everyone else was. Bai Lai was giving Yin Mei the side eye as she continued to laugh and praise Yi Ling for being reliable. Both Bai Lai and Yin Mei were surprised when Yi Ling suddenly stood up to get a glass. He told them that it was rare to see everyone gathered, so he offered for everyone to drink a glass together. While complimenting her beauty and telling her that he could now understand why Bai Lai was thinking of her day and night, Yi Ling gave the glass to Yin Mei, who readily accepted it and thanked him. Yin Mei closed her eyes and drank from the glass without hesitation. Yi Ling told her that it was rare to see someone as straightforward as her, then held her hand that was holding the glass and offered to fill it up for another drink. Yin Mei pulled her hand close to her, her face full of hesitation as she turned to call out and look at Bai Lai beside her, who was now glaring daggers at Yi Ling. Yi Ling was surprised at Bai Lai's reaction, while the two other men knowingly stared at each other. Yi Ling backed off and laughed, saying that it was getting late and he must be drunk, so he wouldn't be bothering them anymore. The two other men cupped their fists to Bai Lai and bid their farewell too, adding that they would meet again once there was news about Master Gu, to which Bai Lai waved them off and bid everyone good night. Yi Ling opened the door to see themselves out while being followed by the two men who were carrying the huge drunk lobster in their arms and who was drunkenly talking about Master Gu having a taste of his strong claws. Without looking back, Yi Ling glared at Bai Lai and thought that he was being too selfish when he and Yin Mei did not even exchange more than two sentences. As soon as the doors closed, Bai Lai immediately turned to call out and look at Yin Mei, his eyes filled with worry. Yin Mei sighed, and Bai Lai could not say another word when she placed her finger over his lips while she warned him that Yi Ling was not a good person and he should stay away from him. Yin Mei stared into space, her eyes filled with worry, as she told Bai Lai to never trust Yi Ling. Bai Lai looked surprised and asked Yin Mei why she would say such a thing. Yin Mei looked at Bai Lai with concern and told him that she was not trying to ruin the relationship between the two of them. From the very first time they met, Yi Ling was staring intently at her. As she held her hand close to her chest and spoke with an uneasy tone, she told him that when Yi Ling made a toast just now, he kept staring at her chest. If Yi Ling did not respect her, she did not think that he respected Bai Lai either. Bai Lai's eyes filled with rage as he recalled the perverted look on Yi Ling's face earlier while making a toast. He slammed his fist on the table while Yin Mei held his hands and consoled him, saying she knew it was not his intention to befriend someone like that. She did not alert him earlier to what had happened because she did not want to be portrayed as someone purposely trying to cause a rift between them. She knew that he currently needed a lot of people to help him, so she didn't mind suffering a little for him. Bai Lai was still mad and said that he knew what kind of person Yi Ling was, but he could not believe that he would disregard him and plan to put his hands on Yin Mei. He comforted her and assured her that he would not spare Yi Ling easily for what he had done that night. Yin Mei stood up and told Bai Lai that it was getting late, so she would be heading out first, which made Bai Lai worry again. 
He asked her if she still had to return to the sect when it was so dark out. Yinmei was already by the door, so she turned to look at Bai Lai and told him that she would not be returning to the sect tonight. She had a small house in the city in which she would stay for the night. She blushed as she told Bai Lai that her house was just 300 yards east of where they were. Bai Lai was surprised when he heard what Yinmei said. He blushed as he wondered if she was secretly telling him to look for her later. Yinmei headed out, and the doors closed behind her, leaving Bai Lai inside. While Yinmei was still heading out of the residence, Bai Lai's yell commanding the guards to capture Yi Ling could be heard. Someone suggested to Bai Lai that he should go with the guards as Yi Ling was someone who had a lot of tricks up his sleeve. Upon hearing those words, Yin Mei looked satisfied and smiled sinisterly. Meanwhile, at an outdoor pavilion, Master Gu had his back turned towards Yu Ming Kong, who was sitting at the round table. He was smiling as he looked at the rewards the system had given him for completing the random side quest regarding the Fortune's Chosen's relationship. In his mind, he was mocking Bai Lai and Yi Ling for having all that talk about being brothers but not resisting a little seduction. Master Gu started to head out and told Yu Ming Kong that he was going to take a walk. If there was nothing else important, she could just wait for him right there. Yu Ming Kong observed him intently and wondered if he was finally planning to make a move on Yi Ling. She immediately realized that Yi Ling had uncountable life-saving artifacts as the heir to the ancient reincarnation talisman, so Master Gu would not be able to kill him without revealing his secret to everyone. Yu Ming Kong stared at the Zianqi in front of her and thought that Master Gu could be using Bai Lai. It was expected of someone like him to always manipulate people to achieve his goals. The moon was shining brightly above Yi Ling, who was casually walking down the street. He was talking to his talisman and telling the old man that Bai Lai was being a little too stingy. Yi Ling thought Bai Lai got upset when he simply talked a little more with Yin Mei. The old man responded by saying that Yi Ling was the only person he knew who would talk about taking other people's wives so naturally. If he didn't restrain himself, he would be in trouble again due to his appetite for women, like last time. Yi Ling disregarded the old man's warning and said that he would not let things that happened that day go easily. Yi Ling was suddenly alarmed when he felt someone's presence and asked who was there. It was Master Gu who gave Yi Ling a mocking smile while he had his back turned towards him. He was standing atop the Peifeng. Master Gu bid his farewell to Yi Ling, telling him that he was not bad, and that they would meet again soon. Then he entered through the warp in space while Yi Ling hysterically asked who he was again. Yi Ling felt uneasy and was sweating. Even though he thought that the guy was not that strong, he was bothered by his eerie presence, and it felt suffocating. Suddenly, someone sinister who was already ready to lunge and attack appeared at the warp in space behind Yi Ling. The ground was destroyed by the man's attack. Yi Ling leapt backward and luckily avoided the attack. The old man and his talisman told him that he needed to escape as the man seemed like he was there to assassinate him. They could not afford to cause too much commotion since they were in the area that the Taoist Immortal Palace was in charge of. Yi Ling hurriedly ran away from the scene while cursing and wondering who the man was that attacked him. The man just stood there, holding his weapon, and watched Yi Ling run away. The man was Elder Ming, and he was wondering what his young master was really thinking when he instructed him not to force Yi Ling into a corner too much. He thought that Master Gu must have known that he wouldn't be able to kill him. Meanwhile, Bai Lai was expectant and said that Yin Mei must be anxiously waiting for him. He pushed the doors of Yin Mei's residence open and entered. He immediately saw Yin Mei when he entered. Her back was turned towards him, and he was delighted to see her waiting for him, sitting on a round table outside while warming up the wine. Without turning around, Yin Mei told him how her master was right, that he would come. Bai Lai was taken aback by what Yin Mei had said because he thought that she was waiting for him. Then he wondered about the master she was talking about. While Bai Lai looked confused and heartbroken, Master Gu arrived and passed over his head while consoling him. He said that he did not hear Yin Mei wrongly as she was always waiting for him. Master Gu expressed his delight that the wine was still warm while he landed beside Yin Mei, who immediately bowed and greeted him. Bai Lai could not believe what he was seeing, and he was lost for words. As if he were mocking Bai Lai, Master Gu turned to look at him and smiled. He asked him what he was waiting for and if he was not going to have a drink of the warm wine his fiancée had prepared. Then he asked Yin Mei how she could just let her fiancée stand there and commanded her to pour some wine for him. Bai Lai's eyes were bloodshot due to anger as he asked Master Gu if he used Yin Mei to plot against him. Yin Mei placed a cup on the table and told Bai Lai that it was the wine that her master had bestowed upon him, so he should thank him for it. Meanwhile, Bai Lai was baffled as to why Yin Mei betrayed him when he had always treated her so well. Master Gu sat on one of the chairs, and while still having that mocking smile, he told Bai Lai that he never thought that he was such a dutiful man underneath his brawny appearance. He heard that Bai Lai had always wanted to kill him, so he asked him why he looked unhappy when Yin Mei had managed to create an opportunity for them to meet privately. A white tiger aura appeared behind Bai Lai as he furiously asked Master Gu if he had plotted all of it ahead of time and if he had forced Yin Mei to cause a rift between him and Yi Ling so that he would send his guards away and come to the place alone. 
With his eyes still bloodshot due to rage, he told Master Gu that he did not care what his goal was, but he would not let him get away with that so easily. As Master Gu was about to calmly take a sip from his cup of wine, he praised Bai Lai for being clever and then asked him if he ever needed to do something as low as forcing someone to obey him. Yin Mei gave him a side eye and told him to stop thinking so highly of himself as he was not even worth a fraction of her master's toes. Then she asked him how she could possibly have feelings for someone like him. Bai Lai was in such shock upon hearing what Yin Mei said that he could not form a coherent sentence. He was even more surprised when a barrier formed around him. Bai Lai sweated profusely as he asked Master Gu if he was planning on killing him, even though he was a direct descendant of the ancient White Tiger clan. Master Gu stood up and sarcastically asked Bai Lai if he thought he had come just to talk with him all night. He then confirmed that he was there to kill him and found it a bit pitiful that his clan wouldn't know who to take revenge on. Bai Lai released his golden tiger aura and asked Master Gu who he thought he was to threaten him like that. Master Gu found him annoying and threw the cup at him. It seemed like it was imbued with a dark aura. The cup shattered into pieces. The pieces propelled towards Bai Lai like meteors, and he used his golden tiger aura as a shield. Most of the cup pieces were deflected by the shield, but one of them managed to shatter through his defenses. Bai Lai was surprised as it pierced through the center of his chest. A purple flower suddenly grew out of his wound, and he looked extremely horrified when he looked down and saw it. Master Gu and Yin Mei watched as Bai Lai knelt on the ground and screamed in pain. While sweating and turning pale, Bai Lai realized that Master Gu's strength was far superior to that of a cultivator in the sacred sovereign realm and wondered how much he was hiding. With Yin Mei calmly standing behind him, Master Gu smiled and told Bai Lai that the peerless golden ability, an ability ranked third in the upper realm, was wasted in his hands. Bai Lai cursed Master Gu and told him that he should not be underestimated as his body started to make cracking sounds and he started to transform. The flower on his chest was now big enough to cover it. Bai Lai transformed to look like a white tiger and told Master Gu to go to hell. He quickly lunged forward and used his move, the White Tiger Claw. Master Gu summoned the Eight Baron Halberd without moving an inch, and he confidently smiled while calling Bai Lai useless. Bai Lai froze, and he did not know what was happening to him. All the while, Master Gu's eyes gleamed as he glared at Bai Lai. Cracks appeared on Master Gu's barrier as a whirlwind of dark aura wreaked havoc inside it. Bai Lai coughed up blood, and his clothes were turned to shreds as he was thrown by the dark aura up in the air. Master Gu grabbed him by the throat while Bai Lai's mouth was wide open in pain. Both of them were still in midair, and while Master Gu held the Eight Baron Halberd on his right hand, the weakened Bai Lai dangled on the other. Master Gu mocked Bai Lai for struggling and not waiting patiently for his death, while Bai Lai wondered how Master Gu could be at the true god realm. The flower on Bai Lai's chest suddenly grew vines and wrapped around him as he was screaming in pain and telling Master Gu that he could not kill him. While being wrapped in the vines, Bai Lai was about to say something about his clan. But he was interrupted when he noticed one of the vines had bloomed, revealing a bottle inside it. Bai Lai screamed in pain and was shaking as the bottle started sucking his aura out of him. As soon as Bai Lai's body drooped, Master Gu dropped him to the ground in front of Yin Mei, who was surprised. Yin Mei looked up at the sky with fear in her eyes. Meanwhile, Master Gu held the Eight Baron Halberd and spread his arms as he absorbed the aura he just got from Bai Lai, and the moon looked like it was shattered because of the crack in Master Gu's barrier. As the last of the remaining aura got absorbed into his body, Master Gu looked at it with delight. He was in awe of the delicious taste of the ability and its power that could be manipulated countless times. He immediately understood why it was ranked among the top three in the upper realm. The barrier crumbled and shattered as soon as Master Gu descended to the ground, where Yin Mei immediately congratulated him for obtaining the peerless golden ability and asked him how she should dispose of Bai Lai's corpse. While smiling, Master Gu told her not to carelessly destroy Bai Lai's corpse, as he would be of great use later, and ordered her to clean up the mess in the place, to which she readily complied. Later, Yin Mei was sitting again at the round table with her back towards the entrance when three shimmering lights were shooting in her direction. She immediately turned to see who had arrived. There were three people, one of them seemed like an elder from the ancient tiger clan who landed and paid respects to her while looking for their young master. In response, she told them that Bai Lai came to meet her but left her to wait for him alone as he would go and settle his debts with Yi Ling. Then she asked them if something was wrong. The elder expressed his understanding and said that he did not expect that their young master would provoke Yi Ling first, to which Yin Mei asked what happened, feigning concern. The elder looked at the ground as he told Yin Mei that Bai Lai sent him to capture Yi Ling. But when he went to the city, he only found some traces of battle, and Yi Ling had gone missing along with their young master. Yin Mei acted like she was worried when she heard that Yi Ling was missing, and then confirmed to the elder that Bai Lai should be fine since he was the young master of the White Tiger Clan, so he must have many life-saving treasures. The elder looked downhearted as he told Yin Mei that Yi Ling's methods were too peculiar, 
and that he was afraid that their young master might have suffered a loss at his hands, while the two guards behind him were furious, saying that they knew Yuling was not a good person from the beginning, and that they wouldn't let him off easily if something really had happened to their young master. As the three men cupped their fists to Yin Mei, they said that the young master's safety was of utmost importance, so they had to take their leave, she requested that they inform her once they found Bai Lai. She clutched her hands into her chest as she told them that she was really worried about him. As the three men left, they told her not to worry as they would let their young master know as soon as they found him. Yin Mei smiled evilly as her master planned everything so meticulously and predicted everything, so by the time they found Bai Lai, his corpse would have already grown cold. Meanwhile, Yu Ming Kong was standing outside the pavilion, staring into space. Suddenly, two hands were about to grab her from behind without her knowledge. It was Master Gu, who smiled brightly while asking her if she was still waiting for him. But instead of answering his question, she told him that the smell of Vixen was all over him and asked him where he had gone. Master Gu acted surprised, and he sniffed himself while telling Yu Ming Kong that he was touched that she knew about the smells on his body so well. He smiled confidently and told her that he did not do anything to make her jealous, but she reminded him never to reveal his relationship with a certain woman. Yu Ming Kong gracefully walked away as she told Master Gu that there was no need for him to test her as she would not reveal his secrets. With a sly smile on his face, he praised her for really understanding him. Master Gu was yawning behind her, and he was unaware that she was pouting as she walked away from him. She was thinking that she wouldn't let him have another woman by his side before she had her revenge, even if that woman was just one of his pawns. Meanwhile, at the ancient White Tiger Clan palace, Bai Lai's father yelled and asked who dared to kill his son while holding a broken talisman in his hands. Veins were popping out of his face and his hands as he clutched the ornament, while he furiously commanded people to find the one who killed his son and announced that he would smash the bastard's bones into dust and tear their corpse into a thousand pieces. In a forest, the three people who visited Yin Mei were using Bai Lai's blood essence to find him, and they traced it back to the cave. The cave had a purple barrier at its entrance that they needed to destroy to get in. As they destroyed the barrier and entered the cave, one of the guards wondered if they were in a dungeon. Inside the cave were prison cells, and inside each prison cell were a lot of corpses, which made the elder wonder if what the Yi family said was true about the many cultivators that disappeared in the upper realm. One of the guards looked horrified, his eyes were wide open and bloodshot. He called on Elder Bai as he saw their young master's corpse sitting on the ground, completely shriveled as his essence and origin were thoroughly devoured by someone else. Elder Bai exclaimed as he saw their young master with his own eyes and said that the situation had gone out of their control, so they must notify the clan of what had happened immediately. Elder Bai's veins were popping out of his forehead due to rage as he cursed the demonic cultivator Yilin who dared to kill his young master, and he declared that his hatred would never be forgotten. In a room, Yu Ling was sitting on his bed, talking to the old man in his talisman, Elder Gui. He said that strange things had been happening recently, and he felt like someone was plotting against him. He also wondered about the man who attacked him last night and if he was related to the assassins. Then he tried to remember if he had offended anyone recently. As Yu Ling held on to the talisman, Elder Gui speculated that the person plotting against him could be Master Gu. Yu Ling looked annoyed and wondered why Master Gu would bother wasting his time doing such things if he really wanted to kill him. He stood up and approached his window and said that he must report what happened to Bai Lai first, as he needed to be prepared. Suddenly, an announcement was made in the skies, persuading the White Tiger Clan to unite and find the murderer of their young master Bai Lai, Yi Ling. The announcement said that his vicious and evil actions had violated human ethics, so anyone who could capture him or provide clues of his whereabouts would be honored for thousands of years. Yi Ling looked extremely horrified as he immediately stepped to the side of the window so he would not be seen outside, and he could not understand the information he heard. That Bai Lai died, and he was the one who killed him. He then closed the windows and took a step back. He knew it was not possible and someone must have framed him, so he tried to ask for assurance from Elder Gui, who knew that he did not kill Bai Lai. But unfortunately, Elder Gui told him that it was useless even if he attempted to prove his innocence. Yu Ling looked agitated as he realized that they may not believe Elder Gui even if he attempted to prove his innocence, and he could not expose that he had the inheritance of the ancient heavenly emperor of reincarnation because he would never be forgiven, so he must not let them catch him. Yu Ling slammed his fist on the wall. He looked furious as he realized what a vicious plan he had fallen into, being placed in two dilemmas with just one move, and he suspected that it must have been the man who attacked him last night who was plotting against him. But they knew nothing of the man's identity, so Elder Gui advised that Yi Ling use the power of reincarnation to conceal his origin, so normal cultivators would not be able to find him, while Yi Ling looked desperate and said that that was the only thing he could do. Several days later, the Taoist Immortal Palace held the coronation ceremony for the next heir, and many people attended. 
the position of heir to the Taoist Immortal Palace was conferred upon the true disciple, Gu Changji. Master Gu kneeled and paid his respects in front of the elders and the palace master. The palace master told him that he was now the heir to their Taoist Immortal Palace, so he must guide his juniors well and set a good example for them. Master Gu stole a glance at the people behind him and smiled as the palace master continued to say that Master Gu's presence in the palace brings him relief when he thinks of the opening of the path to the heavens. Some people in the crowd did not look happy, while most of them cheered as Master Gu assured the palace master that he wouldn't let anyone embarrass his fellow disciples of the immortal palace. The palace master was pleased with what Master Gu said, and he ordered a lady to give the immortal phoenix piercer to him while the palace master explained that the weapon belonged to an ancestor of the Taoist immortal palace. Once it had been refined with Master Gu's spiritual key, cultivators below the sacred realm would be unable to come near him, but he must not use it before reaching the true god realm. Master Gu looked like he was uninterested when he saw the immortal phoenix piercer that was offered to him, but he was amused on the inside. Most of the audience did not seem pleased that he was given the immortal phoenix piercer, and it seems like only Yi Langshan and Yi Liu Lai were happy with the announcement. Master Gu hovered above the audience and asked if anyone was discontent with the announcement and desired to have a spar with him. As the crowd looked up at Master Gu with awe, Gu Ziyaner looked at him with worry in her eyes. She observed his movements and thought that he had already recovered from what happened before. He asked the crowd one more time if anybody desired to have a spar with him as he landed back on the podium. Upon hearing their silence, he declared that he considered their silence as acceptance of his position as heir. Gu Ziyaner looked up at the podium expectantly. She expected him to give her a chance to challenge him and take that opportunity to embarrass her. As Master Gu smiled at the crowd that was showering him with praise for being a deserving heir, Gu Ziyaner wondered why he was ignoring her. She curled her hands into a fist as she silently questioned how Master Gu could act as if nothing had happened between them when she hadn't officially won against him, and how all of her effort, cultivation, and harbored hatred for so many years could be resolved with one mere strike. She looked furious as she thought about how Master Gu acted so high and lofty to treat her like a stranger and not even view her as an enemy. She was about to call out to him and make a scene when she was pushed to the side by Peng Fei from the golden-winged Peng clan who took a step forward and cupped his fist to Master Gu, congratulating and praising him for being the role model of their generation. Master Gu gave him a sly smile and told him that he was being too polite. Gu Ziyaner was then again pushed to the side when Kai Ling from the Vermilion Brid clan took a step forward with her arms crossed and asked Master Gu about his views on the recent issues surrounding the inheritor of the demonic arts. Everyone's attention was on them as Master Gu confidently answered that everyone knows that the inheritor should be captured and punished, so he questioned Kai Ling for asking him such a question. Kai Ling looked at him with contempt as she told him that the current reveal of the inheritor was too sloppy because, throughout the ages. The appearance of the inheritor of the demonic arts has been an event to shake the heavens and cause a stir amongst almost every cultivator. Master Gu looked amused when he heard Kai Ling's reasoning. She continued that the cultivation of Yi Ling was not even at the sacred sovereign realm, so she questioned how he was able to murder someone like Bai Lai. And Master Gu agreed with what she said, acting like he was deep in thought and saying that it simply does not make any sense. Yu Langshan stepped into the discussion and said that he had fought against Yu Ling before and that his techniques and spiritual key are both extremely suspicious. To add to that, he also said that Yu Ling was still able to raise his cultivation extremely quickly even though he did not have many resources available. As he took a step forward, Yu Langshan added that the most important detail was the fact that Bai Lai's corpse was found with the talented disciples that disappeared, which made it difficult for him not to connect it with Yi Ling. So if he really was the one who committed such heinous actions, the Yi family would would take responsibility. Upon hearing this, Kai Ling refuted that those were just mere speculations and they shouldn't wrongly accuse an innocent man. Upon hearing the word innocent, Peng Fei smiled and sarcastically asked Kai Ling if she was going to tell Bai Lai and the rest of the young cultivators who were unjustly killed by Yi Ling that he was innocent. While Master Gu just stood behind and observed them, Peng Fei looked at Kai Ling condescendingly and accused her of trying to defend Yi Ling because they knew each other. He heard that they once cultivated together in a secret realm, to which Kai Ling was taken aback and could not answer. Master Gu looked down on them with his evil knowing smile, as he realized that Kai Ling and Yi Ling were acquainted. As he mentally added Kai Ling to the Xianqi board in front of Yi Ling, he thought that it looked like he would have no choice but to add another piece to his chessboard. Kai Ling, Peng Fei, Yi Lu Lai, and Yi Langshan were now at the center of the crowd's attention. The crowd started gossiping about how Kai Ling knew Yi Ling previously, and Kai Ling started to get concerned. Master Gu appeased the tension by saying that he didn't doubt that Kai Ling brought the matter up out of righteousness. Kai Ling was surprised when Master Gu went down into the crowd and convinced them to put the matter aside for the time being because if they really wronged an innocent man and they all wasted their efforts on capturing Yi Ling. 
then the true inheritor of the demonic arts could escape unscathed. Yu Langshan was about to protest, but Master Gu stopped him and told him that the demonic arts inheritor was someone with the power to bring calamity to the entire upper realm, so they could not afford to make a single mistake. As soon as Yu Langshan conceded and agreed with Master Gu to return and collect more evidence, the crowd praised him for being a blessing for the righteous and said that it was no wonder he was close with Master Gu. Peng Fei cupped his fist to Master Gu and bid his farewell along with the crowd, to which Master Gu bid them farewell as well. Master Gu smiled knowingly as he glanced at Kai Ling, who was standing a few meters from him. He was confident that Yi Ling had already taken the blame for being the inheritor of the demonic arts, and he was glad that he had gained a valuable opportunity to gather resources and increase his cultivation. He had this sly look in his eyes as he looked forward to chance upon the corpses of immortals from the ancient immortal era on the ancient immortal continent, and the immortal spirit. Kai Ling stood beside him and thanked him for coming to her rescue earlier. She was shyly looking away as she asked Master Gu to show her around the Taoist Immortal Palace as it was her first time coming, and Master Gu gladly complied with her request. Someone was standing behind them from afar as he showed her the way and suggested that they should talk while they walked. It was Gu Zioner, who looked downhearted, trying to reach out to them. While they walked on the snowy flight of stairs, Kai Ling told Master Gu that after she heard what he said earlier, she could not help but wonder if he had a deep understanding of the inheritor of the demonic arts, to which Master Gu humbly responded that he had only learned of it through the scraps of some ancient books. It was his duty to learn of such things beforehand and inform the public of them. Kai Ling glanced at him and smiled brightly as she told him that he seemed to be quite warm-hearted. Kai Ling looked at Master Gu with awe as he stared ahead seriously, and humbled himself, saying that he would not consider himself warm-hearted as he simply does not wish for the universe to fall into turmoil, and ages of endless war, so he could not just sit back and watch if the demonic arts cultivator had appeared. Master Gu furrowed his eyebrows and sighed as he recalled the death of Bai Lai. Although there were grudges between them, seeing Bai Lai end up that way saddened him. Kai Ling stared ahead as she admitted to Master Gu that she could not help but admire his righteous heart. As they continued to walk up the stairs, Master Gu confessed that he also suspected Yi Ling to be the inheritor of the demonic arts in the very beginning. But after he thought about it carefully, he realized that he was wrong because someone as attention-seeking as Yi Ling, who dared to challenge him, could not be the inheritor. And Kai Ling confirmed that Yi Ling's characteristics were quite similar to what he just described, which was why she could not believe that he was the inheritor of the demonic arts. Kai Ling proposed that if Master Gu was willing, he could help Yi Ling get rid of the false title, and she was excited to think that the two of them might be able to develop a friendship. Kai Ling smiled at him warmly and said that anyone could become friends with him as long as they were not idiots, since he was such a warm-hearted person. Master Gu glanced at her and acknowledged her cleverness for attempting to erase his suspicion of Yi Ling and have them become allies with just mere words. As he thought that Kai Ling had chosen the right person to help her get rid of Yi Ling's false title, he had this twisted expression of satisfaction on his face that he was trying to suppress as he thought about how he was too warm-hearted, righteous, and willing to help others no matter the cause. Master Gu was pulled back from his twisted thoughts when Kai Ling called out to him. He got back to the topic at hand, and he told Kai Ling that he assumed that she must know about Yi Ling's whereabouts since she trusted him so much. She told him that she didn't know, but she could find a way to contact him. Master Gu smiled evilly as he told her that it was a good thing. While Master Gu was smiling beside her, Kai Ling suddenly furrowed her eyebrows and confessed that she had been thinking if the real inheritor of the demonic arts was Yi Langshan. Master Gu looked amused as he glanced at her and asked her why she suspected Yi Langshan as the inheritor of the demonic arts and not him. Kai Ling told him that he was someone who was destined for a great future and was revered as a true immortal, so he wouldn't taint himself with demonic arts. While Yilangshan, on the other hand, was just a mere ancient emperor. As the disparity between their statuses grew, it was not impossible for Yilangshan to attempt to learn the demonic arts out of pure jealousy. Master Gu told her that if that was the case, then he should be more cautious. Master Gu and Kai Ling were laughing as they walked the streets. Suddenly, someone stood in front of them and blocked their way, and she recognized Kai Ling as the heir to the Vermont million bird clan. Master Gu was surprised to see Yu Mingkong, while Kai Ling looked at her with awe and immediately confirmed with Master Gu that she was the crown princess Mingkong. All the while, Yu Mingkong stood there, glaring at them with her arms crossed. Master Gu closed his eyes and calmly requested Kai Ling not to take Yu Mingkong's actions to heart, as they had a few trifles lately, so she had been like that. With Yu Mingkong still standing ahead of them, Kai Ling cupped her fist toward him and bid her farewell, saying that she would come bother him another day as she wouldn't want his fiancée to misunderstand them. Master Gu bid his farewell to her as well. As soon as they turned their backs on each other to go their separate ways, Kai Ling's expression changed, as she thought she had done all she could to help Yi Ling and hoped that he would not get caught by others before they cleared his name. 
On the other hand, Master Gu was smiling smugly as he glanced at Kai Ling and thought of her as a little girl who was still too inexperienced at framing others. Yu Mingkong did not move from where she was standing and did not change her expression as Master Gu approached her and reached out to her asking if she was still angry at him. Yu Mingkong slapped his hand away from her. Master Gu was surprised while Yu Mingkong turned away from him and told him that if he didn't tell her who the vixen was last night, then he should not even think of touching her. Master Gu's expression suddenly changed into a cold, emotionless stare as he told Yu Mingkong that he would tell her what she was meant to know but that she should not ask about what she wasn't meant to know. He then took a step forward and asked her if she still did not suspect him after everything that had happened. With Master Gu staring evilly behind her, Yu Mingkong's eyes widened with fear as she tried to act like she did not know what he was talking about. But he immediately caught on and told her that she was smart, so pretending to be confused was no use. Yu Mingkong's sweat was dripping from her face as she thought that Master Gu suspected that she knew too much and was planning on killing her. Yu Mingkong immediately summoned a hidden dagger in her hands. She nervously observed Master Gu's movements as he turned his back towards her and said that he was liking her more and more because she was beautiful, obedient, sensible, and powerful. Powerful, which simply makes her the perfect wife. Yu Mingkong's eyes widened, and she furrowed her eyebrows in confusion as she asked what Master Gu was talking about, saying that she was the perfect wife. Master Gu summoned a purple sphere in his hand and waved it off in the air as he told Yu Mingkong that he was sure that she knew that Yi Ling was not the inheritor of the demonic arts, as she was aware that his true identity was the inheritor of the ancient heavenly emperor of reincarnation. Yu Mingkong was speechless for a moment as she gazed up at the purple light in the sky that Master Gu created. She managed to regain her composure, and then she closed her eyes as she confirmed that what Master Gu said was correct. And then she added that she also knew that he was the true inheritor of the demonic arts, while Master Gu, who was surrounded by his dark aura, gazed back at her with a devilish smile. Yu Mingkong stared at Master Gu, her eyes filled with determination as she braced herself and asked him if the day had finally come where he was finally planning on killing her. Yu Mingkong held the dagger that she had been hiding in her hands tightly as Master Gu laughed menacingly and faced her, saying that she should have confessed earlier instead of wasting her efforts by pretending not to know anything. Master Gu told her that if his identity as the inheritor of the demonic arts was revealed, then his life would be beyond redemption, so he would be spared from all the trouble if he killed her. Yu Mingkong stared at him intently and asked why he hadn't done so. But instead of answering her question, Master Gu threw her a question instead, asking if she really thought the rune dagger that she was holding could protect her. Yu Mingkong was startled when Master Gu's dark aura started to surge towards her. She cursed as she dropped the dagger when Master Gu caught her off guard and suddenly grabbed her wrist. Master Gu was so fast that she did not have any time to react, and all she could do was stare at him, who was giving off an evil aura. As she continued to stare at him, she remembered Master Gu's expression when he was about to kill her in their future. She closed her eyes and accepted her fate, thinking that, in the end, nothing had changed. Her dagger clattered as it fell and reached the ground. Yu Mingkong was extremely surprised when Master Gu embraced her in his arms and apologized for hiding his secret for so long. Her eyes were bulging out in disbelief as he confessed that he had been hiding the fact that he was the inheritor of the demonic arts for as long as he could remember because he was always scared that it would implicate her. But now that she knows the truth, his heart could finally be at rest. Master Gu hugged her tightly while she just stood there, frozen in place. Master Gu smirked as the system notified him that Yu Mingkong had changed her mentality towards him and that his fortune and fate values had increased, and he thought that girls really do like to be sweet-talked. Yu Mingkong pushed him away and asked if he was not afraid that she would expose his secret if he didn't kill her. Master Gu calmly smiled and admitted that he was afraid, but he could not bear to kill her, so if she decides to expose him, he will have no choice but to accept his misfortune and blame himself for marrying a wife like her. Yu Mingkong blushed and told him that they were not married yet, while she was thinking about the difference between the present and the future where Master Gu was so resolute on killing her. While summoning the immortal phoenix piercer in his hands, Master Gu retorted that she would be his wife sooner or later, so she was already his. While he was showing off the immortal phoenix piercer to her, Master Gu told her that he wanted her to choose something from the treasures the old men had given him at the coronation ceremony earlier, but she wasn't there. Meanwhile, Yu Mingkong was surprised to see the weapon in the palm of his hands. Master Gu solemnly offered the weapon to her and said that if she wished to kill him, she would at least need to have a weapon of that caliber. Yu Mingkong held the weapon in her hands, and she she was speechless as she looked at it with awe. She clutched her hands together, along with the weapon, as she thought about how it was becoming harder and harder for her to understand Master Gu. On the other hand, people of the White Tiger Clan were holding out posters of Yi Ling while asking each of the people they came across if they had seen the man. Inside a building, Yi Ling was talking to Elder Gui. He was worried about the cultivators from the White Tiger Clan looking for him every day, and that his identity would be revealed. 
He suggested that he dye his hair, but Elder Gui told him that there was no need for him to worry, as the mysterious ancient reincarnation talisman was not something they could see through easily. Yiling added that it was a pity that he could no longer use his handsome appearance to court girls, and Elder Gui scolded him for still thinking of girls in his situation. Yiling had changed the way his hair was tied and had a mole on his face. He was sitting and contemplating how it was too much of a coincidence for the demonic arts inheritor to appear at such a time, so he suspected that the inheritor had been cultivating near the Taoist immortal palace, or may even be a disciple. He also remembered Yu Mingkong's attempted assassination, and assumed that she must have known about his inheritance, as well as her fiancé, Master Gu. He looked annoyed as he stroked the hair that was coming out of his mole, and when he realized that the first person he had ruled out to be the demonic arts inheritor was now his greatest suspect, Master Gu. Elder Gui said that the matter was too terrifying, that the Taoist immortal palace failed to realize that their very own heir was the inheritor of the demonic arts, and that once this matter was revealed, it would shock the entire upper realm. Yiling started to pace in the room as he realized that Master Gu was related to every mishap he suffered, and he was a fool not to have noticed it earlier. Yiling was furious and declared that since Master Gu was that determined to ruin him, then he would play in his little game and fight him, as he did not fear him at all. Meanwhile, Elder Gui warned him not to tell anyone about it beforehand, as no one would believe him, and he hoped that their guess was wrong, as it was terrifying to have such a formidable enemy staring at them from the dark. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door and asked if anyone was there, and Yi Ling happily called out for Kai Ling and told her to come in. Kai Ling came in and removed her cloak as she pointed out that she could hardly recognize his appearance, and Yi Ling told her that he had no choice as of the moment, or else he wouldn't even know how he died. Kai Ling placed her cloak on the table and consoled Yi Ling, saying that she was recently acquainted with someone powerful who believed that he was framed, so they would prove his innocence when the time came. Yi Ling excitedly asked her who the person was so he could thank them properly, but she said that she could not tell him right now, but gave him a clue that not many were his match in strength in the younger generation. While Yi Ling was glad about the news, Kai Ling was thinking that it was better if she kept Master Gu's identity for now, as Yi Ling had challenged him before. Yi Ling was ecstatic as he hugged Kai Ling tightly, saying that he didn't know how to thank her and that if the person could really prove his innocence, then he would repay them greatly in the future. Kai Ling winced and told Yi Ling that it was enough because he was hurting her. Meanwhile, Master Gu sneezed and wondered if someone was missing him. He was staring at his system screen when he realized that it was not easy to break through the heavenly god realm, as his cultivation had only advanced a little even after devouring so many resources that Yin Mei had gathered. When he thought that the talismans he had exchanged were enough for the ancient immortal continent, he shuffled through the system's talents and techniques and was glad that he could finally put the transcendence talent to use. He converted 3,000 fortune points and used the 30,000 fate points to transcend a bone in his body into a Tao bone. He reached out his hand into the system screen to purchase the transcendence talent, and he thought that the system was incredible when he realized that he would be able to transcend every bone in his body as long as he had enough fate points. Master Gu's body was elevated, and his body glowed with a golden aura. He was then surrounded by a sphere that had a total inversion of color. Then the sphere expanded and reached outside the palace. Master Gu slowly opened his eyes as he thought about how he could already glimpse the laws of time, which was something only cultivators in the sacred realm could do. Master Gu smiled sinisterly, and his menacing aura surrounded him as he realized that his current strength was already at the sacred realm. While holding a weird fruit in his hands, Master Gu calmed down and remembered that it was about time that something began. He bit into the fruit he was holding as he gazed outside and saw a huge pillar of light arched over by a rainbow, and then he said that everything was right on time. Five people were hovering around a huge crack in space, it looked beautiful and terrifying at the same time. It was the elders of the Taoist Immortal Palace, they were guarding the entrance to the ancient immortal continent, and they were worried about all the cultivators from the younger generation that were participating. They could not figure out if it was a blessing or a curse. Suddenly, the Great Elder ordered them to notify all the disciples of the younger generation to assemble there in three days to prepare to enter the ancient immortal continent. Days after, the entrance to the ancient immortal continent has finally opened, and the older generation is disappointed that they won't be able to enter, and the elders within the continent are also forbidden from taking action as well. As the younger generation of cultivators pass through, an elder lady says that they can only depend on their capabilities to obtain the immortal spirit and be reborn, while an elder man is concerned about the resurfacing of the demonic arts inheritor. The great elder hovers in front of the entrance, reminding the younger generation that a barrier exists between the ancient immortal continent and the upper realm that cannot be crossed by the older generation of cultivators and the elders within the continent. So once they enter, their life and death will lie within their own hands. The crowd cheers, and hiding among them is Yi Ling. 
he stares intently ahead, thinking about how worthy the Taoist immortal palace is of its peerless reputation, as it is impossible for him to see its true strength. The crowd makes a fuss as soon as they see Master Gu arrive, while Yu Ling gets surprised and tensed up as his group lands behind him. Master Gu looks in his direction and smiles knowingly, making Yu Ling anxious and worried that his appearance was seen through by him. Elder Gui reassures him that the ancient heavenly emperor of reincarnation's inheritance is not something that can be easily seen through, so Yu Ling relaxes, but unbeknownst to him, Master Gu's system is showing him his 5,500 fortune points and is recognized. Kai Ling is all smiles as she approaches Master Gu and requests for him to take care of them during the journey to the ancient immortal continent, and Master Gu smiles and says that she is too polite. Yu Ling glares at them and reminds himself that he must warn Kai Ling not to be deceived by Master Gu's kindness, as it is very likely that he is the inheritor of the demonic arts. Yu Ling sees the downhearted Yin Mei as he glances over his shoulders and thinks that she must be affected by Bai Lai's death, and that he must warn her as well, as she must not know that it was all Master Gu's doing. As soon as the Great Elder raises his hands and officially announces the opening of the entrance to the ancient immortal continent, the younger generations rush through the entrance as they believe that the one who arrives first will be rewarded the most. As the cultivators around them are running towards the entrance, Yu Mingkong is just walking while giving Master Gu the side eye, and she passes through Master Gu and Yin Mei, who are taking their time. Yu Mingkong is clearly annoyed as she goes through the entrance, and Master Gu, who notices that she is still angry at him, is already expecting that she would not come with him and that she would gain her opportunities. Gu Ziyaner passes by them and does the same thing as Yu Mingkong did. Master Gu gets annoyed by what she does but tells himself to forget it as harvesting Yi Ling is most important. Master Gu instructs his companions that they would travel separately after entering, and if anything arises, they should immediately contact him with the summoning jade. Gu Ziyaner looks excited as she has already encountered an immortal spring as soon as she enters, and she is glad that the ancient immortal continent is the same as what was recorded in the ancient books. She punches her palm to pump herself up, and she sees it as the greatest opportunity for her to surpass Master Gu and get her revenge. Suddenly, three silhouettes appear, and one of them calls her a little girl, asking where she is from and why she is there alone. The person who is talking seems like a high-ranking official with his two guards, and he offers Gu Ziyaner to join them, saying that they would treat her well. Gu Ziyaner looks at him coldly and tells him to stay away from her as he has a foul smell. The man is enraged by what she said, and he immediately orders his guards to strip her, as he was going to have a bath with her in the spring. Gu Ziyaner summons her sword while she gets annoyed at what a mere sacred emperor realm is trying to do, and with her eyes glaring, she swiftly eliminates the two guards and lunges towards the man. The man is surprised at how fast Gu Ziyaner is, he barely has the time to summon his weapon. Just as he is able to materialize his weapon, Gu Ziyaner kicks his wrist, which makes him drop it. Gu Ziyaner launches herself into the air using the man's arm as her launch pad. She executes her final slash and lands behind the man gracefully. The man falls to the ground with a thud as she tells them that she doesn't have time to waste on someone like him. As she walks away, she extends her left arm, and the rings of the three men fly towards her as she says that she will be taking those storage rings as payments. The seventh princess, a lady with turquoise hair who has her own set of guards, finds the three men's bodies lying on the ground and calls them trash. But her mermaid-looking companion reminds her that no matter what, he is still her younger brother and a direct descendant of the Sea Monarch Palace. The seventh princess kneels on the ground and touches her brother forehead as she tells her companion that there is no need for her to tell her what to do and that they didn't come all the way there just to be ridiculed. Her face contorts with anger as she realizes how foolish her brother was, who couldn't even finish off a little girl, and then she declares that once she catches the little girl, the little girl will wish she were dead. Up in the sky, Peng Fei is flying with a mysterious man shrouded in black smoke. The mysterious man is amused at what just transpired below them when he recognizes Gu Ziyaner, while Peng Fei, who is carrying a man by grabbing his clothes, comments that the Sea Monarch Palace will not be easy to deal with, and they don't know if Master Gu will be willing to aid his sister. Meanwhile, three people are bowing down to Master Gu, who is sitting on a ruined set of stairs, and they are begging him to spare their lives, they also offer to lead the way. Suddenly, a lady arrives at the scene and informs Master Gu who looks uninterested, that Gu Ziyaner has offended the cultivators of the Sea Monarch Palace and asks him if she should help her. Master Gu closes his eyes and calmly tells the lady that there is no need for her to do so as Gu Ziyaner won't die from that. He is confident as he thinks that Gu Ziyaner was taught by all those old men. Yin Mei bows down and cups her fist, informing him that they have to separate, to which he agrees, and then he reminds her that she must come into contact with Yi Ling as soon as possible. Yin Mei smiles evilly as she confidently tells him that with his plan in place, a mere Yi Ling would be simple. After which, Master Gu turns to the three people bowing down to him and tells them to get up. 
He smiles at them as he asks who will be responsible for leading the way, and the two of them smile and confidently point at the bulky man between them, as he is the most knowledgeable. Master Gu smiles evilly and says that there is no need to keep the two of them alive. The three of them look horrified as they realize their inevitable fate. The eight baron halberd falls from the sky and pierces a spherical barrier. It hits a purple creature that looks like half a man and half an insect and pins it to the ground. As dust disperses and mixes with a purple aura, a creature with golden horns is angry and is calling out the person who dared to cause trouble before the ancestors land. As the smoke starts to dissipate, an arm grabs the eight baron halberd's pole. Carrying the eight baron halberd is Master Gu, who is shrouded in his purple aura, and emitting an ominous atmosphere as he requests for the creatures to make way. His eyes are black, his iris is purple, and he smiles sinisterly as he politely asks them if he could also trouble them to die. Tombs were destroyed and opened on the ground. Above them, four corpses of the ancestors hovered as Master Gu absorbed the essence of the immortal spirits they had left behind. As he finished absorbing their essence, he looked disappointed and said that he had overestimated their abilities a little. He walked out of the catacombs and said that the entire continent would be in complete uproar when the immortal spirit finally appeared. While overlooking the continent and with the eight baron halberd piercing a creature on his left, he told himself that he must obtain a high-level spirit for himself before the uproar happens. He smiled maliciously as he thought that in order to obtain a high-level spirit, he needed to rely on the fortunes chosen. Meanwhile, Kai Ling and Yi Ling were fighting against a giant beast that was in the true god realm. They were with three more people, and Kai Ling was surprised when Yi Ling arrogantly offered to leave the beast to him as it was only in the true god realm. As Yi Ling charged towards the roaring beast, one of their companions questioned if he had gone crazy and said that there should be a time and place for everything, even if he wanted to show off, while their other companion said that there was no need for him to show off to such an extent just to impress the saintess. While lunging forward, Yi Ling smiled arrogantly and called them ignorant fools, telling them to open their eyes wide and watch him carefully. Suddenly, something pierced the beast at the back of its head. Yi Ling was surprised as the beast collapsed and damaged the ground because of its impact. Yu Mingkong landed on the beast's body along with her two guards, Kai Ling, along with her two other companions who recognized her as the heir of the celestial Wusheng dynasty, looked up to Yu Mingkong with awe. And with that one blow, Kai Ling figured out that Yu Mingkong must have reached at least the intermediate stage of the sacred sovereign realm. On the other hand, Yu Ling was glaring at Yu Mingkong, his eyes full of contempt. While Yu Mingkong grabbed the core of the beast, she was thinking back about her previous life, where many tombs of the ancient immortal continent's original inhabitants were destroyed. And now, she has figured out that it must have been Master Gu that did it, as with his demonic arts, the continent was essentially a treasure trove for him. She was deep in thought as she thought of how high Master Gu's cultivation would be by the time they left the place if he did obtain an immortal spirit, and she hoped that he wouldn't be placing too much focus on her until Yi Ling was taken care of. Kai Ling and her companions bowed and cupped their fists toward Yu Mingkong as she thanked her for helping the Vermilion Bird tribe in their time of need. Yu Mingkong coldly looked down on them and said that it was just a coincidence, and then she questioned if Kai Ling was not hiding Yi Ling and her team. Yu Ling was frozen in place as Kai Ling's companions looked at each other with suspicion evident in their eyes, while Kai Ling smiled awkwardly and denied the speculation, saying that her tribe would never make such a mistake. Yu Mingkong did not say anything in response, and as soon as she left with her guards, Kai Ling grabbed the hem of Yi Ling's sleeve and asked if he was alright. Yu Ling did not say anything, he was just glaring and looking annoyed. Suddenly, a huge cloud of aura rose up in the air at a distance, which Yi Ling noticed and immediately recognized as Yin Mei's. Kai Ling was caught off guard when Yi Ling suddenly ran towards the direction of the aura. She almost made the mistake of calling him out by his name. One of Kai Ling's companions remarked that Yi Ling had been following them around ever since they arrived and now left without telling them anything, while the other one observed that Yi Ling was always acting suspiciously and had a strange martial art, so he suspected that he was the inheritor of the demonic arts that had been hiding. Kai Ling interrupted their discussion and told them that was enough. Kai Ling looked worried and sighed internally as Yi Ling messed up the plan they had for something completely irrelevant. She then compared Yi Ling's state of mind to that of Master Gu, whom she deemed far superior. Meanwhile, Yin Mei was fighting with a strange guy and seemed to be backed into a corner. Yin Mei looked mortified as the guy was about to grab her and said that he would search her body thoroughly for the spirit grass since she didn't want to hand them over. The guy was surprised when something smashed the ground between him and Yin Mei, which made him leap backwards, away from her. As the dust started to settle, Yin Mei looked surprised when Yi Ling appeared in front of her and reprimanded the guy for attacking a lady so cruelly. But then, Yin Mei's surprised expression changed into a sly smile. The guy backed off easily and said that since she had an accomplice from the very beginning, 
he would be the bigger person and let her have the spirit grass. Yin Mei cupped her fist toward the man and thanked him for helping her, and as she was about to introduce herself, Yi Ling interrupted her and called her sister-in-law. He dramatically redid his hair as he told her that it was him, Yi Ling. Yin Mei acted surprised and angry as to why Yi Ling was there, and Yi Ling, who was removing his mole disguise, nonchalantly told her that there was no need for her to worry as he was quite capable of disguising himself so no one would be able to find out his true identity. Still looking worried, she reminded him that a lot of cultivators were trying to hunt him down, and then she asked if he was not afraid that she would report him now that he had revealed himself so easily. Yi Ling grabbed her shoulders and told her that it made him truly happy that she was worried for him, but her safety was more important than anything else. Yi Ling looked into her eyes intently as he told her that she should know that he was framed, and that the reason he had entered the ancient immortal continent was to find something that would absolve him of the crime he was framed for. And in response, Yin Mei touched his arms, stared back into his eyes, and told him that she knows. With her eyes full of sincerity, she grabbed both his hands and told him that based on his character, there was no way he could harm them. Yi Ling blushed, and he was touched at how kind and understanding Yin Mei was towards him. Yi Ling then remembered to warn Yin Mei to beware of Master Gu, as he suspected that he was the one behind his framing. Yin Mei covered her mouth with her hand and acted like she was surprised and could not believe what she heard. Yi Ling grabbed Yin Mei's hands as he told her that she would understand more once everything had been resolved, and then he led the way to meet up with the Vermilion Birds tribe and told her that it would be easier for them with more helpers. As soon as Yi Ling turned his back, Yin Mei's face turned serious as she thought about how his every move had already been predicted by her master beforehand. He smiled sinisterly as she thought how incredibly tough it was for Yi Ling, as he was not just helping her master shoulder the blame of being the inheritor of demonic arts, he was also unknowingly helping him search for various fortunes. On the other hand, a fight seemed to have occurred as an aura seal appeared in the sky, and beneath it, lightning was spreading midair without hitting the ground. Gu Zioner was surrounded by three enemies at the time, and as she held her arm that seemed to be injured, she was telling someone that she could not believe that they had gathered so many people just to hunt her down, and they even used a formation to trap her. The enemy with the skeleton broadsword told her to shut up and die as he lunged to attack Gu Zioner. Gu Zioner blocked the attack with her sword, but the enemy with a scythe swung their weapon behind her and told her to face her judgment. Gu Zioner swiftly did a front flip and flipped over the enemy with the broadsword to avoid the scythe. But then, she was surprised when another enemy came from behind her again, dashing to punch her and threatening her that they would crush her bones. Gu Zioner was not able to dodge the attack this time, and although she managed to block the punch with her arms, the impact still pushed her down. As she was falling, Gu Zioner looked over to the two silhouettes to her left who were crossing their arms and seemed to be enjoying the show. This made Gu Zioner curse and think that there were too many people around and she could not get the upper hand due to the formation. Gu Zioner knew that they were trying to tire her out by having her fight all those people and one of the silhouettes was the seventh princess, who looked pleased as she looked down on Gu Zioner. While Gu Zioner was still falling, her enemies lunged toward her to launch another coordinated attack. And at that moment, Gu Zioner blamed Master Gu for putting her in a bad mood earlier, causing her to kill those people and end up stirring the hornet's nest. As she saw the three attacks coming towards her, she bet that having her die there would be just what Master Gu wished for, as it would just give him less trouble. And thinking about it pissed Gu Zioner off and made her think that she could not let him get his way like that. Gu Zioner's bones shone blue, and electricity shrouded her arms as she got mad. As she delivered the punch, her eyes were blazing red, and she told her enemies to get lost already. Gu Zioner released a powerful blue wave from her fists, creating shockwave pulses and pushing the enemy away. The one with the broadsword managed to use his weapon to block Gu Zioner's wave, but the one with the scythe, who looked like a mermaid, got hit by the attack head-on. The person standing beside the seventh princess watched as the mermaid got damaged by the attack and lost its tail, and he was amused that Gu Zioner was not losing even though it was a battle of one versus three, and concluded that she would be difficult to handle. All the while, Gu Zioner seemed to be getting tired and was out of breath. The seventh princess smiled confidently as she saw that Gu Zioner had almost spent all of her energy, and she commanded her people to keep taking turns attacking her, and told them that she would like to see how long Gu Zioner would be able to last. Gu Zioner knew that her spiritual Kai had been exhausted from the many rounds of battles. She needed to find a way to execute all of her opponents at once with the precious artifacts her masters had left her. So, she looked up at the seventh princess and provoked her, asking why she was not attacking with them. The creature beside the seventh princess was thrilled at how Gu Zioner not only had mysterious means, but also quite the silver tongue. He said that he loved deflowering little girls like her the most. 
Gu Xiyan's two remaining opponents performed a simultaneous attack that she was able to block with her sword, but she was pushed back due to the power of the impact, and from above her, the creature standing beside the seventh princess joined in the barrage of attacks with his gigantic morning star. He told her that he would break her bones and have her serve the seventh princess with wine. Gu Xiyan'er was able to block the attack, but it was evident that she was struggling to do so. She was harshly pushed back as her shield broke. The three of them got bloodthirsty eyes as they lunged forward for a simultaneous attack to kill her in one strike. Gu Xiyan'er smiled victoriously as she raised her two fingers and thought that she had been waiting for that attack. The seventh princess eyes widened when she realized what Gu Xiyan'er was doing and immediately ordered her people to retreat. Gu Xiyan'er's enemies were surprised as they saw her start to shine brightly in front of them. Gu Xiyan'er extended her arm to launch her attack and told her enemies to have a taste of her fourth master's sword. The three of them lined up perfectly and got pierced by a huge golden sword. The sword even reached and pierced the array in the sky, and it started to crack. Gu Xiyan'er looked up in the sky expectantly, as she would have a chance once the array was broken. She did not get to finish her sentence and was surprised to see the seventh princess lunging towards her with a trident in her hands, calling her a cunning little bitch for killing her people. Although exhausted, Gu Xiyan'er was still able to block and parry the seventh princess barrage of attacks. At one of the princess attacks, she managed to make Gu Xiyan'er let go of her sword. She immediately took the chance to jump over her and kick her towards the ground. She told her that she was so young, yet she had already utilized such a devious and cruel method, so someone like her must not be left alive. Gu Xiyan'er hit the ground with such a powerful impact that stones and dust flew out in all directions. The seventh princess then threw her trident, infused with her aura, towards Gu Xiyan'er and told her to go to hell. A huge amount of water splashed when the trident hit the ground, but Gu Xiyan'er was still able to dodge the attack by jumping backwards. Gu Xiyan'er realized that the seventh princess was at the peak of the sacred sovereign realm and she needed to buy some time to recover as she didn't have enough spiritual kai. So, she tried to drag out the fight by dragging out a conversation. She told the seventh princess that they were not the good people they thought they were, as all they did was abuse their power. The seventh princess laughed at what Gu Xiyan'er said and told her that she must be abusing her power because her cultivation was higher than hers. Her trident glimmered as she told Gu Xiyan'er that she must have heard that those who offend the royal monarch palace come to no good end. Gu Xiyan'er confidently asked the seventh princess if she even knew who she was, but the seventh princess told her that she knew she was the disciple of the Taoist Immortal Palace's elder. But she didn't care, as he couldn't come into the ancient immortal continent to save her even if she killed her. Gu Xiyan'er was on edge, but she bluffed and told the seventh princess that her brother was Master Gu, who was currently in the ancient immortal continent, so if she killed her, he would certainly tear her apart and grind her bones into dust. But on the inside, she couldn't believe herself for using Master Gu's name at such a time, and she knew that it was wishful thinking for her, as the ancient immortal continent was vast. The seventh princess smiled confidently as she told Gu Xiyan'er that she knew about the deep hatred between their siblings, so he wouldn't even care about her life or death. Gu Xiyan'er put her hands on her hips and proudly told the seventh princess that she was nothing but an outsider, so she shouldn't be confident about their relationship. She even bragged that Master Gu himself said that he was the only one who could bully her. Gu Xiyan'er made a gesture by pinching her index finger into her thumb, confidently saying that someone in the sacred sovereign realm was nothing more than a mere ant before him. But in her thoughts, she couldn't believe what she was saying. The seventh princess got provoked when she heard Gu Xiyan'er compare her to an ant, and her expression contorted into anger. She immediately lunged to attack Gu Xiyan'er without continuing the conversation. Gu Xiyan'er was extremely surprised that the seventh princess got triggered so easily, but she was still able to dodge the attack by bending over backwards. She was now thinking of using her trump card because her spiritual Kai had not yet recovered enough. The seventh princess redirected the direction of her trident and did a slash attack that Gu Xiyan'er still managed to dodge by pushing herself off the ground using her hands. While she was still flipping midair, the princess saw an opening and shifted her stance in a swift motion, giving Gu Xiyan'er a side kick that made her groan. Gu Xiyan'er was thrown to the ground, where she crashed with force, and her body was dragged along the ground. She attempted to stand up, but the seventh princess stepped on her chest with her heels, and her face contorted in pain. The seventh princess pointed her trident at Gu Xiyan'er's throat and said that she was not afraid of Master Gu, so she would kill her first and witness the so-called reincarnation of a true immortal another day. Gu Xiyan'er winced in pain and cursed at her thoughts as the seventh princess kept on stepping on her. 
The seventh princess smiled ominously as she said that she wanted to see what Master Gu would do to her. Suddenly, someone expressed surprise at what the seventh princess said, and her eyes widened in surprise as she felt someone's presence beside her. It was Master Gu, who stared into space with his cold and emotionless eyes. Master Gu glanced at her with the same cold expression and asked her what she thought he would do to her. The seventh princess' eyes widened, and she was frozen in place, unable to react, as Master Gu's hand suddenly appeared in front of her. Master Gu swatted her like a fly, and the intense power made her let go of her trident, and she spun into the air multiple times. Gu Zioner, who was still lying on the ground, could not believe her eyes that Master Gu had really come, and she contemplated whether it was a coincidence or if he had been watching her from the very beginning. Master Gu looked down on her with a sly smile on his face, and judging from his expression, she came to the conclusion that he had heard everything she had said earlier. Two of the seventh princess people were still alive, and they immediately rushed to their princess, who was now kneeling on the ground and admitting to Master Gu that he was very strong but then she told him that he could not embarrass her. She glared at him as she touched her bruised cheeks and declared that she might not be weaker than him in a battle for life and death. Meanwhile, Master Gu was lending Gu Zioner a hand so she could stand up while asking her if she was alright. She was confused by the question, so she just made a sound to express that she was alright. Master Gu looked at her with his eyes half open, which seemed like he was trying to convey a message as he asked her what she meant by the sound she just made. Gu Zioner's eyes were wide open as soon as she realized what Master Gu was trying to do. Gu Zioner immediately clutched her chest dramatically and started to complain to Master Gu about her injuries being severe, her bones fractured, her organs displaced, and her being exhausted with no strength left. Then she told him that if he had not arrived in time, she would have died there. Master Gu glanced over at Gu Zioner and gave a subtle smile at her performance as she was sobbing and wiping off tears from her eyes, talking about how she would have died alone without anybody to collect her body. With such a sly expression on his face, he turned to the seventh princess and told her that since Gu Zioner's injuries were so severe, the royal monarch palace must have gone too far. The three of them, the seventh princess and her people, were furious at what Master Gu had just said and told him that he was spouting nonsense as it was Gu Zioner who killed her people. As soon as Master Gu started emitting a powerful, colorful aura, the seventh princess immediately questioned him for going so far as to abuse others with his powers. Master Gu confidently looked down at her, and then he used her words against her as he asked if he was abusing his power because his cultivation was higher than hers. As he continued to look down on her, he let out a sinister smile as he asked her how she wanted to die. The power of Master Gu's aura pushed back the seventh princess and her people. The three of them were furious and the seventh princess threatened Master Gu, telling him not to go too far by insisting on lending a hand to Gu Zioner. With Gu Zioner still sitting on the ground, baffled behind him, Master Gu confronted the seventh princess and told her that her very own underlings were the ones who injured his sister. He couldn't understand the reasoning behind her threat against him lending a hand to Gu Zioner, which angered the seventh princess. Gu Zioner recognized that Master Gu's arrogance resembled that of the seventh princess when she was attempting to hunt her down. She was amused at how the tables had turned as she looked up to Master Gu with awe. She wondered why her heart felt at ease with Master Gu there. Gu Zioner blushed and pouted as she thought of her initial plan to use her revenge as an excuse to have Master Gu shoulder the blame and then leave him there alone. Master Gu smiled when he saw that the system gave him a notification that Gu Zioner's attitude towards him had changed. The seventh princess looked furious at Master Gu for being insistent and asked him how they should settle the matter of her brother's death at the hands of his sister. One of her people added that Gu Zioner even killed many of the royal monarch palace's warriors and asked him to account for that. Gu Zioner was now able to stand, and she immediately taunted one of the seventh princess's warriors and called him fatty. She even reminded him of what he said about breaking her bones and forcing her to serve wine to his master, and she asked why he was not following through with what he said. Master Gu looked at the purple guy with his cold, piercing gaze, and the guy immediately felt scared and began sweating profusely. As Master Gu took a step forward, he asked them how he should settle the situation. While still having that cold expression on his face, he then started to emit a smoke-like aura. The seventh princess was intimidated when she felt the aura but could not recognize what it was. A strong gust of wind blew towards her, and she had to protect her head with her arms and strengthen her stance so she wouldn't be blown away. While protecting herself, she suddenly felt something strange. She looked back and saw Master Gu's index finger glimmer with a golden light. Before she could even react, one of her people was lying on the ground with his body all dried up like soil. While Master Gu was absorbing a golden light coming out of his eyes and saying that he would settle the matter by having them all join the seventh princess's brother. The seventh princess was filled with terror and her eyes widened as she could not believe how Master Gu could wield the power of the laws. The purple guy, who was already extremely terrified, 
called Master Gu a monster and ran away from him while he asked the seventh princess to save him. With his iris turned red, Master Gu gave him an ominous smile, and as the purple guy looked back while he was running away, seeing Master Gu's expression made him more terrified. Suddenly, Master Gu was gone from where he was standing, and the princess tried to reach out to him and told him to be careful. Master Gu was already standing in front of him with a cold, murderous gaze, and before the purple guy could turn to look in front of him, Master Gu raised his left hand and pushed him down to the ground, squishing his face in the process. The ground shook with the impact, and shockwaves vibrated through the air as the purple guy got pushed into the ground and looked like a turtle that hid back into its shell. The seventh princess was petrified, she couldn't move or say anything and just stared at the slowly dissipating smoke that was starting to reveal Master Gu. In front of him was the purple guy, dried up like a mound of rock, and the princess's eyes were bloodshot as she stared at the scene with terror and disbelief. Master Gu started to walk towards her and told her it was her turn, while she started to slowly back away as he took each step. She told him that he must not be in his best state after wielding the power of the laws, so she offered a discussion on behalf of the royal monarch palace's power. Master Gu confidently smiled as he simply ignored what she said and told her that if she had anything to say, she had to wait until she was in the underworld. The seventh princess was surprised when the huge lobster suddenly popped out of the trees and told her not to be afraid, as he would save her. The huge lobster confidently lunged to attack Master Gu from behind and told him to prepare, while he thought that he just came at the right time when Master Gu's condition was not at its peak. He thought that if he killed Master Gu, he would be able to win over the seventh princess's heart and obtain the palace master's recognition. But to everyone's surprise, he could not even lay a hand on Master Gu, who just swatted him like a fly. The seventh princess got mad and called Master Gu trash while summoning something. Master Gu looked amused and recognized that she was summoning a replica of the Qiang Furnace. As the summoned furnace grew larger, the seventh princess told Master Gu that even if it was a replica, it was still a treasure of her royal monarch palace, so it was enough to defeat him. But Master Gu just mockingly laughed at her. Master Gu calmly closed his eyes and called her a joke while he summoned a sword and levitated off the ground. He hovered in front of the seventh princess, with the sky behind him filled with endless swords. The seventh princess with her furnace looked miniature, as did Gu Zioner, who was standing on the ground and looking up to see their fight as they faced Master Gu. He spread his arms and called his move the Boundless Sword Strike God Slaying Order, and created an entire sky that was covered with swords that looked like stars in the beautiful night sky. Terror filled the seventh princess's eyes, and she could not believe what she was seeing. Every sword in front of her contained the power of the laws. Meanwhile, Gu Zioner was frozen in place as she looked up at the sky with awe, wondering if it was Master Gu's true strength. Beyond the mountains, a golden, shining light could be seen. And from the light, countless numbers of swords came rushing forward and toppled down the peaks of the mountains. Each of the sword's powers was so formidable that the rocks that were toppled down from the mountains were reduced to dust. The seventh princess fell lifelessly onto the ground with the rocks as the swords that pierced through her body started to dissipate into golden light. Gu Zioner looked down at the lifeless seventh princess on the ground as she asked Master Gu why she was thrown at her feet. Master Gu told her that although the seventh princess was dead, the blood within her could still be used to strengthen herself, so he asked if she did not want it. Gu Zioner did not answer the question, she looked like she was deep in thought and was speechless for a moment. Then she decided to ask Master Gu why he was there. Master Gu looked away as he told her that it was merely a coincidence. Gu Zioner's demeanor suddenly changed as she put her hands on her waist and proudly told Master Gu that she would have survived even if he did not interfere, so he should not expect her to thank him. With a bored expression on his face, Master Gu retorted that Gu Zioner only called her brother when she was in trouble, so it seemed like she was due for another punishment. Master Gu turned his back on Gu Zioner and started to walk away. He told Gu Zioner that he was leaving as he was afraid that he would fail to control his anger and seal her somewhere for 500 years. Gu Zioner retorted and told him to stop acting so proud because one day she would defeat him. But Master Gu cut her off and told her that if she wants revenge, she needs to prove herself because if she continues to stay the same as she was in the past, she wouldn't be fit to follow him around. Gu Zioner was surprised, and her eyes widened when she was reminded of the past. At the Gu residence, Gu Zioner was clinging to Master Gu's legs and was crying her eyes out, saying that Gu Lei was bullying her again and stole her toy. Master Gu tried to push her off his legs and looked annoyed as he told her to get out and not disturb his cultivation. Master Gu looked at her with disgust and told her that she was crying about something so mundane and asked her if she thought that he would care about something like that. Suddenly, Master Gu was stepping on a kid who was on all fours. He asked the kid who gave him the guts to bully Gu Zioner and told him that if they bullied her again, he would burn them all in a furnace. On the other hand, Gu Zioner was enjoying kicking her other two bullies that were buried headfirst in the ground. 
The young Guzayaner smiled so brightly and looked at her brother with admiration as she got her justice. In the present, Guzayaner stared at Master Gu with eyes filled with nostalgia. She then clenched her hand into a fist and told Master Gu that she was no longer a kid. Master Gu glanced back at her and mockingly doubted what she just said. Gu Zayaner looked grim as she told Master Gu that whether he was doing these things out of guilt or not, he could not conceal what happened in the past forever. She then glared at him with eyes full of determination and told him that she would find out what really happened and win against him fair and square. As Master Gu walked away from Gu Zayaner, the system notified him that Gu Zayaner's perception of him had changed, and as a result, his fortune and fate values had increased. Master Gu realized that Gu Zayaner's view of him probably began to change subconsciously, despite her constantly saying that she would defeat him. As he recalled how he had taken the seventh princess origin essence and given the leftovers to Gu Zayaner, he observed that she had such a naive mind and heart that even the slightest amount of favor given to her was more than enough to cause her to lose herself. She probably wouldn't even realize if someone was attempting to sell her for their own profit. Master Gu let out an internal sigh as he thought of how Gu Zayaner would probably end up running into lots of trouble if she didn't have an older brother like him looking after her all this while. The expression on his face was filled with satisfaction. After foraging around for a while, Master Gu's cultivation had naturally climbed up to the quasi-god realm. Now, even without his demonic energy, he could easily suppress all those young talents. All that was left to do was to know how his scapegoat, Yi Ling, was progressing with his treasure hunt. On the other hand, news quickly spread, and people started talking about Master Gu reaching the initial stage of the Quasi-God Realm. They also spoke about how his cultivation stage could kill off everyone at the Sea Monarch Palace, including the prideful seventh princess who was quickly taken out by a single attack from him. Yi Lu Lai and Yi Langshan overheard the conversation. Yi Lu Lai seemed pleased at what she heard, while Yi Langshan was a bit concerned about how Master Gu's growth was monstrous, and that there was no one left there that was strong enough to be his opponent aside from those that have royal blood and monsters that have been sealed away. Suddenly, something caught Yi Langshan's attention. He crossed his arms and asked Yi Lu Lai why he felt like she was happy about the matter. Yi Lu Lai smiled awkwardly while scratching her temples and hesitantly denied his accusations. Meanwhile, multiple huge splashes of water were created at sea as Yu Ming Kong fought with a red-haired lady with horns. The red-haired lady had this crazed look in her eyes as she was about to deliver her punch and told Yu Ming Kong that she would see how long she could hide from her. A huge explosion followed by a huge wave was created by the force of that punch, and Yu Ming Kong protected herself with her aura and flew away, distancing herself from the chaos. Yu Ming Kong never thought that she would meet someone so powerful there. She then recalled from her past memories that her opponent was one of the people under Long Tang who claimed that he was the image of the true dragon. She then looked back to the forest that was filled with bystanders and thought that there were too many people nearby, so it was not convenient for her to expose all the cards under her sleeve. While Yu Ming Kong's attention was elsewhere, her opponent was already behind her, preparing for an attack while calling her an outsider and asking what she was looking at. Yu Ming Kong looked annoyed, and her eyes glimmered as she turned towards the opponent, preparing to counter the attack. Their attacks clashed, creating a powerful shockwave that pushed away the waters below them. The animals in the forest started running as a huge wave of water started to surge through the forest, raging through the trees. While they talked about how powerful Yu Ming Kong was, the waves almost reached the bystanders who were standing on the branches of huge trees. One of them asked who Yu Ming Kong's opponent was, as they could not believe that she was at the Quasi God Realm already, and speculated that she was from the Ancient Immortals clan. Someone else interjected that they thought the Ancient Immortals clan vanished years ago, as the Ancient Immortal Continent's land was just a portion of their original homeland. While another laughed at the mention of the ancient immortal clan and said that they were probably their ancestors' slaves. But the guy who looked like a scholar told them that the ancient immortals' clan had long kept to themselves. And with the Ling Kai on the continent being considerably more dense and plentiful compared to theirs, it wouldn't be a surprise if their younger generation was considerably stronger than their current disciples. The women before them were a splendid example of that, and the kid beside him who was listening concluded that they should move more carefully in the future. Meanwhile, the lady who thought that the ancient immortal clan was their ancestor's slave was annoyed because of the embarrassment. At the same time, the red-haired lady acknowledged Yu Ming Kong's strength and said that if she were at the same level as her, she doubted that she would be able to defeat her. The red-haired lady extended her hand and offered Yu Ming Kong a chance to submit to the heir of their true blood dragon clan, Long Teng. She thought that he would appreciate a strong woman like her. Yu Ming Kong looked repulsed as she confirmed that her earlier thought was correct, it was really Long Teng. She remembered Long Tang's demonic appearance, who broke the barrier of the ancient immortal continent and killed all of the talented immortals in the upper realm. 
but he soon disappeared as though he had never existed to begin with, and the people thought that he had offended someone powerful or disappeared after accidentally venturing into a forbidden place. As Yu Ming Kong thought more about it, her face looked annoyed as she remembered Master Gu's arrogant face. She came to the conclusion that Long Tang's disappearance had something to do with his fiancée because he practiced the deity devouring demon art, so he would not have let go of the opportunity to consume Long Tang's true dragon essence. Yu Ming Kong smiled as she thought of a plan to use Master Gu's name to ward away Long Long Tang's subordinate, who was not worth exposing more of her abilities for. The red-haired lady noticed her change in expression and came to the conclusion that Yu Ming Kong must have heard of her master's name. She told Yu Ming Kong not to worry because with her looks and talents, she was sure that Long Tang would be willing to dual cultivate with her if she submitted to her proactively. The red-haired lady was confused when Yu Ming Kong laughed and told her that she should pray that what she said does not reach her fiancé's ears. Yu Ming Kong smiled confidently and told her opponent that she wouldn't be able to take her down. So rather than wasting their time with words, she should go back and remind Long Tang to be careful not to be beaten into a crawling bug by her fiancé, Master Gu. The red-haired lady got enraged with what Yu Ming Kong said and was lost for words. But then she chose to turn her back and agree with Yu Ming Kong. She told her that no woman that Long Tang wished for had escaped his claws so she should better be prepared to take back Master Gu's corpse. While the red-haired lady flew away, Yu Ming Kong smiled smugly as she thought that she was just one of Master Gu's prey. She hoped that she would still be able to laugh like she did when they finally met him. Yu Ming Kong looked at her wooden talisman, and she was surprised by the information that Gu Zionar was rescued by Master Gu. She then looked skeptical, as she knew that Master Gu was not someone so kind to do something without gaining some kind of profit but she was contemplating if Master Gu's motives towards Gu Zionar had changed in his current lifetime, or if he could simply be planning something sinister. She turned to fly away as she decided to just forget the matter. She would eventually find out why the Master Gu from her previous life was so different from the current one. And as for his attitude towards Gu Zionar, she would have to find a chance to ask Uncle Gu about the details. Meanwhile, a huge serpent was fighting with Yiling, and multiple parts of its body were hit by some kind of explosion. Yiling's expression looked eager as he used his move, Reincarnation Fist. The serpent's head slammed into the ground with such great force that its impact created a mess on the ground. Kai Ling's companions marveled at how strong Yi Ling was and how his cultivation had risen to the sacred sovereign realm, that he could already take down a monster that was at the Quasi God realm all by himself. As Yi Ling stood up on the serpent's head, one of Kai Ling's companions apologized to him for mocking him before. And as he told them that it was alright and not to worry about the matter, another one praised Yi Ling for being a role model of their generation for being kind generous, and having unparalleled strength. Unbeknownst to them, Elder Gui was scolding Yu Ling to be more careful as he had yet to obtain the Heavenly Emperor's inheritance. Yu Ling replied to him in his mind, asking why the inheritance that the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation left behind for him would be in the sector where the commoners live. He was concerned that with the amount of strength he had, he would die immediately as soon as he went looking for them. As Yu Ling looked over the inhabited area, Elder Gui told him that the Heavenly Emperor could not place it somewhere where everyone could try to snatch it and he was an immortal that presides over the laws of time during the ancient immortal times, so he must have planned ahead on the things that he wished to leave behind for his successor. When Elder Gui reprimanded him for not having the courage to find his inheritance as the heavenly emperor's successor, and told him to just go home and plant all those sweet potatoes, Yi Ling looked guilty but denied that he was not courageous enough. As Yi Ling looked at the people behind him, he thought that he didn't know what would happen in the ruins, so it seemed that he must bring them along with him. Kai Ling and Yin Mei climbed up to the serpent's head where Yi Ling was to check on him if something was wrong. As he was leading them from the very start, they asked him why they were not moving. Yi Ling told them that he needed to go to the ruins ahead as there was an important piece of fortune for him there, and if they believed him, he would bring them all together with him. In a heartbeat, Yin Mei told Yi Ling that she believed in him, which touched Yi Ling. He was extremely glad and was blushing, while Kai Ling on the side seemed to be jealous and annoyed at the situation. Kai Ling blurted out that she was going with him too. Yi Ling was so ecstatic that they were coming with him that he almost blurted out his true intentions. But he immediately caught himself and told them that there were a lot of fortunes to be found in those ruins, so there would be a chance that they would be able to obtain one for themselves if they followed him. All the while, Master Gu was meditating in the middle of the forest, and a purple aura was flowing towards him. He peacefully levitated and meditated as the purple aura enveloped him. Suddenly, he opened his eyes and smiled ominously as he found out that Yi Ling's fortune had finally appeared. At the entrance of the ruins, as Yi Ling told his companions that they wouldn't be far from their destination once they entered, one of them expressed concern that the place didn't seem safe. Yi Ling told them not to worry and that he would help them conceal their presence. He rushed forward and led them, telling them that they couldn't afford to hesitate. 
When Kai Ling was about to follow Yu Ling's lead, one of her companions called out to her. Kai Ling looked back, puzzled as to why she was called. Her companion told her that it was too dangerous. Even though Yu Ling's cultivation was not weak, the ruin was something that even the natives had no idea about. There was a possibility that someone of much higher level of cultivation might be waiting and luring them inside. Kai Ling seemed annoyed as she told him to wait outside so that they could turn tail and flee if something happened. Her companion stood his ground and told her that he felt Yi Ling was hiding something from them. All this time, he had led them away from traps and steered them in this direction with a clear goal in mind. The guy was not able to finish talking to Kai Ling as Yi Ling interrupted them, asking what they were talking about, and told them to keep up. Kai Ling turned to catch up to Yi Ling and told her companion not to worry as she believed in Yi Ling's character. He was definitely not the kind of person they thought he was. The guy was enraged at Yi Ling, as he was certain that he had some kind of motive that he was not telling them, while his other companion sighed and tapped him on the shoulder, urging him to follow them. Meanwhile, Yin Mei was observing Yi Ling, who was internally talking with Elder Gui. He asked Elder Gui if the natives who originally guarded the Heavenly Emperor's Enlightenment platform would also be in the ruins. Elder Gui told him they should be there and warned him that too much time had passed, so he was afraid that things wouldn't go as easily if they went against Yi Ling instead of immediately pledging themselves to him. Yi Ling confidently smiled as he told Elder Gui not to blame him for being inconsiderate towards them if they were the ones to betray him first. All the while, the five natives inside the ruins were talking about the successor to the Emperor of Reincarnation that appeared. They were contemplating if the prophecy was true and that the person who came was there to take away the inheritance of the ancient heavenly emperor of reincarnation. They thought that the slave mark on their tribe was just an ancient rumor, so they never thought that the prophecy would really manifest like that. An old lady with cat ears told the group that she had called all of them as their families had taken turns taking care of the Emperor of Reincarnation's Enlightenment Stone, Wu Jin. Now that they had to give it back, she was sure that none of them were happy with such a turn of events since they had been unable to unlock the Heavenly Emperor's abode that had lots of treasures and information inside. An old man calmly made the observation that the key to opening up the abode seemed to lie with the successor, while the one that looked like a minotaur was enraged and said that it was nonsense that someone would just come and take away the things they had originally had for a long time just because he was a successor. He said that only fools would agree to such a thing. Someone with a glowing mark on their hands calmed them down and told them not to panic. It was the old lady, and she told them that in accordance with the ancient agreement, all the youngsters that have entered from the outside world were at most in the quasi-god realm. Since they were all in agreement to guard the Emperor of Reincarnation's inheritance, she asked them what plans they had, but the Minotaur just blurted out that they should just kill the successor. The old lady looked resolute and told the group that since they made their decision, they should keep an eye on those outsiders closely. If there was anything strange, they should kill all of them and not let any of them go. Meanwhile, Yi Ling and his companions traversed inside the ruins while he shrouded them with his aura to conceal their presence. Yu Ling looked up at the rooftops that were swarming with natives, and he cursed internally, wondering why there were so many in the area. As Elder Gui told him that they might be there for him, Yu Ling looked agitated as he thought that they had been found out already when barely any time had passed. Elder Gui comforted him and told him not to be pessimistic as they didn't know the details yet, so maybe it was a test given to him by the Heavenly Emperor. Upon hearing this, Yi Ling got even more upset and slammed his fists on the wall while questioning why the Heavenly Emperor couldn't have just left some fortunes without making them work for it. All the while, Yin Mei was carefully observing Yi Ling's actions and speculated that the natives were really hunting for Yi Ling. Yi Ling's talisman shone as Elder Gui reprimanded him for being impatient and said that a test must have a way to pass it. He instructed Yi Ling to find the abode that the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation had left for him. Through the inheritance, there must be a method to tame the Enlightenment platform. He then said that once Yi Ling had the Enlightenment platform in his hands, no one, not even those natives, would be able to stop him. Yi Ling clutched the talisman in his hands as he thought of Master Gu and hoped that Elder Gui was right. He must get the inheritance to reveal that Master Gu was the true inheritor of the demonic arts. Suddenly, Yin Mei grabbed Yi Ling's clothes as she pointed at the sky, asking him if the natives were there to capture them. Yin Mei acted like she was downhearted when Kai Ling got furious with her actions and told her to stop spouting nonsense. The natives might just be trying to find something. Yi Ling nervously told Yin Mei that the natives being around was just a coincidence. He told them not to worry as he would protect them all regardless of what happened. Yin Mei held Yi Ling's arms close to her chest and told him that she believed that he was trustworthy. She gave him a bright smile, and Yi Ling smiled back at her while blushing and holding her hands that were wrapped in his arms. All the while, Kai Ling was glaring at them and cursing Yi Ling in her mind. Somewhere in the ruins, the lifeless bodies of two natives lay at an entrance. Master Gu came out of that entrance with more dead bodies of natives inside, one of which was even stuck in the ceiling. 
He was smiling as he looked at the system screen and was a bit surprised that it showed him that his true strength was already at the intermediate stage of the Divine King realm. He was also glad that the resources he had come to take had still been left intact at that old tomb, waiting for Yuling to infiltrate the place. He calmly looked at the horizon as he closed the system screen. He thought that he would no longer need to break through to the next step. If both his immortal and demonic cultivation developed too quickly, it would attract the attention of those old monsters. That would be bad for him. As he observed the natives scouring the area from the high ground, he wondered if they had realized something. It hadn't even been a day since Yu Ling infiltrated, and the entire ruin seemed to have been activated. But as he looked closely, he observed that the natives were still investigating. They have yet to find out where Yu Ling was, as they have been wandering around aimlessly. Master Gu decided that he should grab one to question. Right on cue, a native that resembled a cat landed in front of him. She declared that she would cut the successor into eight big pieces if she managed to catch him. Master Gu was surprised, and it seemed like he could not believe his luck. Then he smiled sinisterly. He grabbed the native by her shoulder and greeted her. As the native looked behind her, she was surprised to see Master Gu emitting such an ominous aura, and he told her not to make any noise, or she would die. The space around them warped, and they were sucked into a tiny hole in the space. The native was surprised as she fell into a place of pure white nothingness. Suddenly, she was screaming as she fell from the sky. She was sweating profusely as she got suspended in place, and the horror in her eyes was evident. It was Master Gu who prevented her from falling down by grabbing her upper garment, and he welcomed her into his world. Master Gu tossed her, but instead of falling down like earlier, she seemed to hit an invisible floor in the sky. Her eyes were filled with surprise as she looked at what was below her. She marveled at the upside-down scenery in front of her and recognized that she was in an inner world space. This made her question who Master Gu was and what he was trying to do. Master Gu told her that he just wanted to understand something about the situation from her. The native bowed down on all fours and wagged her tail at Master Gu while pleading not to kill her. She promised him that she would tell him everything. She was then surprised when Master Gu touched the top of her head. Master Gu smiled sinisterly as he told her that there was no need, as he was already accustomed to doing such things himself. While still kneeling down, the native screamed in pain as Master Gu started to extract her memories. As he saw through the memories of the native, Master Gu saw that the elders of the natives had decreed the search for Yiling. This made him realize that, despite being someone incredibly powerful, the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation was still unable to arrange everything smoothly after his death. He smiled with delight as he obtained quite a lot of information about the Slave Mark, the five ancient ethnic groups, and the Enlightenment Platform, which was currently being held by the Black Eagle in charge of the Heavenly Emperor's abode. The native was drooling and already unconscious when Master Gu let go of her. His aura was still dispersing from her eyes and mouth. The native lay lifeless on the invisible platform as Master Gu looked into the horizon. He was thinking about how he doesn't know how long Yiling would take to find the Heavenly Emperor's abode and how he knew that the Black Eagle who was in charge holds the true seal. He decided that he had to do something in the situation. Master Gu seemed to be controlling multiple bird people and thought that he would conveniently try out the secret mystic art that he learned from the god devouring demonic arts, the wedding dress cultivation art. At an inn, four natives were having drinks and a meal together. One of them was leaning by the window, while the rest were sitting at a round table. Only one of them was from the main family, Hai Ming. The three others were asking him why the five ethnic tribes suddenly mobilized such large amounts of manpower that even those at the Heavenly God realm have been enlisted. They speculated that outside world cultivators may have managed to enter their ancestral lands. The one who looked like a minotaur appeared to be drunk, as he hiccuped while calling the outsiders a bunch of useless nobodies. He said that if their clan had not followed the words of the ancient promise they made and moved out into the outside world, there wouldn't be a difference in their current standards. Haiming did not agree with what the minotaur said. His heavenly god realm bodyguard was also sent out by his grandfather. It seemed that the severity of the situation had escalated to the point where it was beginning to affect their clan's future. The guy by the window turned to look at them and told them that they should not care and just drink themselves into oblivion. He said that even if the skies were to collapse, Haiming shouldn't be the one to spearhead all of this, as he still had his older sister to help him. Haiming did not like what the guy just said, so he asked him what he was implying. The guy leaned back nonchalantly at the window while telling him that he has a grandfather who was a clan elder, and an older sister who has immense cultivation talent. He even has a heavenly god realm bodyguard around him at all times, even though both of them are trash at cultivating. The guy resembled a snake in appearance as he smiled slyly while telling Hai Ming that he and his sister were born by the same mother. He was satisfied living in his sister's shadow. He pointed out that he had zero authority, even in his own household. Most treated him as an invisible person. He instigated Hai Ming to think about his situation and asked if he did not wish to change it. Hai Ming was infuriated and glared at the guy. 
He intertwined his fingers and leaned on his chin as he thought of his sister. He told them that he was naturally glad that his older sister was so accomplished since they were siblings from the same mother. So he asked the guy what he was trying to instigate. The guy tapped Hai Ming on the shoulder and told him that they had been friends for so long that he knew about his ambition and desire for more power. He said that he was just waiting for a change, to be gifted with talent just like his sister and to be looked up to by everyone. After saying what he said, he told their other companions that they should go. With how serious the situation currently was, people with little cultivation like them should return home earlier to avoid getting mistakenly killed by others. The three of them left, leaving Hai Ming, who was still pissed at what happened. Hai Ming was startled when a voice suddenly asked him if he wished to stand above everyone else. He immediately stood up to look around the room as he asked who was there talking to him. The voice did not answer his question but continued to ask him instead if he wished to be stronger and if he wanted to be a being that stood above everyone else. Hai Ming now looked terrified as he could not see anyone in the room, while the voice continued to ask him if he wished to cultivate an immortal art and rise above everyone else. A sudden realization hit Hai Ming as he thought that this could be the fortune that he had always been waiting for. He smiled and eagerly called out to the voice, calling it senior, and told it that he wished to and that he wanted to. Suddenly, a purple aura shrouded him, and he was consumed by its vortex. Hai Ming looked up and was astounded. He was transported and was now standing in front of a huge gate. The gate started to open, and someone inside was telling Hai Ming that in order to be under his tutelage, Hai Ming must leave behind his mortal troubles and be prepared to step into the depths of hell and risk his ability to reincarnate into the next life. An elder was standing in front of the now open gate, and he seemed to know Hai Ming exceptionally well, about him being from the Black Eagle tribe and about him cultivating his willpower due to being affected by his older sister for most of his life. The elder who gracefully stood in front of Hai Ming was Master Gu in disguise. He told Hai Ming that from the moment he was born until now, he understood everything about him. Hai Ming immediately knelt on the ground and praised the one before him as his senior and a true god. He was now on all fours and was expectantly looking up at the disguised Master Gu, asking how he would become stronger. Master Gu managed to retrieve information about what Hai Ming's life was like when he was catching a few souls. While Hai Ming bowed down and requested for the disguised Master Gu to enlighten him, Master Gu was thinking about how strong Hai Ming's desire was for him to get hooked onto the bait the first time he threw it out. While stroking his long beard, the disguised Master Gu looked down at Hai Ming with one eye and told him that he was the enlightened omnipotent supreme monarch of fate. He claimed that Hai Ming would attain immortality upon speaking his true name and become his apostle. He would be able to leave behind a sliver of his true essence in the river of time, even if everything around him turns to dust. Hai Ming's eyes widened in surprise when he heard what Master Gu said, and he immediately bowed his head down, saying that he was willing to be the omnipotent supreme monarch's apostle and requesting to be taught. Master Gu created a ball of colorful aura and told Hai Ming that, as his apostle, he would impart some of his skills and knowledge to Hai Ming. As he told the kneeling Hai Ming to open up his mind and accept his teachings, Master Gu waved his hand and showered him with his aura, while Hai Ming thanked him and swore to give everything he had to Master Gu. A golden light struck Hai Ming's forehead. His eyes widened, and his entire being shook as he absorbed the light. Hai Ming was full of excitement while staring at his hands, as he found out that he was given the Paving Way Immortal Arts, a technique that ignores talent and has no prerequisite. So as long as he gave the technique to others, he would be able to copy a part of that person's talent and would even share the fruit of their cultivation efforts. With the aura oozing out of his fingers, Hai Ming looked maniacal as he told Master Gu that the immortal art fit perfectly for him, who lacked talent and thought that it was prepared for him. Master Gu smiled, pleased that the seed had been planted because he knew that once Hai Ming found out about the terrifying benefit and secret of the technique, his ambition would inflate to the point that it would be difficult to stop himself as the temptation to reap the benefits of others would be too great. Hai Ming stood up and spread his arms, manically rejoicing about the fact that he had gotten an immortal art and declaring that no one would be able to call him trash anymore. Master Gu turned his back at Hai Ming, who was now laughing maniacally, and he looked pleased at the thought that he only gave a seed of hope to Hai Ming who has been suppressed for all his life, but the trash would now turn into a genius. He saw it as him creating a fortunes chosen for the Black Eagle tribe and thought that with Hai Ming, it would be much easier for him to carry out his plan of devouring the five ethnic tribes. Hai Ming was alarmed when he noticed that Master Gu was gone, and the door was closing before him. And then he was surprised when he got warped back to the inn he was at earlier. He looked around, and when he realized that he had returned, he thought that Master Gu must truly be an omnipotent supreme monarch with such mysterious abilities. When he checked his aura, he was relieved that he still had the immortal art with him and immediately planned to have a few of his lackeys try it out with the intention of letting everyone in his tribe cultivate with the art. He clenched his fists and smiled sinisterly as he imagined himself being able to share a fraction of everyone's talent and eventually be able to rule over all the five ethnic tribes. 
He was looking forward to how strong he would eventually become, and he was confident that the seat of the future leader would now belong to him. Meanwhile, someone was traveling on the mountaintops with such great force that the ground was exploding with every collision. He had the wings and tail of a dragon, which could be clearly seen as he flew over a crowd of people with horns. He landed on the ground with intense force, and the crowd immediately knelt down on their knees and welcomed him back from his seclusion. He was their lord, Long Teng. His eyes were menacing as he breathed out smoke and asked them about the progress of the thing he had ordered them to do. Yu Ming Kong's opponent earlier, the red-haired lady, showed him a blue crystal and said that they had managed to capture quite a large amount of beautiful and talented ladies from the outside world. But there was one lady whose talent and legendary beauty surpasses them all. Long Tang looked excited and told her that he wanted to have a look. The red-haired lady introduced him to Yu Ming Kong the heir to the celestial Wushuang dynasty, from the outside world while she extended her hand and the blue crystal floated in the air while producing a circle of blue light. An image of Yu Mingkong appeared in front of Long Teng, and he was extremely delighted to see such a beauty, and he could not believe his eyes that there was someone as beautiful as her in the batch. He then praised the red-haired lady, who was his younger sibling, and told her that she had never let him down a single time in her hunting. The red-haired lady's expression turned serious as she told Long Teng that Yu Mingkong has a fiancé who is the heir to the Taoist Immortal Palace, a man from the outside world's Gu family who is said to have the physique of a true immortal, so she was afraid that it would be difficult. Long Teng smiled as he mocked how a mere savage from the outside world would dare to say that he has a true immortal physique in front of him. He smiled sinisterly while looking confident as he declared that he would tear Master Gu into pieces in front of his fiancé if he tried to stop him. A crowd of cultivators had gathered in a camp, and they were talking about Long Teng, one of the strongest young cultivators of the ancient immortal continent who had come out of seclusion and vowed to suppress Master Gu. They said that once Master Gu heard of Long Teng's vow, he captured many of Long Tang's underlings, so a fight between the two was inevitable. Since Long Tang was not weak, it would be a good show to watch. Among those people in the camp were Yi Langshan and Yi Liu Lai, who were peacefully drinking tea at a table. Yi Liu Lai asked her brother if Long Tang was really a worthy opponent for Master Gu, and Yi Langshan told her that he had heard rumors of Long Tang's strength when he first arrived at the ancient immortal continent, but it was hard to say how much strength he would force Master Gu to exert. As he calmly sipped his tea, Yi Langshan suggested they should go and watch the match if the two of them fought, as their trip would be quite worthwhile if Long Tang could force Master Gu to exert his full strength. On the other hand, Yu Mingkong was standing at the edge of a cliff, extending her hands while holding something in them. It was the immortal key fruit that contains spiritual key, and with it, she would be able to break through the quasi-god realm. Yu Mingkong glanced over the two guards who were kneeling behind her and asked them if they knew Master Gu's plans for that day, but the guard told her that they had not been able to find any information regarding Master Gu recently. She then thought to herself that Master Gu must be hiding, enjoying himself in digging graves and looting corpses. She was afraid that his cultivation had also increased a great deal. Yu Mingkong stared into the sky as she thought that Master Gu in her past life must have been preoccupied with scheming something important as he did not fight against Long Tang on the ancient immortal continent. Yu Mingkong smiled as she thought that with Master Gu's personality, he would not choose to remain in hiding when someone was openly provoking him and clamored to steal his very own fiancé. So now he would have no choice but to reveal himself, even if he believed that it was she who plotted against him. Meanwhile, Gu Ziyaner was meditating at the foot of a waterfall. Her pet dragon came to her to deliver some news, and she smiled as she never would have expected that someone as evil as Master Gu would get what he deserves. Gu Ziyaner looked pleased as she scratched the cheek of her pet, Zio Lan and confirmed if what was said was true, that the sacred bananas were about to ripen. She was looking at a bountiful banana tree, guarded by three monkeys, as she confessed that although she hoped to see Master Gu's face of defeat, she was hesitant to believe that Long Tang would pose any trouble, as she heard that he had not yet reached the true god realm. While the three monkeys guarding the banana tree were glaring at her, she sighed and said that it seemed that she would not get her revenge for another while. While contemplating, she leaned over the palms of her hands, and when she decided that she should still go and watch if Long Tang would be able to defeat Master Gu, Xiao Lan yelled and cheered on to knock over Master Gu. As she imagined Long Tang stepping over Master Gu, who had been beaten into a pulp, she smiled, her eyes filled with excitement as she made up her mind to go and watch the fight. On the other hand, Hai Ming was kneeling in a room, laughing while looking at an open book on the floor. He was ecstatic that he had only given the paving way immortal art to three people, but he had already achieved such results. 
even his talent for cultivation seemed to have increased. The aura at his fingertips was oozing as he smiled sinisterly, amazed at the unbelievable power the technique holds. He was looking forward to the time when he would be able to surpass everyone and become the strongest being. Suddenly, someone opened the door to the room and called him out. It was his sister who authoritatively pushed the door open wide with both her hands and asked him what he was doing while calling him a brat. With the book tucked behind him, he hurriedly closed the doors and asked his sister to come in as he had something important to tell her. Upon observing his actions, his sister asked him why he had been acting so sneakily lately. While pulling the book from behind him, he put his arms over her shoulders and told her that he had called her over to show her something good. She was skeptical of it and told him that she would be satisfied as long as he does not cause trouble. He handed her the book, and his sister looked at it with curious eyes, asking what it was and if it was an ancient technique. Her eyes widened with disbelief as she read through the contents of the book. She was astounded by how profound the technique was and asked Hai Ming where he obtained it. He awkwardly scratched the back of his head and said that he accidentally found it, so she need not think too much about it. While he gently pushed the book towards her to urge her to take it, he told her that if the technique was really useful, she could share it with their father and the elders. She playfully elbowed him as she praised him for thinking of sharing the technique with the tribe after obtaining it. His sister looked at him intently as he smiled and scratched the back of his head while saying that keeping the technique to himself, who was merely trash with a low talent for cultivation, would be such a waste. It would be better if their tribe could increase in strength with that technique so he would be able to live more comfortably as a playboy. His sister closed her eyes and smiled while telling him that she had wronged him all those years. While waving the book in the air as she walked towards the door, she assured him not to worry as she would show it to their father and grandfather and have them give him what he wanted. Hai Ming happily responded that he trusted her. Hai Ming's expression immediately turned serious as he watched his sister walk away and thought about his success. He internally thanked the supreme being and smiled sinisterly, thinking about how he would be able to reap the fruit of cultivation from the entire tribe once his sister passes on the ancient technique. Meanwhile, Master Gu, who witnessed the entire thing, looked pleased. He praised Hai Ming's acting skills and acknowledged that he was not completely useless. He planned to reveal himself once the entirety of the Black Eagle tribe begins cultivating his technique, and the rewards he would gain from that moment would far surpass those from his looting and digging, while some people were approaching him from behind. He smiled peacefully as he recalled how Yu Mingkong and Gu Ziyaner had used the same methods of diverting conflicts after coming into the ancient immortal continent, and how he was the one to clean up their messes. But he had decided to just let it slide as Yu Mingkong had acted well recently so he wouldn't make it difficult for her. The people who were approaching him were his people, who had caught Long Tang's underlings. One of them reported to him that Long Tang was on the east side, accompanied by seven cultivators of the quasi-god realm and many others of the sacred sovereign realm. He smiled as he glanced at them and thought that there must be something wrong with Long Tang's head that he was offering sacrifices willingly. Then he thought that since he has come to seek death, not fulfilling his wish would be unreasonable on his part. While Master Gu was thinking out loud if that was Long Tang's limit, one of his people ordered their prisoners to kneel. But one of them, the red-haired lady, revolted and demanded not to be touched. She recognized that the man in front of her was Master Gu. And while kneeling, she confidently threatened Master Gu not to be smug as her brother would find him. She smiled evilly as she continued to threaten them, saying that if she lost even a single strand of hair, they would all die, including Yu Mingkong. But she was not able to finish her threats, and her eyes widened with surprise as something hit her face with great force. It was Master Gu, who had his hands extended out while the red-haired lady's face was planted on the ground. He looked down on her coldly, and with a murderous aura, he told her that she should be glad that Yu Mingkong was not injured in their fight because otherwise, she would have been a corpse at that moment. The red-haired lady was enraged, and she glared while her face was still on the ground. She swiftly sat down and yelled at Master Gu, who dared to torture her, but he simply commanded her to shut up. Her lips sealed shut on their own, and she was surprised that she could not open them. She looked terrified as she realized that it was the spoken law and wondered how Master Gu knew it. Master Gu turned his back at them and commanded his people to spread the news that Long Tang's sister was in his hands. And with a sinister smile, he told them to pass on the message that Long Tang should crawl over to him if he does not want his sister to die. The cultivators were flying through the air and discussing how Master Gu and Long Tang had agreed to have a duel. They hurriedly flew in the same direction, exclaiming that they did not want to miss such a rare sight. Meanwhile, on the ground, Master Gu and Long Tang's people were fighting, and a crowd had gathered to watch from the sidelines. A group of natives mocked Master Gu for being afraid to come out of hiding and advised that it would be wiser for him to surrender and hand over his fiancée. Gu Ziyaner blended in with the crowd of cultivators on the other side, wondering if Master Gu had still not arrived. While the cultivators were agitated at how the natives were hateful and had a significant physical advantage, Yi Lu Lai urged her brother to teach the natives a lesson. 
However, Yilangshan told her that it could wait. Suddenly, something caught Yilangshan's attention and alarmed him. Something fell on the ground with such incredible speed that only a red light indicating its path was visible before the ground shook and rocks were thrown in all directions. The group of natives was ecstatic when they recognized that it was their young lord, Long Tang, while the group of cultivators was surprised. Long Tang stood there menacingly, facing the cultivators while holding two unconscious cultivators in both his hands and asking which one of them was Master Gu. He mercilessly threw the unconscious cultivators towards the group. Gu Ziyaner was peeking from the back of the crowd, looking curious at what was happening in front, while the rest of the cultivators were frozen in place due to shock. While Yu Langshan acknowledged Long Tang's strong aura, he immediately blocked Yi Liu Lai, who was now glaring at Long Tang. Yi Langshan told her not to be impulsive as Long Tang's cultivation was at the peak of the Quasi God realm. Meanwhile, Gu Ziyaner was frantically looking around for Master Gu and thought that he was planning on standing up Long Tang. The group of natives rejoiced upon the arrival of Long Tang and called for Master Gu to come out and die. Long Tang was crossing his arms and smiling menacingly, saying that if Master Gu did not reveal himself, then he would have no choice but to vent his anger on the ones present and declared that he would kill the men and have the women serve him. Yu Mingkong suddenly appeared in the sky, gaining the attention of the audience below, including Gu Ziyaner as she reprimanded Long Tang for being impudent. Yu Mingkong gracefully hovered in the air as she looked down on Long Tang. The sight of her beauty made Long Tang ecstatic, and he declared that once he killed Master Gu, she could come with him. Yu Mingkong was annoyed at Long Tang and started to cast her imperial art, the Blazing Heavenly Sword. Long Tang stood in the middle of the crowd, unfazed by the giant sword charging towards him that Yu Mingkong summoned. He then smiled confidently, telling Yu Mingkong that he admired her wit for attacking him and that he liked it. With one swift wave of his arm, Long Tang effortlessly broke the gigantic sword that was coming towards him. The cultivators were surprised at how easily Long Tang shattered an imperial arts, and they started doubting if Master Gu would be a match for him. While Yu Liu Lai was just surprised and could not say anything, Yu Langshan commented that Yu Mingkong, no matter how strong she was, was not Long Tang's match as the difference in their cultivations was too large. Long Tang started to charge his red aura on his fist and threw a whirlwind of fiery aura with a dragon's head towards Yu Mingkong, declaring that she had no chance of winning before him. A huge explosion occurred in the sky, and as the smoke started to dissipate, it revealed a golden lotus. Yu Mingkong formed a shield filled with lotus flowers in front of her, and she was unscathed. She even mocked Long Tang's strength and asked him where he got the confidence to challenge Master Gu. The cultivators below looked up at the elegant Yu Mingkong in the sky with awe, surprised that she was able to block the attack. Meanwhile, Long Tang was surprised because his sister had told him that she was equal in strength to Yu Mingkong, and he wondered how Yu Mingkong had broken through in such a short time. Suddenly, the lotus petals started to separate from its core. Yu Mingkong then used them as projectiles and threw them in Long Tang's direction. Yu Mingkong's attack rained down upon Long Tang as he defended himself with his arms. Long Tang looked mad when one of the petals grazed and wounded his cheek. The petals on the ground suddenly flashed a golden color. Without giving him any time to react, the petals exploded, creating a huge cloud of smoke and fire. The audience was astounded at how strong it was. Yu Mingkong was now standing on the ground, staring intently at the cloud of smoke in front of her, while the audience behind her was trying to see if she had succeeded. But the smoke was obscuring their view. Long Tang burst out of the smoke without any warning. His face was full of rage as he told Yu Mingkong that she had successfully enraged him while lunging towards her for an attack. Yu Mingkong was surprised and stunned at Long Tang's sudden attack. She managed to summon a shield while Long Tang was charging towards her with his fists. However, her shield had already been damaged by the strength of Long Tang's aura even before his fists had reached her, and this made her worry. Long Tang then thrust his feet against the ground for an additional burst of speed. He then gave her a barrage of punches, telling her that she was that ignorant, so she shouldn't blame him for being heartless. Yu Mingkong's eyes widened in surprise at Long Tang's overpowering physical strength. Her shield had been entirely broken, and Long Tang smiled evilly as he prepared to give her another punch and said that he would see how she could fight back after he broke all of her limbs. The audience was all horrified at the scene before them and was preparing for the worst. Gu Ziyaner was preparing to interfere in the fight, but suddenly, something caught her attention. Long Tang was puzzled when a leg suddenly appeared in front of him, coming from a warp in space. It was Master Gu's legs, and it landed perfectly on Long Tang's face as he emerged out of the warp in space while Yu Mingkong who was standing behind him, had her eyes wide in surprise as things happened so quickly in front of her. Long Tang was blown away by that kick, and he collided with the natives who were standing on his path, and they were thrown in the air due to the impact. 
Long Tang was thrown with such a great force that he kept on being pushed back, even after colliding with the other natives, and the path was cleared in front of Master Gu. With an expressionless face, Master Gu then told Yu Ming Kong that he never thought she would really come after he told her to come find him after killing Long Tang, and he didn't know if he should praise her for being obedient or scold her for being an idiot. Master Gu looked back at the surprised Yu Ming Kong with the rejoicing audience behind her, and he smiled knowingly. He then walked towards Yu Ming Kong and held her hand, asking if she was alright, which puzzled Yu Ming Kong. Yu Ming Kong glanced at the audience behind her and figured out that he was putting on a show for them, so she decided to play along and held his hand while smiling brightly at him. She apologized for making him worry, and upon seeing the huge fortune point of 8,600 at the top of her head, Master Gu returned the smile and told her that he was glad that she was fine. Gu Ziyaner looked away uninterested in the event that was unfolding in front of her. Meanwhile, Yi Langshan, along with the audience, excitedly smiled at the scene and commented on how perfect they were for each other. Yi Lu Lai was glaring at them while chewing on her hair. As a flashing red light appeared, Long Teng quickly returned to the scene and acknowledged Master Gu's presence. He expressed his anger towards Master Gu, who dared to launch a sneak attack on him as he landed on the ground with great force, with a fortune point of 4,500 at the top of his head. Master Gu grinned at him as he thought that his guess about Long Tang being a dragon proud Sky Fortune's chosen was right. Long Tang's people and his sister, who was held captive by Master Gu, also arrived at the scene, calling out to Long Tang, asking him to save them. Long Tang was enraged at the scene and told Master Gu that he would consider leaving his corpse intact if he freed his people. Master Gu sighed and thought that it was a pity as the system notification screen had notified him of a mission that had been triggered, and he had the choice to either kill or subdue Long Tang. With a crazy murderous look on his face, Master Gu said that he was not someone who liked to kill. Long Tang was baffled at what Master Gu was doing when he reached out to choose the mission to kill Long Tang. When Master Gu told Long Tang that he was truly astonished to see an even more old-fashioned, brainless version of Long Ao Tian through him, Long Tang was mad and asked what he was talking about. Yu Ming Kong just quietly stood behind Master Gu, even though she did not understand what was happening. Master Gu grinned and told Long Tang that he was nothing but an idiot with developed muscles. Long Tang was enraged by what Master Gu said and was too angry to speak. Master Gu appeased Long Tang and told him not to get upset because it was their first meeting after all. He suggested that Long Tang should give him an appropriate present. As he said that, he heard that Long Tang likes to make blood sacrifices. He nonchalantly waved his hands to his people behind him, which caused everyone to look in their direction. The prisoners, including Long Tang's sister, looked terrified as they knelt on the ground. They started to beg Long Tang to save them. However, Master Gu's people grabbed them by the head and placed a dagger on each of their throats. Long Tang's eyes widened with rage, and he threatened Master Gu not to dare proceed with what he was about to do. He quickly lunged past Master Gu towards the prisoners that were about to get executed. But just as he was about to reach the prisoners, out of nowhere, Master Gu appeared in front of him with his hands extended forward, and asked him if he gave him permission to move. As Master Gu used his skill and commanded him to return, a vortex sucked Long Tang into a spiral of nothingness. He was then surprised that he was now back to where he was standing earlier, while the audience recognized the skill, the dimensional sleeve, which the Cheng Cheng Gu family was famous for. Long Tang's sister's eyes widened in disbelief as the person who held her captive grabbed her horns and slit her throat without hesitation. As the three of them fell lifeless on the ground, the crowd could not believe that Master Gu would just kill them when they were the subordinates of the ten youngest geniuses of the ancient immortals, and how he was deliberately humiliating them. Long Tang flared with anger, and his body was engulfed in his red aura as if he was burning in flames. He spoke Master Gu's name with spite in each syllable and jumped into the air to attack Master Gu, declaring that he would kill him. Meanwhile, Master Gu just calmly stood there. As Master Gu started to emit a blue aura from his bones, he told Long Tang that he was not capable enough to kill him, but he might stand a chance if he asked his clan elders to fight against him too. Long Tang was now preparing to deliver a punch as he lunged downward with full speed and told Master Gu to stop spouting nonsense and face his fist instead. However, Long Tang was the one who faced a fist when a gigantic fist, bigger than him, appeared out of nowhere and hit him head on. He crashed, and his body was dragged into the ground with such tremendous force that rocks started flying all over the place. Everyone was surprised, including Gu Ziyaner, who recognized her immortal bones dharma. The punch was so strong that even after being dragged to the ground, Long Tang still continued to get pushed away. Before he landed on the ground again and recovered his footing, the fist appeared again in front of him. This time, the fist drilled him into the ground, causing the rocks on the ground to shatter and fly in all directions. The natives called on Long Tang, their concern evident in their cries, as they could not believe that he was not even able to fight back. Meanwhile, Yu Mingkong, who was calmly standing on the sidelines and watching the fight, 
cursed inside her head as she saw Master Gu's cultivation had risen quite a bit once again. Surprisingly, Long Tang was not crushed by the fist. Instead, he caught it with his two bare hands and told Master Gu that a Dharma body could not crush a true dragon. Master Gu was unfazed, and he just coldly looked down on Long Tang, telling him that he was just a pest crawling on the ground. Wang Tang's legs started to sink through the ground due to the Dharma body's force. He clearly struggled and pushed against the Dharma body with all his might. One of the spectators, Yi Langshan, commented that Master Gu's power had risen to be on par with those monstrous young geniuses. He was able to suppress Long Tang easily even though he was only at the middle stage of the Quasi God realm. A young lady from the crowd looked relieved to see how strong Master Gu was. With him around, the inheritor of the demonic arts wouldn't be strong enough to wreak any havoc. The young man he was talking with was reminded of this fact since it had been a while since he had heard about him and thought that perhaps he did not follow them in there. Despite blood oozing from his eyes, nose, and mouth, Long Tang still dared to question Master Gu if he could really kill him. Master Gu levitated off the ground and started to summon another fist. He told Long Tang that he did not understand that if he wanted to kill him, it would have been easy, like smashing a bug into the ground. With a demeaning tone, he told Long Tang that his brainless Long Ao Tian kind of acts would no longer work, and he should blame himself for being born at the wrong time. Long Tang cussed at him in response. Suddenly, the sky grew dark, and lightning started to strike everywhere. While Long Tang started to gather a tremendous amount of aura, Master Gu acknowledged him as one of fortunes chosen as he was able to break through to the next realm when faced with a dire situation. The native saw a glimmer of hope and started to rejoice when they saw Long Tang's aura and realized that he was about to break through. Long Tang's injuries started to heal quickly. He laughed maniacally while he betted with Master Gu that he never thought it would happen and proudly declared that heaven was on his side. As Master Gu gracefully threw another fist at Long Tang, he told him that he still seemed to not understand. The fist landed on Long Tang, and the impact destroyed the ground a second time. But then, the aura in the air started to crackle. A huge amount of aura burst, creating a pillar of light. Upon seeing the tremendous power of Long Tang's dragon aura, the natives rejoiced and said that Long Tang wouldn't lose to a barbaric outsider. Long Tang had become a gigantic dragon. He was so huge that he was able to push back Master Gu's gigantic fists with his own two bare hands. He asked Master Gu how he was going to win against him when he was currently at a higher cultivation realm than he was. Master Gu was still calm and mockingly told Long Tang that he was truly a frog living in a well. Three more fists were summoned, and they hit Long Tang straight in the face. Long Tang was pushed back again, but this time he was able to dig his feet into the ground to stop himself from being blown away. Master Gu's Dharma body had now formed into a gigantic, six-armed god. But Long Tang recognized its strength and still told Master Gu that his Dharma body was not enough to defeat him. Master Gu coldly looked down on Long Tang while raising his two fingers to his chest and told him that he couldn't clearly see the difference between them. Multiple warps in space appeared as he used his skill, Infinite Heaven's Palm, Dharma Body Blessing, God Killer. Long Tang stared at it for a moment, and then his eyes widened with horror as he realized what he was looking at. Swords were being summoned at each warp in space, and they were all pointing at the surprised Long Tang. Long Tang started to take a step back when he felt the law's energy, and he could not believe that Master Gu was able to harness its power. He started running away from the fight, still unable to believe what he was witnessing, and called Master Gu a monster. Master Gu looked down on him like he was some insignificant insect as he used the fortune-plundering talisman. The swords chased Long Tang, who was still running away. He looked back and was horrified as his fortune points started to drop at an enormous speed. By the time his fortune points hit zero, a huge ball of aura exploded, and its shockwave traversed through the ground, turning rocks into dust. The natives could not believe their eyes, and they all fell into despair as they saw Long Tang get defeated. Meanwhile, still levitating in the air, Master Gu was prompted by the system screen, notifying him that his mission to exterminate the fortunes chosen had been completed, and he had been given his rewards. As he landed on the ground, one of his people immediately approached him from behind and bowed at him, asking him how they should deal with the living spirits in the area. Master Gu glanced at her and coldly commanded her to kill them all. Master Gu's people were enjoying themselves as they massacred the natives in the area, chasing and mercilessly killing them on Master Gu's orders to leave no one alive. While blood spilled on the native side, some cultivators rejoiced and were excited to spread the word that Master Gu had dominated and killed Long Teng, who was at the peak of the Quasi God Realm while still being at the middle stage of the Quasi God Realm. Others were apprehensive about Cheng Sheng Gu's family's power and thought that they couldn't defend them anymore. Meanwhile, Gu Ziyaner had her arms crossed and was disappointed in how events had unfolded. On the other hand, Yi Liu Lai grabbed the hem of her brother's clothes while Yi Langshan sighed as he acknowledged Master Gu as a true genius within their generation. 
even though he recognized that he was no longer qualified to stand next to Master Gu and be called a genius, he would show everyone that the reincarnation of the Heavenly Emperor was not simply a title that was just for show. Yu Langshan commanded his people to take their leave, as they all had to work hard and raise their strength since the inheritor of demonic arts was still hiding in the shadows. So when the time came for them to fight, they would be strong enough not to drag Master Gu down. All the while, two natives were hiding in a dimension in space and were able to witness everything. The other one asked his lord if they were just going to sit there and let the outsider kill Long Teng. His lord told him that it was the fate of the rebellious and prideful Long Teng, and that he had simply reaped what he had sown. However, he never would have thought that Long Teng would pay for his mistake with his life. They were looking down at Master Gu, who was hovering over Long Teng's corpse. When the other one tried to reason with their lord that Long Teng was still a descendant of their clan's main family, his lord sighed and said that if they moved now while the slave mark was still in place, they would be the ones in trouble. Meanwhile, Master Gu knowingly smiled as he glanced in the direction where the two natives were hiding. He concluded that those two were really good at holding themselves back because not only did they just abandon Long Tang to die, but they also decided not to retrieve his body. This was good for him as he was now confident to take more risks in the future. He opened the system's fortune treasure chest that he had obtained by defeating Long Tang. A red stone came out of the chest, and the system congratulated him for obtaining the five-colored true dragon's blood essence. He grinned as he looked at the stone intently and absorbed it. A colorful, glimmering aura embraced Master Gu in a circular manner as he opened his arms to accept it. He smiled as he stared at the aura flowing through the palms of his hands and felt that the five-colored true dragon's blood essence had immensely enhanced his body's constitution, health, and defense. He slyly smiled as he thought about how good the system was, considering that it was helping him become well-rounded in every aspect. Suddenly, Yu Mingkong approached him from behind. He glanced at her and asked her why she hadn't left yet and if she still had something to say. Yu Mingkong was apprehensive, and Master Gu sensed it. She was astonished when Master Gu teleported himself directly in front of her and playfully asked her if she was afraid that he would take revenge against her for tricking him, or if she was feeling guilty. With a pale face, she immediately denied his accusations. Yu Mingkong was dumbstruck when Master Gu crossed his arms and proudly told her that she should not be upset with herself as it was not her fault that she was born pretty and Long Tang deserved to die for taking advantage of her. Looking at Long Tang's corpse, which had created a huge hole in the ground, he told Yu Mingkong that he knew that even if he did not do something about Long Tang, it was not her style to leave him be. However, Yu Mingkong acted like she had no idea what he meant. So, Master Gu gave her a direct question and asked her what her intentions were regarding Long Tang. He even told her that if she gave him a proper answer, he might just give her Long Tang's body. Yu Mingkong was surprised when she heard what Master Gu said, and she could not believe that he was willing to give Long Tang's corpse to her by simply giving her reason for instigating him. Master Gu acted like he was astonished by Yu Mingkong's doubts and told her that he most certainly would give her Long Tang's body. He covered his mouth with his hands, acting like he was heartbroken, as he asked Yu Mingkong if she still did not believe in him. Yu Mingkong was dumbstruck, and she just stared at him blankly, contemplating the odd situation unfolding in front of her. Yu Mingkong decided to give him the proper reason he asked for and told him that she heard that there was a drop of an ancient mysterious dragon's true blood essence within Long Tang's body, and that blood essence is of great use to her. Master Gu's eyes widened as he was surprised when he heard that Yu Mingkong was looking for the true dragon's blood essence, and he got nervous as he thought it could be the blood essence that he just absorbed, the five-colored true dragon's blood. Yu Mingkong smiled smugly at him when she noticed Master Gu's reaction, and she confronted him for showing his true colors upon hearing something potentially good. She then criticized him for never changing as a selfish person. She turned her back on him as she was annoyed and told him to forget it, as she never held much hope that he would give Long Tang's corpse to her. Master Gu felt that something was not right and was deep in thought when he realized that the five-colored true dragon's blood originated from the system as a reward. So the one Yu Mingkong was talking about shouldn't be the one that he had absorbed earlier. Master Gu clicked his tongue in disapproval, which caused Yu Mingkong to stop in her tracks. With her back still turned towards him, Master Gu told her that in the beginning, she plotted to steal Yu Ling's inheritance, and now she was thinking about taking the true dragon's blood. He wondered why he was the one called selfish when she was the one trying to take all the good stuff. Yu Mingkong closed her eyes and clasped her hands while trying to calm herself. Master Gu stood beside her and teased her, asking her when she became so bad. Yu Mingkong swung her arms to attack Master Gu, but he dodged her attack effortlessly while continuing to tease her. He accused her of being angry because she was embarrassed that his guess was right. Yu Mingkong glared at Master Gu, and it seemed that she was about to lose her cool. But then she was caught off guard when Master Gu said that he would still give Long Tang's corpse to her, but with a condition. Upon hearing his condition that she had to call him husband, 
Her anger was finally ready to explode as she was about to refuse the offer, but she was interrupted when Master Gu innocently pointed towards Long Tang's corpse and told her to consider things, as the five-colored true dragon's blood is pretty hard to find. With his hands placed on his chin, Master Gu then pretended to start hesitating and told her that she had to hurry as the true dragon's blood was a precious treasure, so he might just change his mind later. Yu Kong bit her lip, and then she turned to look away from him while she hesitantly called him husband. She was startled when Master Gu suddenly came close to her with his hands to his ears, pretending that he couldn't hear her. Yu Kong was so provoked by Master Gu's actions that she yelled in his ears and called him husband, while Master Gu looked like he was enjoying teasing her. Yu Kong pushed Master Gu aside and declared that the corpse was already hers. She stood at the edge of the hole on the ground and looked at Long Tang's gigantic dragon body. As she stared at and examined the corpse, she realized that Master Gu had used some sort of mystic technique to keep the corpse intact. She doubtfully glanced over at Master Gu, who was standing a few steps away from her, as she thought about the possibility that he had planned to give her Long Tang's corpse from the very beginning. Still doubtful about the situation, she turned and asked Master Gu if he was really going to devour the dragon corpse with his demonic energy. She told him that if the corpse was important to him, then he should have it. But Master Gu just shrugged and told her that since she liked it so much, she could have it. When Master Gu smiled and said that he was truly happy that she actually took the initiative to think for his benefit, Yu Kong acted like she was annoyed, but in her thoughts, she was satisfied that he was able to tell that she was thinking for him. Master Gu stared at Yu Kong intently and smiled knowingly as he thought about what a stupid woman she was for thinking about what was best for him when everything had been laid out on a silver platter for her. While Yu Kong was now acting high and mighty, Master Gu confirmed that even if he allowed Yu Kong to continue growing and her cultivation ended up being above his, she wouldn't be able to kill him as she was someone who had discarded her sword before even using it, so she wouldn't be able to take her revenge. As he turned away from Yu Kong with a sly smile on his face, he realized that the things that he had done up until then had influenced her positively. And Yu Kong, being the same person that she was, was someone who was loyal to a fault to those that she loved. While Master Gu continued to walk away, he waved goodbye to her and reminded her to choose a place that is well hidden when she absorbs the dragon's corpse. Yu Kong stared blankly at Master Gu's back as he walked away. She was now having doubts about his demonic heart, as in her previous life, Master Gu would never have given something as good as that to her freely. Still walking away, Master Gu thought about how sure he was that those ancient immortal tribes that were left on the continent would attempt to steal Long Tang's corpse from Yu Mingkong now that it was in her hands. He suddenly emitted his purple aura, and his eyes turned black while his iris turned purple as he smiled evilly while he thought that he just had to help Yu Mingkong resolve all of the unnecessary problems. His aura traveled at a distance towards someone with wings who was standing on top of a huge rock. It was a blonde lady with white angel-looking wings who was startled when she sensed the aura. Master Gu sighed and praised himself for being a truly wonderful husband. Three cultivators were talking in the forest about the news of Master Gu defeating Long Teng, which had started to spread. Not only that, but the two women also talked about how well he took care of his fiancée, and how good-looking he was. The guy they were talking to got annoyed, crossed his arms, and told them not to be misled by Master Gu's handsome looks, as he might just be putting on an act and not be a good person. However, the two ladies just laughed at him and made fun of him for sounding jealous of Master Gu. The guy got mad, and the two ladies covered their heads with their hands as he raised his hand to bonk them in the head. As he raised his hand, a bright yellow light in the sky traveled through them. It was someone with wings flying hastily towards an inhabited area that looked like a town. It was the blonde lady with white, angel-like wings, and as she landed in front of a building, she expected to have shaken off her tail after going around in circles for so many days. But looking behind her and checking for someone, she still felt unsettled. While looking ahead, she thought about how she never would have thought that Master Gu would give Long Tang's corpse to his fiancée. She began to plan using the information to find a chance to get into the Dragon Clan's good book and decided that she had to contact her clan to ask for reinforcements. Meanwhile, in the sky, Master Gu and his two other companions came out of a warp in space, and Master Gu felt relieved that the blonde lady had finally stopped running around after so many days. He could not let the news of Long Tang's corpse's whereabouts get leaked. Of course, he could not do it without reaping some rewards, so he was thinking of a way to let Yu Kong know about what he was doing, and he had a sly smile on his face as he imagined the embarrassed Yu Kong thanking her husband. He commanded his two subordinates to lock down the entire city and kill anyone who left. On the other hand, the blonde lady entered the building, and her nieces Zuer and Yuer greeted her, along with the rest of their clan. They asked her what she saw in the battle, if Long Tang really died. 
and what underhanded tricks Master Gu used to win. The blonde lady looked worried and asked why they were asking those questions and why so many people had gathered there. The group proudly answered that they were discussing how to take revenge for their Lord Long Tang. They doubted that Master Gu, a human from the outside world, could have a higher strength than Long Tang, so he must have used some despicable tactics to kill him. They even heard that Master Gu only managed to kill Long Tang because he attacked from behind, so if it were a head-on battle, Master Gu would have been the one who died. The blonde lady calmed herself down and told the others to stop speaking nonsense, as Master Gu's strength was unrivaled, and he was not the kind of person they could kill just by discussing ideas on how to take him down. The group raised their fists in protest and said that there were so many of them, and they were all top geniuses of their generation, so they were not afraid of Master Gu. They were determined to kill him and avenge their Lord Long Teng. The group raised their arms and chanted to kill Master Gu, and the blonde lady was overwhelmed by the scene. She looked disheartened and full of content as she told them that they were all correct about how Master Gu used all kinds of underhanded tactics that Long Tang did not even have time to retaliate against and died such an unjustified death. Someone suddenly clapped and told her that her speech was wonderful. The person was behind her, and he asked if she would let him listen to the interesting story she was just weaving. Her eyes widened with horror as she recognized who the person was behind her without looking back. Not knowing who the person was, the group was enraged, and a red-headed lady spoke on behalf of the group and expressed the group's resentment towards him for entering their clan's territory without permission, and asked who let him in. Master Gu smiled slyly as he placed his index finger over his lips and shushed the group, saying that surely it wouldn't be much trouble for him to make an unprecedented visit when many of his old friends had gathered there. The blonde lady was stuttering as she took a step forward, asking if he was joking with them, but Master Gu calmly asked them why they were not inviting him to sit up there and have a drink. Zuer asked her aunt who the guy was, but the blonde lady told her not to ask any more questions. Master Gu took a step into a warp in space as he appreciated the smell of wine he could already detect from a distance. The entire group was surprised when Master Gu disappeared in front of them and was already at the table, pouring himself a glass of wine and admiring its quality and how it was made from a multitude of different divine fruits. The group was once again enraged and told him that the wine was unique to the ancient immortal continent and outsiders like him did not deserve to drink it. They warned him about suffering from their wrath, called him an arrogant human, and concluded that all humans are despicable, just like Master Gu. Master Gu sat comfortably, crossed his legs with a cup of wine in his hand, and agreed with what the group said about how despicable he was. He told them that he knows the guy and how he loves to kill the innocent, while sipping wine from his cup. He glared ahead of him, and it seemed like he was directing his words to someone when he asked if he was right about how Master Gu loves to kill the innocent. The blonde lady immediately went down on her knees and told Master Gu that what he said was not true. She told him that the difference between him and Long Tang was almost like that of a firefly, and the moon, and those were just rumors spread with the intention to destroy his reputation. Her nieces asked her exasperatedly what nonsense she was talking about and why she was smearing Long Tang's name. They would never believe that he had fallen to a human as he was the leader of the young people of their ancient immortal clans. Master Gu interrupted the conversation and introduced himself, saying that he could never be equivalent to Long Tang. And the group could not believe what he just said, that he was Master Gu. Master Gu smiled and extended his hands towards them, saying that he heard that they were looking for him, so he wanted to know the reason why. The group could not believe that Master Gu would voluntarily walk himself into their territory when they were just worrying about how to find him earlier. They immediately went berserk, and they all prepared to launch an attack towards Master Gu, while the blonde lady, still kneeling on the ground, tried to stop and warn them about being rash. While the group was still in midair, the blonde lady pleaded with Master Gu to direct his animosity towards her and spare their clan juniors. Master Gu coldly gazed at her and told her that if he spared them, then who would be the one to spare him when they were all trying to kill him? His eyes turned red as he evilly smiled, and while a multicolored aura burst out of him, he declared that he would just kill them all. The multicolored aura started to burst out of the windows of the building. While it burst out of every corner of the building, the voices of the clan could be heard outside. Some of them were screaming in pain, while others could not believe what they had just witnessed. The bodies of the clan juniors were flung in all directions, some of them had their bodies slammed into the windows, while others were simply thrown off the ground. The entire building could not withstand the immense aura that was being emitted, and it exploded from the inside. The clan building, which was standing tall earlier, had now been reduced to shreds of wood and dust. Master Gu grabbed the blonde lady by her throat as she pleaded with him not to kill her. But Master Gu smiled and told her that she saw something she shouldn't have seen, so she shouldn't blame him for killing her. 
The blonde lady tried to negotiate for her life, saying that she was willing to swear upon her Tao heart that she would never speak a word about it to anyone if he just spared her. Master Gu gave her an evil smirk and told her that he would believe a dead person more than a Tao heart promise. He effortlessly snapped her neck into two and threw her to the ground, where the clan juniors lay. Two natives who had just arrived at the scene smelled a heavy stench of blood and wondered what had happened. While Master Gu calmly walked into the warp and space that he had created, one of the natives noticed him and quickly suggested that they capture him. The two natives rushed towards Master Gu and commanded him to stop. Master Gu acted like it was a mistake that the natives saw him, but his smiling expression said otherwise. The native lady was enraged by his intolerable actions, daring to kill their people within their territory. An explosion occurred on a mountain, followed by a ray of gold and a purple aura. It was Yu Kong who landed on a platform, where she was greeted by her kneeling guards who welcomed her. Yu Kong looked back and thought about how her secluded cultivation had been completed far too smoothly. She suspected that Master Gu had helped her resolve the people who would have chased her. Compared with her past life, her experience with Master Gu towards her was not as awful. She wondered if he had mistreated her due to the effects of the demonic energy. She squinted her eyes as she thought about what Master Gu could have used to suppress his demonic nature in this life. The possibility that his current attitude towards her was purely meant to deceive her was terrifying. As her guards started to gather around her, she considered Master Gu's intelligence and genius. In order for her to avoid the same tragedy from happening once again, she strengthened her resolve to become stronger. She was the only one who knew exactly where the Divine Spirit would be born. She must claim it before others. Based on the astrological signs, the day that the Divine Spirit appeared was not too far away. She notified her guards that they would go to the east, to the Hundred Abreast Mountains. Meanwhile, at the Black Eagle Clan's territory, a huge amount of golden aura was gathering towards a building under a huge statue. The aura was flowing towards Hai Ming, who was meditating on the ground with an open book in front of him. He opened his eyes abruptly as he felt something. He extended his arms in front of him as he stood up and exclaimed that he had already broken through the sacred realm in barely a month. He was excited as everyone in their clan, including the two ancestors that had just been awakened, showed a distinct interest in the arts. With how things were progressing, he would be able to break through to the sacred sovereign realm and surpass his sister in becoming the Black Eagle Clan's genius. He was extremely thankful to the omnipotent supreme monarch for that. As Hyming recalled the blurry image of the omnipotent supreme monarch, he rubbed his nose and thought that if it wasn't for the monarch, he would probably just be regular trash, living day by day, waiting for his eventual death. Suddenly, someone called Hyming and asked if he was inside. It was his sister, and she was about to come into the room to tell him that the two ancestors that had just come out of seclusion wanted to see him because he was the one who had handed in the omnipotent supreme monarch's divine technique. Hai Ming nervously opened the door for his sister and confirmed with her that he had heard her right, that both of the ancestors wished to see him. He was worried that they had found out that he had hidden something from them with regards to the technique. Hai Ming's eyes widened in surprise. His surroundings changed in an instant, and the person standing in front of him was no longer his sister, but someone who was emitting a purple aura. In front of him was a gigantic meditating armor oozing with purple aura, and Hai Ming immediately asked if it was his senior and confirmed if he would be able to help him. But Hai Ming's consciousness went back to reality, and he was surprised when his sister leaned against his face and repeatedly called his name, asking him what was wrong. He told her that nothing was wrong and that he just got excited thinking about how he would be meeting the ancestors. His sister grabbed him by the arm and reprimanded him for being unsettled. She told him to be calm when he saw the ancestors, as they were nice people. Hai Ming smiled while scratching the back of his head, telling his sister that he was being too nervous. On the other hand, Master Gu was calmly standing in the skies, looking over his inner world. He wondered about the ancestors of the Black Eagle Clan, looking for Hai Ming, and suspected that they had found out about the problems of the Paving Way Immortal Art. Master Gu confidently smiled and said that it was not quite possible for them. Their cultivation had to be that of the Supreme Realm if they wished to understand the Paving Way Immortal Art on a much deeper level. So when both ancestors came under his control, the entire Black Eagle Clan would become his. As he stared at his system screen that showed the great points he had accumulated, he was pleased that it was way easier than he originally thought. With just a blink of an eye, he had already accumulated so much. He smiled sinisterly as he instructed the system to exchange four pieces of Taoist bones for him and transcend it. Meanwhile, in the forest, one of Kai Ling's companions was wary of those Black Eagle and ancient snake clans that seemed to be searching for something. He was worried that they were related to Yining. Kai Ling and the others had been in the ruins for more than a month, and there had been no news of them. 
His other companion, Kong, was enraged and said that Yin Ning clearly knew that something was in there but still brought both Kai Ling and Yin Mei into those ruins. He must have brought them both in there to have some fun with them. Kong Yang continued to rant that Yin Ning's actions had always been strange and unconventional, so he bet that he had something to do with the inheritor of demonic arts. However, his companion tried to shush him, telling him not to speak nonsense, saying that Yin Ning had been with them since they entered the continent. But that did not stop Kong Yang, he raised his voice instead confidently saying that he had evidence. As he thought about it, Yi Ling and Yi Ning sounded so similar, so he must be Yi Ling who had disguised himself. Both of them exclaimed in unison as they realized something. Kai Ling and Yin Mei were in danger. They quickly spread the word about what they had just realized and said that the inheritor of demonic arts deserved to die, so they wouldn't just sit back and let him be. On the other hand, Kai Ling was sitting on a giant rock while Yin Mei was sitting on the ground, and they both looked exhausted. Meanwhile, Yi Ling was a few meters away from them with his back turned towards them. Yi Ling held his talisman and told old Gui that he could clearly sense where the Sovereign Emperor's abode was, and it was right in front of them in that old town. However, recent happenings had been highly suspicious, as no matter how hard they tried to hide, they were always detected by the spirits. With both Kai Ling and Yin Mei still resting and unaware of what they were talking about, old Gui asked Yi Ling if he thought that either of the two ladies had done something deliberate for them to be found out. While taking a glance at the ladies, Yi Ling told him that it was something he had been contemplating and he was wondering what his thoughts were about it. Old Gui told him that Yin may have literally no reason to betray them as she would not even be there if it wasn't for Yi Ling playing the hero earlier. Not to mention that all of her nine tails Ling Qi dissipated by being chased by thousands of the ancient immortal clans. Yi Ling still kept sneaking a glance at them as he asked Old Gui about his opinion on Kai Ling. Old Gui told him that Kai Ling had a lot of suspicious points as she was the one who actively exonerated him from the title of being the inheritor of demonic arts, although he had nothing to say if she did it because of her friendship with him. While Kai Ling continued to rest in a fetal position, hugging her knees close to her chest, Old Gui told Yi Ling that since someone had been leaking out the location to everyone, she must have known that he was hiding some sort of secret which was why she was actively following him. Yi Ling was deep in thought as old Gui reminded him that this concerned their next move, so he must make the right choice. Yi Ling sighed with a heavy heart. He walked towards where the ladies were and told them that the road onwards would be dangerous and their goal was too big, so he suggested that they move separately. Since Yin Mei's wounds were more serious, she would follow him, and they would meet up once again after getting to the old town in front of them. Kai Ling was enraged with what Yi Ling suggested, as it was more dangerous for them to move separately. If he took Yin Mei with him, then she would be on her own. Yi Ling nervously tried to reason with Kai Ling and told her that it was not what he meant. While Yin Mei just closed her eyes and continued to sit on the ground, Kai Ling stood up and told Yi Ling that she felt that the relationship between him and Yin Mei was strange. Now that the place where he could get fortune was right in front of him, he was throwing her aside. Kai Ling yelled and cursed at him, confronting him for thinking that the reason she had helped him out was because of some secret fortune he held, which left Yi Ling speechless. Yi Ling tried to calm her down and appease her by telling her that he was just saying those things for the good of everyone. His face immediately turned grim when he sensed an overwhelming aura looming over them. The three of them looked apprehensive as five silhouettes floated in the air, declaring that they had been found. They were minotaur-looking natives, and their leader instructed his companions to kill them all and not leave a single one of them alive. The heavily injured Yin Mei calmly looked up and said nothing. She closed her eyes, smiling peacefully, like she had accepted her fate, as she thought that the mission Master Gu had given her was finally completed. As Yi Ling looked up and saw that the enemies had reached the heavenly god realm, he was filled with horror. He immediately ran to the forest and instructed the two women to follow him. Yi Ling did not look back as he urged them to hurry and escape on their own, agreeing to meet at their rendezvous point without any discussion. On the other hand, Kai Ling turned to ask Yin Mei why she was standing there and urged her to run. Yin Mei seemed at peace as she told Kai Ling to go on without her, as her injuries were too severe to run with. As Yi Ling ran towards the forest, Kai Ling told Yin Mei that she was now on her own. When their leader noticed that Yi Ling and Kai Ling were running away, he instructed his companions to split up and chase them, and they eagerly complied. One of them even claimed dibs on Kai Ling. Meanwhile, the leader and his second-in-command went down to where Yin Mei was. The second-in-command laughed as he noticed that Yin Mei had resigned herself to her fate after sustaining serious injuries, as she was not trying to run away. The leader immediately offered Yin Mei to be his slave, considering how beautiful she was. With his arms crossed and a confident look on his face, the leader told Yin Mei that he would spare her life and allow her to serve by his side if she was willing to submit to him. Thinking of Master Gu, Yin Mei told them to stop dreaming, as they were not worthy enough for her to submit to. 
the leader was insulted and enraged by what Yin Mei had said, and immediately instructed his companion to cut her into pieces. The second in command, who was standing behind Yin Mei, swung his giant axe at her. Yin Mei's face began to crack, and light shone through the cracks as she declared that she would only serve one master for the rest of her life, and that she would rather die than let any of them touch her. A huge explosion of purple aura appeared in front of the leader, throwing his second in command into the air. As the leader laid eyes on the eight Baron Halbert, he looked wary and wondered who the person in front of him was. Standing behind Yin Mei was Master Gu, his eyes turned black and his irises purple. As he touched Yin Mei's temple, he asked the leader who they wanted to cut up into pieces. Yin Mei's eyes filled with tears as she saw her master, and she hugged him tightly while sobbing. Master Gu smiled kindly at her and patted her head, saying that he could not bear to let her die just for a mission, and she should not be foolish. Yin Mei hugged him even tighter as he asked her why she was acting like a little girl, as it was unlike her. Meanwhile, the leader was filled with rage that a mere quasi-god realm dared to ignore him. His eyes gleamed red, his body bulged, and his veins popped out as he charged himself with aura. Master Gu lifted Yin Mei off the ground and carried her in his arms, ignoring the leader's ranting. He turned his back towards the leader and praised Yin Mei for her hard work, telling her that he would take her to a place to heal her injuries. Yin Mei lay comfortably in his arms, saying that completing her mission was more important than her injuries. This enraged the leader even more, and he lunged towards Master Gu, telling him that he was asking for death. A purple aura split the space and created a door, from which countless aggressive souls emerged. The leader was filled with horror and confusion at the same time, and he began to sweat profusely. The leader's scream could be heard as a whirlwind of purple aura appeared in the forest. After a few hours, Master Gu stood in front of a cave entrance atop a mountain. His coat was nowhere to be seen, and he held a fruit in his hand while predicting how events would unfold. How Kai Ling would inform her subordinates about earlier events and reveal Yu Ling's location after escaping on her own and how cultivators from the outside world would band together to hunt down the inheritor of the demonic arts. Master Gu smiled confidently as everything was coinciding, the news of the ancient tombs and the fact that the ancient immortal clans were currently hunting Yi Ling, which Yi Ling would not be able to talk himself out of. Someone called Master Gu from behind, which surprised him as he thought they had woken up quickly. It was Yin Mei. She had a bandage on her chest and was only wearing Master Gu's coat. She thanked him for taking care of her and assured him that she was fine now. Master Gu was glad that she was doing well and offered her the fruit that he was holding. While Yin Mei reached out to grab a fruit, she started to give him a report about her mission. With a soft expression, he interrupted Yin Mei and told her that he was already aware of the situation, but that Yi Ling shouldn't die yet. Yin Mei looked down and confirmed that she knew the current Yi Ling was of great use to him. Yin Mei immediately perked up and reassured Master Gu that she would continue to help him with all her heart as long as he needed her. Master Gu stroked her hair, saying that there would be some grievances that she had to bear next, so he hoped that she wouldn't think of him as too strict because of it. Yin Mei dropped the fruit on the ground as she hugged Master Gu again and told him that she would never feel wrong for serving him. Master Gu patted her on the head and said that he was comforted by her words. On the other hand, Kai Ling's subordinates were explaining to the other cultivators what had happened, and the cultivators were speechless. Suddenly, Kai Ling came running in their direction. Her subordinates immediately went towards her to check if she was alright, and Kai Ling told them that she had just managed to escape. Yin Mei's subordinates also went towards Kai Ling, and they were looking for her. Kai Ling looked guilty as she looked down on the ground and told them that she thought that she may be with Yi Ling but she was not sure. Yin Mei's subordinates were surprised when they heard that she was with Yi Ling, and they figured that Yi Ling and Yi Ning were the same person. A mysterious man shrouded in a dark aura asked Kai Ling if she was telling the truth while Yi Langshan stood behind him, his hands on his chin. He said that he never thought that Yi Ling would have the audacity to appear and take Yin Mei hostage. The other cultivators also brought up what Kong Yang said that they were being chased by the five great ancient immortal clans, and they have managed to connect it with the recent news of the ancient immortal clans' tombs being raided and the disappearance of talented young cultivators. Kai Ling was deep in thought when she heard them talking about the ancient tombs. The cultivators started to simultaneously voice their concerns about how Yi Ling's actions had put their safety on the continent at risk, so they must capture him before the five great clans because they would be in trouble if he made the old fojis angry. Yi Langshan asked Kai Ling if she knew why Yi Ling came to the continent because knowing where he would be would be a great opportunity for them. Kai Ling, who was holding onto her subordinate's arm for support, told him that Yi Ling told them to meet him in an old town before he ran off, but she had no idea what he was doing. As the two male cultivators discussed how cunning Yi Ling was for hiding his essence to hide from them, a female cultivator started to daydream that if Master Gu was around, he would definitely know what to do. Upon hearing what the lady said, Yi Liu Lai, who was passing by, proudly nodded in approval of what the lady had just said. Right on cue, Master Gu arrived on the scene and greeted everyone. 
Everyone's attention was on Master Gu, who had just arrived, and they all rejoiced upon his arrival. Master Gu kindly smiled as he told them that he had heard that there was news about the inheritor of demonic arts, so he came to see if there was anything he could help with. Everyone's attention was on Yilangshan as he asked Master Gu what he planned to do regarding hunting down Yiling. Master Gu thought for a moment and then told the group that as the heir of the Immortal Palace, he would definitely join the hunt. The mysterious man, Wang, immediately spoke up and suggested that since Master Gu was joining them, they should let him lead the hunt for Yiling. Master Gu stopped Wang with a stern expression and told him that everyone present was immensely capable, and he was sure that there were better candidates for that position than himself. However, the other cultivators agreed with Wang and praised him. Yi Langshan, who was standing in front of them, told Master Gu not to reject them like that. Master Gu looked dumbfounded as he gazed at the cultivators who wished for him to hunt down the inheritor of demonic arts. Then, he smiled slyly and looked forward to making it happen. Master Gu opened his arms and told them that he was a little surprised and pleased that everyone trusted him so much. However, since the case was urgent, he would do his best to help capture Yi Ling and bring peace back to their lands. Yi Langshan cupped his fist and said that Master Gu's willingness to take on all of Yi Ling's animosity made him feel ashamed of himself. The others praised Master Gu for his principled and righteous behavior, which was something their society should emulate. In Kai Ling's eyes, Master Gu shone brightly among the other cultivators. She thought about how his behavior and conduct were truly like she had known before, and even though Yin Mei and Yi Ling had slandered him before, they were still unable to tarnish his reputation. Kai Ling saw a bright, flowery image of Master Gu and thought that he was a reliable person. Meanwhile, with his arms crossed, Yi Langshan talked to Master Gu and brought up the topic of Yi Ling being hunted by the ancient immortal clans. He had a speculation that he wished to confirm, and Master Gu told him to share it. Yi Langshan said that they all felt that Yi Ling definitely had a motive or goal that he did not want them to find out. While Yi Langshan continued to speculate that Yi Ling was probably using the tombs of the ancient immortal clans and those young deceased prodigies to devour and swallow their cultivation, Master Gu was internally pleased. Yi Langshan had led the other cultivators to think in the direction that Master Gu wanted, and he thought that he truly deserved the honor of him respectfully calling him Brother Yi. Kai Ling was confused when she heard about Yi Langshan's speculation. When he told everyone that Yi Ling had been with her the entire time, the other cultivators looked surprised. Peng Fei clicked his tongue and asked Kai Ling if she was still trying to protect Yi Ling after what he had done to her, leaving her speechless. The scene earlier flashed into Kai Ling's mind, and she looked heartbroken, realizing that devouring others' cultivation could have been what he had wanted to do next. Master Gu clicked his tongue and rubbed his temple, telling the other cultivators that, according to the nature of demonic energy, Yi Ling's cultivation was likely far above all of theirs now. Master Gu suggested that they start the search for Yi Ling in every single one of the old towns. If they were to encounter those ancient immortal clans, they should be friendly, as the situation still had to be accounted for and explained. Everyone agreed. As everyone walked away to start the search, Kai Ling was left behind with Master Gu, and he told her that it would no longer be easy for Yi Ling to be exonerated from the title of the Inheritor of Demonic Arts. Even if they both believed in him, it would be of no use. Kai Ling looked downcast as she told Master Gu that she knew, but Yi Ling had been acting quite suspiciously, so she might be wrong about him. Kai Ling then cheered up a bit and changed the topic, asking Master Gu about his busy schedule suppressing a whole group of ancient immortals and going around snatching the fortunes of other cultivators. Master Gu, with his eyes closed, proudly stated that the cultivators wouldn't have been able to hold their own against those ancient immortal clans to keep their fortunes safe with how weak they were, and many of them died in the end. He confidently looked at Kai Ling and told her that he was doing all of that so he could draw all of the ancient immortal clan's hatred solely towards himself. He teased Kai Ling for thinking that their family would have lacked all those things. Kai Ling awkwardly scratched the back of her head as she told him that it was her fault for thinking so lowly of his honorable intentions. On the Dragon Clan's territory, someone was in a fit of rage about how preposterous it was to have their clan's genius, Long Tang, killed, and their innocent youngsters slaughtered. It seemed that four elders were talking, and one of them said that they could not kill them as they had already made a contract with the outside world. But the red-haired elder suggested that they use the true dragon plaque to gather all the genius disciples from every clan to hunt down Master Gu together. He wanted to make it clear that the continent was not a place where Master Gu could simply do whatever he wanted. Meanwhile, at the Hundred Mountain Valley, Yu Mingkong was making some preparations. Her guards were piling up rocks. She was staring into space as she thought about how everyone was still being kept in the dark by Master Gu. She had a wry smile as she thought about how Master Gu had managed to cause everyone to play right into the palm of his hands. She was standing in front of a great arc and thought that it would be difficult for her to open the heaven's door that she had finally found on her own. 
she was contemplating whether she should tell Master Gu about it. On the other hand, Yin Mei had regrouped with Yiling, and while old Gui was performing something behind him, Yiling cursed and punched a pillar in a fit of rage. He had discovered that Master Gu was not only framing him but was also leading everyone else to hunt him down. Yiling was glaring as he figured that Kai Ling must have exposed his location. He regretted trusting her so much before when she was actually working together with Master Gu. Yin Mei tried to appease him and told him that there could be a misunderstanding between them, which made Yiling lash out at her for defending Kai Ling. He reminded her that if she hadn't been lucky, she would have been turned into a corpse when they separated. Yin Mei looked downhearted as she told Yiling that the natives were the ones who started to chase after Kai Ling and him when they saw that she had not much ability to move or do anything. She then smiled brightly and thanked both of them for drawing the enemies away from her. This made Yiling blush and cough with shame, saying that men are always reliable during vital moments of need. The seal on a well was shattered, and old Gui immediately informed them about its removal. Yiling looked ecstatic and praised old Gui for being quick, but he humbly said that it was only the entrance tablet that had been sealed. As the red aura rose up from the well, old Gui warned Yiling that there were still many arrays left behind by the heavenly emperor. Even a cultivator at the sacred realm would not be able to escape death if they entered by mistake. They needed to be careful and find the correct path according to all the clues. Yin Mei was taken aback as Yiling turned to look at her and told her to stay close to him later on. He said he could protect her from the dangers. She cheerfully smiled and agreed with what Yiling said. Yiling led the way towards the well, and as soon as his back was towards Yin Mei, her expression changed into a scheming one. She thought that she would definitely stick close to him. As they descended into the well, a purple feather fell to the ground just outside of it. Master Gu opened his eyes and immediately called one of his subordinates, instructing her to spread the word that the inheritor of demonic arts had appeared and was currently in a ruin 40,000 miles to the east. He smiled evilly as he told her to gather everyone quickly and start the hunt for the inheritor of demonic arts. Kai Ling's subordinate, Kong Yong, ran across the roofs, rushing towards Kai Ling, who was with her other subordinate. He immediately informed her that they had received news from Master Gu. As he landed on the ground, he told Kai Ling that they had already located Yi Ling's whereabouts. Kai Ling immediately instructed them to prepare themselves and wait for Master Gu's signal to move out. Kong Yang looked worried as he told Kai Ling that he hoped she wouldn't be soft-hearted when they met Yi Ling later. Kai Ling strengthened her resolve and told Kong Yang that she would sever all her attachments to Yi Ling. Multiple streaks of colorful auras ran across the sky under the full moon. Hai Ming's sister and her subordinates gathered and looked up at the sky, wondering if something had happened recently. They suspected that the heavenly treasure had appeared since outsiders seemed to be gathering in one place. Hai Ming's sister scowled and said that they didn't need to care about the outsiders. The ancient immortal dragon clan had just used the true dragon plaque, so all the youths from every clan had to join in the mission to kill Master Gu, and that was their main priority. While Hai Ming smiled connivingly behind his sister's back, she told her subordinates that there was no leader for the young geniuses of the ancient immortal clan since Long Tang was dead and gone, so it was her chance. Meanwhile, Hai Ming, who was ecstatic that their clan's ancestors had all cultivated part of the paving way immortal art, was plotting to rise quickly and take over everything once his sister left. On the other hand, Yi Ling and Yin Mei were traversing underground and she noticed that they seemed to be in another dimension. While confidently removing his disguise, Yi Ling told Yin Mei that she was right, and that it was what his master, the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation, had left for him. Yin Mei acted surprised and confirmed with him if it was the same Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation who had nearly ascended. Dropping all his disguise equipment on the ground, Yi Ling proudly confirmed that she was right. And as he stood there confidently, wearing his original clothing, he proudly announced that he was the heir of the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation. Yi Ling clenched his fist and gritted his teeth, despising Master Gu for spreading rumors outside about him being the inheritor of demonic arts. Yin Mei just looked at him and said nothing as he continued to proclaim that he would rip Master Gu's fake mask off one day and let everyone know who was the true villain. As Yi Ling continued to lead the way and walk deeper into the dimension, he warned Yin Mei to be careful as she was pretty close to a man who was both dangerous and evil. Then he said that once he got his hands on the fortune, he wouldn't have to fear him any longer. With a cold expression on her face, Yin Mei told Yi Ling that he didn't have to tell her that, as she had always believed in him. Suddenly they stopped when they saw that the floor ahead of them was cracked, and red light was shining through its cracks. Old Gui warned them to keep an eye out, as ahead of them was the last test that the Heavenly Emperor had set up for Yi Ling. In front of them was a domain filled with lava and a narrow path where a giant serpent was waiting for them on the other end. 
Old Gooey gave them another warning that there was a respirate in the lava, so they must be careful. Meanwhile, someone picked up the purple feather that was lying on the ground earlier. It was Master Goo, and as he looked over the well in front of him while still holding the feather in his hand, he couldn't believe that there was an entire other dimension hidden down there. It seemed that Yuling had already brought Yin Mei down with him. He smiled slyly, knowing that the instructions he gave the other disciples from the outside world would take a while to reach them after finding out about the ancient tomb. He crushed the feather in his hands and thought that the time the other disciples would spend making their way to where he was was more than enough to kill Yiling and reap the fruits of his labor. As he calmly looked down into the well, he thought about how they would put on a wonderful show explaining everything to others, with Yin Mei as his witness. On the other hand, Yiling knelt down on the ground, panting, with Yin Mei behind him also catching her breath. Yiling winced in pain as he cursed and complained about how the heavenly emperor of reincarnation was trying to kill him. He would have died if he were just a little weaker than he was. Old Gooey reprimanded him for complaining and told him that if he didn't have the strength, then he wouldn't be worthy of the legacy of the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation. With Yuling still limping behind her, Yin Mei's eyes suddenly widened in disbelief as she pointed out something in front of them. As Yiling turned to look at where Yin Mei was pointing, his eyes widened with wonder. A huge palace with two dragon head structures at each side of the entrance, both spitting out water towards a crystal clear pool. Old Gui informed them that they were looking at the reincarnation pool that the Heavenly Emperor left behind. It was used to reconstruct one's physique into a reincarnated body, and within the pool was the reincarnation flower, a treasure that only grew within the reincarnation pool and was able to produce the essence of reincarnation, which could be used as a weapon, a rebirth, or anything the holder wished to do with its essence. Yu Ling laughed maniacally and said that he did not suffer for nothing. With the heavens looking after him, Master Gu would no longer be able to fight against him. Yu Ling was grinning from ear to ear as he instructed Yin Mei to wait for him there and told her that he would be back quickly. But Yin Mei, who was uncharacteristically cold towards him, asked him why he couldn't let her go in and have a look when they had already reached that point. Old Gui immediately warned Yu Ling that there was something wrong with Yin Mei. Yu Ling's eyes widened, and he could not believe what he had just heard. He even asked her what she meant by it. Yin Mei looked ahead coldly and asked Yu Ling if he was not willing to share even a fraction of the fortune with her. Then, she glanced at him with a sly smile on her face and asked if he truly loved her. Yu Ling was dumbfounded and asked Yin Mei what was wrong with her, while old Gui had already started to suspect that she had been the cause of everything. Yu Ling still could not believe what he was witnessing, and he looked horrified as he remembered Kai Ling. With her back turned towards Yu Ling, Yin Mei laughed as she confirmed that his thoughts were right, that he had wronged Kai Ling. She turned back to look at him as she snickered and said that she was thankful that he was so protective over her, as she wouldn't have known how to get rid of Kai Ling otherwise. Anger filled Yu Ling's face as he confronted Yin Mei and asked her why she had tricked him for just that little bit of fortune. But Yu Ling's eyes were immediately filled with horror as he started to realize that the ploy Yin Mei had set up for him started with the misunderstanding between him and Bai Lai when she asked him to save her. Yin Mei glanced and smiled at the horrified look on Yiling's face as she confessed that she was only able to have the chance to make a move on him because he was paranoid, greedy, and lustful. Yiling was filled with contempt as he cursed Yin Mei, and then he questioned her motives for telling him those things when she wouldn't be able to defeat him. While Yiling was already preparing to attack, Yin Mei did not even turn to look at him as she told him that he was full of himself. Yu Ling lunged forward to attack Yin Mei without a second thought and told her that since she wished to die, he would help her fulfill that wish and accompany Bai Lai in the underworld. As the space started to slightly warp in front of Yin Mei, she confidently smiled and told Yi Ling that he forgot to tell him that the one he would be fighting was not her. Yi Ling was surprised when a palm suddenly appeared in front of him, and old Gui immediately instructed him to dodge. But it was too late, and the gigantic golden palm, produced by Master Gu, who was standing before Yin Mei, hit Yi Ling head on. Yi Ling's face contorted in pain as he wondered who attacked him. The rock behind Yu Ling shattered into pieces as the gigantic palm crushed him against it. Master Gu smiled with his palms extended outward, and Yin Mei smiled behind him with a relieved expression. Master Gu then smiled sinisterly as she praised Yin Mei for doing a job well done. Yu Ling was able to stand up and recover from that attack. He immediately recognized Master Gu, who was standing in front of him, while Yin Mei blushed behind him. Master Gu acknowledged Yi Ling as the true heir to the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation, as he was able to take a direct hit from his fist and not die. The smoke and dust from the impact started to dissipate, revealing a heavily injured Yi Ling, who was still dumbfounded to see Master Gu and Yin Mei together. His eyes were almost lifeless as he glared at Yin Mei, remembering her bright smile. He gritted his teeth as he remembered the ancient white tiger clan who were looking for him and guessed that Master Gu had probably plotted to trick everyone from the very beginning. He clenched his hands into a fist as he figured that Master Gu must have killed Bai Lai and blamed his death on him, and then instructed Yin Mei to get close to him to cause a division between Kai Ling and him. 
While old Gui told him that he would probably end up dying here, as Master Gu was able to heavily injure him with a single strike, Yi Ling realized how terrifying Master Gu was for being able to trick everyone into falling for all his ploys. He asked old Gui for advice on what he should do. Old Gui told him to try his best to delay time and pray that Master Gu doesn't know what kind of tricks he has up his sleeve or wait for the Heavenly Emperor to help him out. So Yi Ling, with a face full of resolve, asked Master Gu what his goal was, as he wanted to see if they could work together to fulfill it. Then he reminded Master Gu that if he died, he would no longer have a scapegoat as the inheritor of demonic arts. Master Gu smiled as he knew what Yi Ling was doing. He was trying to use conversation to delay time and was hoping that something would happen so that he would die. As the system notified Master Gu to kill the fortunes chosen and showed him the rewards. He told Yi Ling that his goal was nothing for him to worry about. And even if he was dead, he had ways to ensure that he would still be a wonderful scapegoat for him. Recognizing that they had nothing to talk about, Yi Ling shrouded his right hand in a reddish black aura, and his left in a golden, fiery aura. With a dragon aura to his right and that of a phoenix on his left, Yi Ling was preparing to fight, and he told Master Gu that he would fight him to death, as he had gone too far, which baffled Master Gu. While releasing his aura, Master Gu smiled and told Yi Ling that if he was strong, then he was strong, and if he was weak, then he would just end up dead, so it was his own strength that had failed his ambition and greed. Multiple swords quickly rained down on Yi Ling, destroying his two auras behind him, and upon seeing this, Yi Ling was not able to do anything but freeze in place. While old Gui could not believe that Master Gu could use the power of law at his current cultivation stage. With his eyes still wide due to shock, Yi Ling was still frozen in place even with a physical attack coming straight towards him. Yi Ling took Master Gu's knees with his face while Master Gu asked him why he could not bully him if he was weak. Yi Ling was thrown away with such tremendous force that the giant rock with which he collided turned to pieces. Smoke and dust covered the area where Yi Ling was standing, and all you could hear was his coughing. Yi Ling's talisman shone so brightly as he told Master Gu that they had never even met before. He charged towards Master Gu at full speed as he told him that they had no animosity between them, so he could not understand why he was doing such a thing. Calmly releasing his purple aura from the palm of his hand, Master Gu asked him if he was still not able to understand the principle of others being envious of his talent after living in the cultivation world for so long. While materializing a weapon that he grabbed, Master Gu continued to remind Yi Ling that he was the one who arrogantly announced that he would capture his fiancée and turn her into his slave. Yi Ling's face contorted in anger as he continued to charge towards Master Gu, despite the blood that was dripping from his eyes, nose, and mouth. Old Gui quickly sensed that the aura Master Gu released was bad news and instructed Yi Ling to stop delaying and use his hidden move or else he would die right there. Master Gu slashed the eight barren halberd, and a tremendous amount of aura came out of it, destroying everything in its path and smashing the rocks to pieces. As the smoke and dust from the impact continued to disperse in front of him, hiding Yi Ling from his view, Master Gu told him that it was truly a waste for him to be the fortunes chosen with how immature he was. Yi Ling was now wearing a golden, translucent armor, and he touched the giant crack on its chest. He could not believe the damage it took, as the heavenly armor was supposed to be able to block the strike of a sacred realm expert. Old Gui commented on how terrifying the prohibited demonic arts cultivation technique was. While holding the eight baron halberd in his hand and standing before Yi Ling, Master Gu seemed disappointed to see what trick was up Yi Ling's sleeve. He told him that he wanted to see how many strikes it could take. Terror filled Yi Ling's eyes, and he started to hysterically call out for Old Gui to have the Heavenly Emperor come and save him as his heir. Old Gui was calling out to his master as Master Gu started to dash towards the terrified Yi Ling. Tears, snot, and saliva came out of Yi Ling's face all at once as he frantically called out to the Heavenly Emperor. Eyes filled with flames with a golden swirl on their forehead woke up and called Yi Ling useless. A huge amount of red and black aura suddenly rushed towards Master Gu who was able to block it using his eight baron halberd. Master Gu skidded backwards, back to where Yin Mei was standing with worry, covering her mouth as she recognized the heavenly emperor of reincarnation in front of them. Yi Ling was extremely relieved as he saw his master stand in front of him. The heavenly emperor of reincarnation proudly stood in front of them as he told old Gui that he had disappointed him. Yin Mei was now doubting if the one standing in front of them was really the heavenly emperor of reincarnation, while Master Gu was disappointed that what they were looking at was just a mere silhouette. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation got offended by what Master Gu said, and he was now angry that he was looked down upon. An overwhelming aura was directed towards where Master Gu was, making Yin Mei kneel on the ground, but Master Gu seemed to be unaffected by it. Yi Ling smiled with extreme delight as he saw his master's oppressive aura, and he told Master Gu that he would die right there for challenging his master. Meanwhile, Yin Mei winced in pain as she called out to her master. Master Gu glared at Yi Ling and told him that he was almost dead but he was still yapping like he had so much to say. 
Master Gu filled the eight baron halberd in his hand with his aura as he told Yi Ling that he would kill him in front of his master. Master Gu used the fortune plundering talisman, and Yi Ling was surprised when he saw Master Gu plunge his weapon into the ground, creating a strange mark of aura beneath his master's feet. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation called it petty tricks as he saw the purple chain start to bind him to confine him. But to his surprise, the chains actually sealed him away temporarily. A vortex of purple aura started to wrap around Yi Ling, who desperately called for his master. Terror filled his eyes as the aura started to engulf him, and he extended his arms while crying for help, trying to reach out for his master in the hopes that he could save him, as he didn't want to die. Yi Ling complained that things were not fair and he hadn't reached the top and made others bow down at his feet yet. As the aura completely consumed him, wrapping his whole being, Yi Ling screamed in pain. As Yi Ling disappeared into thin air, his pauldron and the talisman that was left of him fell to the ground. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation glanced at the place where Yi Ling disappeared. He was then enraged and broke the chains that were binding him as he told Master Gu that he was seeking death for killing his heir in front of him. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation quickly attacked Master Gu from behind. But Yin Mei warned him and tried to shield him with her body in a panic. Yin Mei looked terrified as the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's attack was about to reach her. But Master Gu managed to quickly turn and cast her aside as he thrust his eight Baron Halberd forward. Their attacks collided with each other and an enormous shockwave was created by their impact. The shockwave quickly turned into a massive ball of energy that dissolved everything around it. Both Master Gu and Yin Mei took a step back, away from the destructive force. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation smirked as he stared at his hand, boasting to Master Gu that he must finally understand that in front of absolute strength, his petty tricks and useless schemes wouldn't work. Yin Mei looked nervous when Master Gu pulled out a bottle with a sinister smile on his face as he mocked the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation for claiming that he was the face of absolute strength. A violet aura poured out of the bottle, and a storm of aura immediately shrouded them while Master Gu told the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation that he was unfortunate as he didn't just have petty tricks and useless schemes. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation was surprised when he recognized the deity devouring demonic art. Master Gu's eyes were black with a purple iris, and lightning was striking all around him as he pointed at the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation. He smiled evilly as he taunted the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation and told him that he would give him a little taste of the absolute strength that he was talking about. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation shrouded his right arm with his aura and laughed as he called Master Gu an ignorant and disrespectful brat. He charged towards Master Gu with a dragon aura in his arms and told him that he was merely the inheritor of demonic arts who had yet to fully grow, so he would kill him right there. The dragon roared as it lunged to attack Master Gu, but Master Gu just calmly looked at it and told the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation to stop struggling as he was just a mere silhouette. A huge fist suddenly hit the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's dragon aura, and it was easily shredded into pieces. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation was thrown back as he got hit by the giant fist, but he did not lose his composure and was able to remain standing by digging his feet into the ground and skidding backward. His right arm had been shattered, and he looked surprised to see that Master Gu was able to use a magical dharma. He acknowledged him for having some tricks up his sleeve but still confidently declared that he hadn't won just because he had managed to hurt him. Outside the aura storm were Yin Mei and Old Gui, whom the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation had called upon and summoned. Yin Mei noticed Old Gui and tried to grab it as it quickly flew towards the aura storm as soon as he heard his master summon him, but she failed to grab it. It went straight into the aura storm, and Yin Mei immediately warned Master Gu to watch out. Old Gui was flying toward the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation at full speed, and he told him that he was there to assist him. But to the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's surprise, a hand that was coming out of a warp in space grabbed Old Gui. It was Master Gu who was calmly smiling and asked the Emperor of Reincarnation if he was planning to utilize the Turtle Spirit weapon to turn the tides in his favor. As he held Old Gui, who immediately recognized the Void Energy and was pleading for his master to save him. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation was enraged and cursed at Master Gu, commanding him to return the talisman to him. Master Gu simply gave him the side eye and told him that he had no intention of doing so. Master Gu swung the eight baron halberd, which was full of undead aura. All the while, the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation used a bluebird-looking aura to collide with Master Gu's attack. A surge of tremendous energy appeared, and it was leaking through the aura storm barrier, which threw Yin Mei to the ground. The energy was so great that it created huge waves at the reincarnation pool. As she was lying on the ground, wincing in pain, Yin Mei realized how strong a fraction of the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation was, as she felt that the place would have collapsed if her master hadn't used demonic energy to block it. The purple chains had again materialized. This time, they were binding the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation and hanging him off the ground. 
as he told Master Gu that he never would have thought that his demonic arts would have progressed so far ahead already, to the point that he had no chance to use his strength for even a single second. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation was startled when he felt his aura being sucked out of his body, and he immediately asked Master Gu what he was doing. While summoning the bottle in the palm of his hand, Master Gu smiled evilly as he told the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation that he was merely doing what he wished to do with Old Gui earlier. The Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation smiled in defeat as he accepted his fate. Master Gu was going to devour him, and he said that he never thought that it would be his fate someday. And then he closed his eyes peacefully as he started to vanish into thin air. Master Gu recalled the purple aura in the bottle, including the one that shrouded the eight Baron Halberd, as he told the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation not to worry as he wouldn't be the only one he would devour. The system notified Master Gu that he had used the fortune plundering talisman, and had completed the mission to kill the fates chosen, so he would be rewarded. As Master Gu reached out to open the Heavenly Fate treasure chest the system had given him, he was pleased with the points he had gotten and was glad that Yiling did not disappoint him. Master Gu obtained the Divine Reincarnation Halo from the treasure chest, which was a divine light that contained the essence of reincarnation and had the strength to preside over time itself and alter time and its original path. There were black and red balls of light that swirled toward Master Gu, and as he absorbed them, a blinding white light shone. Master Gu's eyes lit up, and he smiled victoriously as he felt how amazing the Divine Reincarnation Halo was, as it was one of the many powers that had helped maintain the flow and structure of many worlds, and it was on par with the Void Energy itself. With those powers in his hands, it would make it much easier for him to fight against a lot of other sovereigns. Yin Mei quickly greeted Master Gu with a bright smile as she congratulated him, and he gave her praise for working hard in return. Master Gu gave Yin Mei the antidote for the demonic parasite and told her that she would no longer suffer from the side effects of it, and she told him that her heart belongs to him even without the demonic parasite. Yin Mei blushed, and she could not utter a word as she was caught off guard when Master Gu put the antidote in her mouth with his own hands and told her that he believed in her. Yin Mei was still in shock and stuttered as she thanked Master Gu, who was now walking towards the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's mansion, instructing her to follow him. Both of them entered the mansion so swiftly that only the color of their auras could be seen entering it. Inside the mansion, many treasures sparkled and lay around. Yin Mei's eyes twinkled in amazement as she looked around, and Master Gu told her that she should feel free to take whatever she liked. Master Gu went directly to the heart controls of the reincarnation abode. While Yin Mei was busy examining all the treasures around them, Master Gu examined the controls and found out that he would only be able to use the abode for himself after refining it. Master Gu applied his aura to the controls, and Yin Mei was startled when the treasures started to glow and slowly disappear. Master Gu started to gain information about the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's abode, including weapons, arrays, medicines, ancient pills, and the Enlightenment cushion. He also discovered that the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation had prepared five puppets, and he suspected that they were for Yi Ling's usage, but he would now be taking them in his stead. He also gained access to the inheritance records, which indicated that the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation had planted a slave mark on the ancient immortal clans. But he was a bit disappointed that it was already bound to Yiling, although he already had the Paving Way Immortal Technique, which did the same thing. Master Gu decided to keep the reincarnation abode in his inner world and told Yin Mei, who was busy grabbing a mirror from the treasures, to get ready to go. The space in front of the reincarnation abode started to warp and it was quickly sucked into a vortex and disappeared. As they were on their way out, Master Gu told Yin Mei that they could definitely use the title of the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's heir as they now had his inheritance. He told her that once Yiling's death was exposed to the world, he would need another person to be his scapegoat, and he would use the identity of the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's heir to fool others. Master Gu instructed Yin Mei that once they had returned to the outside world, she should tell everyone that Yiling was severely injured and fled. To which Yin Mei complied and told Master Gu that she would tell everyone that Yiling didn't die as he managed to use a trump card at a critical moment, and fled, while applying his purple aura to his face by covering it with the palm of his hand. Master Gu corrected her and said Yiling managed to use the demonic arts to heavily injure him at a critical moment, but he was also able to heavily injure Yiling as he fled. Yin Mei was amazed by what Master Gu said, as she confirmed that she understood her task and admired how he really thought of everything. As Master Gu removed his hands from his face, blood dripped out of his mouth, his lips were dried up, and his eyes were sunken as he told Yin Mei that they should now expose the truth to everyone. The other cultivators had gathered in front of an ancient tomb. As Wang and Yilangshan came out, Yilangshan was disappointed that they had arrived late to the party. He reported to everyone that all of the ancient immortals' bodies had already been absorbed. 
Meanwhile, the other cultivators were looking for Master Gu. Kai Ling placed her hand on her chin, lost in thought. She suspected that with a lot of people hunting for him, Yi Ling would have immediately gone on the run. Master Gu had asked all of them to work together to hunt for Yi Ling so that he could force Yi Ling to make an appearance. Wang commented that they had been used by Master Gu for that purpose. Still deep in thought, Kai Ling said that they were all doing it for the greater good. It was possible that Master Gu had gone ahead of them to capture Yi Ling and had probably encountered Yi Ling at that moment. Yi Langshan covered his mouth as he teased Kai Ling for having such a deep understanding of Master Gu. He also suspected that Kai Ling had feelings for him, but she immediately denied it. While imagining Yu Mingkong proudly wrapping her arms around the meek Master Gu's shoulders, Kai Ling thought about how Yu Mingkong protected things that belonged to her. If she got too close to Master Gu, Yu Mingkong would probably kill her. Suddenly, someone came running towards the group with terrible news. Master Gu had been injured while fighting against the inheritor of demonic arts. Everyone expressed their surprise in unison. Kai Ling immediately approached the bearer of the news and asked him if what he heard was true and if Master Gu was alright. He replied that Master Gu was fine, despite being severely injured. He also added that Yin Mei had been successfully rescued. Kai Ling was relieved upon hearing that Master Gu was alright, but she could not believe that Yi Ling's skills were so good that he would be able to injure Master Gu. Yi Langshan asked about what happened to Yi Ling. Still sweating from running, the bearer of the news told them that Master Gu had severely injured Yi Ling as well, but he managed to run away. They had no idea where he currently was. Wang called the event a disaster. He never thought that Master Gu would fail in killing Yi Ling. Two ladies behind him were gossiping about how Yin Mei and Master Gu had a misunderstanding due to Bai Lai. They never thought that Master Gu would be willing to rescue her. The lady in pink blushed as she closed her eyes and admired Master Gu's generosity and compassion for not leaving his junior behind when she was in trouble. The lady in red did the same and said that she had always thought that Master Gu was like a tyrant. She could not believe that he had a gentle side too. She supposed that Yin Mei must be touched by his actions. They both were jealous of Yin Mei and wondered if Master Gu would also come to save them if they were the ones to fall into the demon's claws. However, the system was showing that their fortune points were very low. Yi Langshan prompted everyone to find Master Gu first so they could ask him about the details regarding Yi Ling and be prepared if they were to fight him, to which everyone agreed. Meanwhile, Hai Ming's sister was looking over the other cultivators from a distance with her troops, and they heard that those people wanted to hunt down the inheritor of demonic arts. They saw it as a chance to take down Master Gu, but their problem was that Master Gu hadn't shown himself yet. Suddenly, someone waltzed into the conversation, passing through a dead body by their side, and said that Master Gu and those outsiders were all their enemies. It was a woman with red hair and angel wings. Her sharp fingernails were dripping blood, and she said that there wouldn't be any difference if they were to kill them. Someone from the ancient snake clan told her that the difference was that there would be factions and powers that would be angered and displeased if they killed all those outsiders. But just targeting Master Gu would have none of those problems, to which the red-haired lady got annoyed and called him a coward. As she glared and licked the blood from her nails, she declared that she would go and find Master Gu if he was hiding, as it would be a waste not to do anything while he was currently injured. Hai Ming's sister glanced at her and told her that she could take her men and go since she wished to take revenge. While in her thoughts, she was calling her a d and planning to use her to test how strong Master Gu truly was. With a contented smile on her face, she gestured at her men and indicated that they were departing. Multiple white feathered wings flew away from the cliff where a group of silhouettes still stood at the edge. On the other hand, the cultivators arrived at the scene, and the ladies immediately expressed their worry when they saw how badly injured Master Gu was. Master Gu coughed as he apologized for making them all worry about him and reassured them that he just had a minor injury and would be fine after a while. Kai Ling's subordinates made an observation about how Master Gu wouldn't be able to get well as quickly as they thought and about how Yi Ling's power was definitely something they shouldn't take lightly since he was able to injure Master Gu. As the cultivators surrounded Master Gu, Yi Langshan said that he was going to ask Master Gu about the details of the battle between him and Yi Ling. But since he was so heavily injured, they'd leave him to nurse his injury. Then, he sighed with worry about Master Gu's injury. As Master Gu tried to reassure the other cultivators that the injury was nothing, he coughed vigorously into his handkerchief. Yin Mei, who was sitting on the ground beside him, began to cry. Yin Mei blamed herself for listening to Yi Ling and being used as a hostage, which caused Master Gu to be injured. Blood dripped from the corners of his shriveled mouth and his eyes were sunken. Despite holding onto his blood-smeared handkerchief, Master Gu comforted Yin Mei and told her not to blame herself, as he would do the same for any other hostage of the Inheritor of Demonic Arts. The other cultivators were in awe of how considerate Master Gu was towards his junior sister's feelings despite being so severely injured. Peng Fei told Master Gu that he should rest and nurse his injury, and promised to defend him if any ancient immortal clans decided to cause him trouble. Kai Ling called everyone's attention and 
suggested that they leave Master Gu alone so he could nurse his injuries in peace. The other cultivators agreed and started to walk away. With everyone's back turned towards them, both Master Gu and Yin Mei ended their act. Yin Mei smiled slyly as she told Master Gu that everyone was dancing in the palm of his hand, to which Master Gu replied that they were just a bunch of stupid morons who couldn't see anything. Still having a sunken look on his face, Master Gu made a sinister smile as he started to plan his attack on the ancient immortal clans. When morning came, news about Master Gu being injured reached Yu Mingkong. She was surprised when her guard told her about it. Yu Mingkong crossed her arms and looked doubtful about his injuries and about rescuing a lady. She speculated that everything was just part of Master Gu's plans and that he was pretending to be injured. She also suspected that the lady he rescued had been working for him from the start. Yu Mingkong glared as she thought that Yin Mei must have been the owner of the scent on Master Gu that other night. At the top of a mountain, Gu Zioner was sulking in a fetal position as she talked with Da King. She was worried about Master Gu's injury and was planning on paying him a visit. As she thought about his personality, she realized that he could not have possibly allowed the inheritor of demonic arts to run off like that, so she was now afraid that Master Gu's injuries must have harmed his original powers. Da King gave her a side eye, and she immediately acted snobbish, denying that she was worried about him and saying that she was just scared that Master Gu would end up dying before she took her revenge. Da King said nothing and just stared into space, looking fed up. Gu Zioner jumped off the ground, deciding to give the divine medicine she had found a few days ago to Master Gu as payment for saving her. As she hopped away from the battered beasts, she sighed and told herself that she was truly magnanimous. The system congratulated Master Gu for obtaining three Nirvana bones and the Supreme Sword Bone by refining the Law of the Five Elements and the Law of the Offensive Sword. As the system notified him about the Taoist Immortal Book upgrade, a golden aura flowed through Master Gu. He now had a fair complexion as he looked at the palm of his hand and thought about the Black Eagle Clan. A miniature image of the Black Eagle Clan stood in the palm of his hand. He closed his fingers, crushing the image, and declared that it was time for him to harvest them. Master Gu smiled sinisterly as he remembered Old Gui, whom he had dangled in front of him and asked where he came from. But Old Gui did not answer his question and instead threatened him not to do anything. Master Gu had a crazed look in his eyes as he started to absorb Old Gui at the temple of his head and told him that he didn't have a choice in the matter. Old Gui couldn't believe that Master Gu's utilization of the energy of reincarnation had exceeded Yi Ling's in just a few days. Master Gu discovered that Old Gui was just one of the three stalks of the divine medicine flower. Panic was evident in Old Gui's tone as he asked Master Gu what he was trying to do, but Master Gu did not say anything and just gave a very eerie smile. A red pillar of light shot up through the sky, wrapped with strings of purple aura. Master Gu levitated as he absorbed the colorful aura in his surroundings. He extended his arms and declared that he had broken through to the peak of the Divine King Realm and was just a step away from the Sacred Realm. Suddenly, one of his subordinates knelt in front of him, reporting that Gu Zioner wished to meet him outside the ruins. Master Gu was adorably dumbfounded when he heard that Gu Zioner had come to see him. One of Master Gu's subordinates directed her towards a huge door, while the other subordinates stood at the side of their path paying their respects and bowing down to her. Gu Zioner glanced at them, seeing them lined up, she felt their immense aura and asked if they were all Master Gu's followers. She thought that with their strength, if they were to be brought into the outside world, they would be more than enough to destroy those second-rate sects. As Gu Zioner walked up the stairs, she thought that even though Master Gu had been using all kinds of tactics to suppress her, if he really wanted her dead, he wouldn't even need to raise a single finger to do so. This made her believe that Master Gu was definitely hiding something from her regarding what happened in their past. Master Gu was sitting on a throne inside the ruins and immediately greeted Gu Zioner, asking if she was there to check if he was truly injured in the fight. Gu Zioner was dumbstruck, looking up at Master Gu, and could not finish her sentence. He was now back to having his sunken face as he lazily looked at Gu Zioner and told her that it was not a bad time for her to take revenge if she wanted to. Gu Zioner regained her composure, and she looked annoyed as she acknowledged that he was really injured. Master Gu was coughing as he told Gu Zioner that his injuries were nothing and that he would still be able to easily suppress her. Gu Zioner told him to stop pretending, as she was not going to take advantage of him while he was heavily injured, and that she only came to see if he was almost dead or not. With his sunken eyes, Master Gu stared intently at her and asked her if she was pitying him. He then released his aura, creating a gust of wind, and told Gu Zioner that he was not so pathetic to the point that she needed to pity him. He told her to get out before he changed his mind, but Gu Zioner stood firmly in front of him. 
She told him that he should stop trying to pretend that he was still as powerful as before when he had already damaged the origin source of his powers. She warned him that if he continued to cultivate, he would just injure himself even more. Buzayana raised her hand to her chest and materialized a flower in between her palms, saying that she had a divine medicine that was good for treating injuries, especially those of a damaged origin source. She threw it towards Master Gu, and as he took it, he told her that he didn't need anyone's goodwill or pity, especially hers. With a lifeless expression, Master Gu looked down at Gu Zianer and told her that all she had to do was cultivate properly so that she could take her revenge against him. He warned her not to harbor any other sort of feelings towards him. Gu Zianer crossed her arms and looked extremely annoyed as she denied harboring feelings for him. She told him that she was just afraid that someone else would kill him before she could take her revenge against him. Her nerves were popping as she continued to get annoyed and yelled at him that he was overthinking things. With lifeless eyes, she stared at him and said nothing while he seemed to be thinking about what he was going to do. As Master Gu decided to accept the medicine, he extended his index finger with a glimmer of aura showing on its tip. He told Gu Zianer that she could choose whatever she wished as payment for her favor. Gu Zianer crossed her arms and proudly looked away. She told him to stop humiliating her, stating that she didn't need the items he had. She even declared that she would never take anything from him, even if she ended up broke or obtained nothing from the trip. She was about to say more when something shiny caught her attention. Multiple weapons, shining like treasure, were floating in front of her. Gu Zianer drooled, and her eyes bulged so much that they were almost falling out of their sockets. Even Da King's eyes widened. Master Gu closed his eyes in disappointment and said that he would take them back if she didn't want them. But to his surprise, most of the weapons floating in the air earlier were gone, and Gu Zianer was already diligently tying them together. Master Gu closed his eyes and smiled, thinking about how greedy Gu Zianer was and how the thoughts that he had planted and cultivated in her mind seemed to have slowly germinated and grown. Meanwhile, Gu Zianer had not finished grabbing the weapons she liked and was still gathering them with Da King while appreciating how great each one of the weapons was. Suddenly, someone came to the door and bowed to Master Gu, reporting that a large group of individuals belonging to the ancient Immortal Feather Clan had been sighted 300 yards away. They seemed to be planning for a full-on frontal assault on them. The mention of the Feather Clan caught Master Gu's attention. While he smiled and thought that it was time for him to deepen his relationship with them, Gu Zianer, who now had her hands full of the weapons she had chosen, curiously stared at him. Carrying the weapons on her back, Gu Zianer looked apprehensive as she confronted Master Gu about why he was staring at her. She boldly asked if he was thinking that she would help him. Master Gu did not answer, but he simply smiled, believing that she would. The Feather Clan, led by the red-haired lady, was in a heated battle with Master Gu's subordinates in the sky. Some of the Feather Clan's members paused fighting when they saw someone and wondered if it was Master Gu who had finally made an appearance. Behind his subordinates, Master Gu emerged from a warp in space. One of his subordinates immediately greeted and bowed to him, warning him that there were too many enemies and worrying about his injuries. However, Master Gu assured her that it was alright and gave her some sword pills to share amongst themselves to help them fight against the enemy. The red-haired lady immediately acknowledged Master Gu's appearance and told him that she bet he never thought he would end up in such a situation after killing all those disciples of her clan. As she commanded her troops to attack and told them that anyone who managed to cut off Master Gu's head would be heavily rewarded. The red-haired lady smiled evilly as she sensed that Master Gu's aura wasn't steady and that he looked so fatigued that he even required help to be able to absorb and activate the sword pills. It seemed that Master Gu had really sustained heavy injuries. The sword pills cracked as Master Gu's subordinates activated them. Led by the lady whom Master Gu gave the pill to, they started to gather into formation. She encouraged them that those people from the Feather Clan were nothing to be afraid of with them bearing their master's sword pills. She then instructed them to form the sword array and led them to launch a simultaneous attack against the Feather Clan. On the other hand, the red-haired lady stood behind her troops as she waved her hand, commanding her subordinates to attack. The Feather Clan was surprised when a gigantic sword was summoned by Master Gu's subordinates' formation, which made the red-haired lady immediately stand in front of her subordinates. While thinking that those sword pills must be extremely expensive, so Master Gu wouldn't have a lot of them, she raised her hand to her chest, and a red aura swirled in between her palms as she started to materialize something in between them. As a circular shield started to materialize, she thought that with Master Gu heavily injured, she would be able to kill them all after she blocked the sword strike from them. The sword and the shield clashed, and a huge spark appeared due to the collision of each force. A giant ball of aura was formed, and rays of light started to shine through its sides, a sign that an explosion would eventually follow. The trees below them were torn and blown away by the explosion's shockwave, while Master Goose's subordinates used their arms to protect their faces from it. 
smoke from the impact started to dissipate, revealing a circular shield with a red circular gem in the middle, which Master Gu immediately recognized. Meanwhile, the Feather Clan was surprised when they felt the aura of the Feather Sage and realized that they were looking at a divine weapon. The red-haired lady proudly stood in front of her subordinates while raising her right hand in the air, summoning the divine weapon, which seemed to be accumulating aura at its gem in the middle. She proudly smiled as she declared that it was the day that she would make a name for herself by killing Master Gu and making the Feather Clan's name rise to the top. Master Gu calmly stood and looked at the Feather Clan in front of him, along with their divine weapon that emitted a menacing aura. He marveled at the thought of the red-haired lady who was voluntarily using her divine weapon. Master Gu observed that it seemed the ancient immortal clans had suffered heavy losses, particularly with their ancestral tombs being excavated. He was sure that their fury had reached the breaking point, and they had already started infringing on the agreement they originally had with the outside world. As the red-haired lady instructed her subordinates to quickly stop Master Gu, he thought that such carelessness from the ancient immortal clans would probably be the kindling for instigating a war between them and the outside world. It gave him the perfect excuse to retaliate. As Master Gu smiled and thought that he should really thank the stupid morons from the Feather Clan for instigating the attack, something behind him caught his attention. It was Gu Zioner, who nervously explained to someone how they were mistaken, as she was not the one they were looking for if they were trying to attack Master Gu. While holding her sword in a way to show that she had no intent to attack, she tried to convince two of the Feather Clan's members that she was just a passerby in the situation and had nothing to do with it. She frowned and glared in the direction of Master Gu and cursed him in her head, as she realized that he must have known that the Feather Clan was going to attack him, so he used her as some sort of bait, which upset her because she was a fool for still worrying about his injuries. Gu Zioner was startled when, out of nowhere, Master Gu shouted that he didn't need her help as the situation had nothing to do with her, so she should leave quickly. Gu Zioner was extremely annoyed at what Master Gu had done. Her veins were popping as she yelled back at him for saying nonsense and told him that she didn't want to help him. The red-haired lady noticed that Master Gu was pretty concerned about Gu Zioner, so she ordered her subordinates to take her hostage. While Gu Zioner fought with the two Feather Clan members, three more flew in their direction to help their kind with the fight. But they were surprised when a powerful, slashing aura blocked their path. It was Master Gu who blocked them, coughing heavily as he held the fiery sword he just used in his hands. With his lifeless eyes, he glared in the direction of the Feather Clan and asked them if they were trying to start a war with the Chengsheng Gu family by attacking his younger sister. Still holding up her divine weapon, the red-haired lady smirked as she realized that Master Gu must truly be at his wits end to be using his family clan to force her to leave them alone. She told Master Gu that he must have never thought he would face such a predicament when he first killed members of her clan and sneakily attacked Long Tang, and that he deserved everything that was coming his way. As the sword in his hand started to vanish, he told the red-haired lady that if she really wished to take revenge, he had nothing to say. But using her divine weapon was a breach of the agreement between the ancient immortal clan and the outside world. The red-haired lady smiled evilly as she told Master Gu that he was really getting desperate to mention the agreement, and she gave him some advice to start thinking of his future funeral affairs instead of wasting his time. She then ordered her two subordinates to charge at him. While still fighting, Gu Zioner looked back in Master Gu's direction, and she was worried. As the two attacking members of the Feather Clan were about to reach Master Gu, multiple streaks of colorful aura flew in their direction, and someone threatened them not to harm Master Gu. Both of them were attacked by someone with a blue aura, and they were unable to block it. It was Yilangshan who was now standing in front of Master Gu, protecting him from his now frozen assailants. He shattered the frozen bodies as he declared that the ancient immortal clans had gone too far. He was mad and cursed the Feather Clan for daring to attack Master Gu while he was injured. While the other cultivators started to arrive and surround Master Gu, Yi Langshan told him that they would help him fight against the clan. Master Gu smiled at the perfect timing of their arrival. He then acted like he had strengthened his resolve as he thanked everyone and told them that without their help, the Feather Clan's evil attempt to take him down would have succeeded. The red-haired lady looked annoyed that more people had joined Master Gu to fight against them and declared that they wouldn't be able to help him. The cultivators could not believe that the Feather Clan was using their divine weapon, and one of them was angry and declared that he would report it to the Orthodox faction when he returned and let all of the elders know how the ancient immortal clan intended to rebel. Ignoring the cultivators' complaints and waving them off as nonsense, the red-haired lady instructed her subordinates to kill the cultivators, and each of them simultaneously took a pill. All of them glared at their enemies as a stream of aura started to emit from each of their bodies, and their muscles started to bulge. 
while declaring that they were not afraid of them. The Feather Clan charged towards the cultivators, but the cultivators were also prepared to attack them. As they rose up to protect Master Gu, who was nothing but just in kind and was injured by their own people, they saw it as an opportunity to kill all of the ancient immortal spirits. An intense battle started, and the area was filled with destructive auras and explosions. On the other hand, the red-haired lady grinned as she fired the aura emanating from her divine weapon and proclaimed to the cultivators that they were all just a bunch of trash trying to survive under the light of her divine weapon. Three yellow auras headed towards three cultivators who were busy fending off their enemies. One of them noticed the sneak attack but they were unable to react in time, and the aura pierced their torsos. The red-haired lady called upon Master Gu and declared that his end was near, suggesting that he stop resisting and surrender. Master Gu secretly smiled, considering the situation, as he felt it was only natural for him to continue resisting with all his might. Portraying a dignified and righteous image, Master Gu reprimanded her for daring to use her divine weapon to kill the geniuses of the outside world and declared that he would never allow it to happen. His subordinate tried to stop him from using his powers, concerned about his severe injuries. However, Master Gu dismissed her concerns and told her that everyone was fighting on the front lines for him, as he was responsible for it all, and he wouldn't be able to face them if he continued to hide behind them. Full of determination, Master Gu released his aura and declared that even if he were to lose all his cultivation and his soul were to dissipate, he would not let the red-haired lady have her way. He expanded his aura throughout the area, reaching the red-haired lady, who raised her arms to protect herself from its intensity. As soon as the other cultivators sensed his aura, they looked in Master Gu's direction, worried about him using his spiritual energy while being injured. The red-haired lady grinned as she mocked Master Gu's weak and desperate attempt and asked him how long he could sustain his secret technique. As Master Gu stepped forward to attack her, he responded that he could sustain it long enough to kill her. The red-haired lady was astounded when Master Gu suddenly appeared behind her, materializing a halberd in his hand as he declared that the Feather Clan and the entire ancient immortal clan would pay for what she had done that day. Master Gu's halberd struck the center of her divine weapon, greatly pushing her back from the impact. The red-haired lady now looked apprehensive as she acknowledged Master Gu's strength, being able to push back her divine weapon even in his non-peak condition. She admitted that if he weren't injured, she probably would have died fighting him head-on. She then raised both her arms, causing her divine weapon to face upwards, as she told him that it was a pity the divine weapon she wielded was far stronger than he could possibly imagine. A winged, gigantic, fiery spirit emerged from her divine weapon. As the spirit opened its eyes, rays of light spread in the area, scorching the cultivators who came into contact with them. Kai Ling cursed as she injured her arm and immediately instructed everyone to retreat due to the dire situation. The fiery spirit's aura engulfed a large area, causing the cultivators to gather at a safe distance, marveling at its terrifying strength. The spirit loomed over them, intensifying the sense of intimidation and causing some cultivators to regret their decision to participate in the fight. Meanwhile, Gu Ziner looked worriedly for Master Gu, thinking she had seen him rush towards the golden light earlier. She frowned and gritted her teeth in concern. The other cultivators also saw Master Gu rush into the fire to protect all of them, and they cursed at the big fire, which prevented them from seeing what was happening inside. They were afraid that he might have really died. While still raising her arms in the air, the red-haired lady laughed maniacally. She never thought that Master Gu, whom everyone was so scared of, would be such a coward. She called him an insect, but she suddenly stopped laughing, and terror filled her eyes as she sensed something. She was now enclosed in a rectangular barrier and panicked when she recognized that it was a time-space lock. When she realized that she couldn't use her divine weapon anymore, she became terrified, and her eyes turned bloodshot. The red-haired lady flinched and started to back away from Master Gu who had just appeared behind her, laughing and thanking her. With his face back to its healthy complexion, he told her that even if he didn't kill her, the clan elders would have killed her once they knew that she had used her divine weapon in the fight. But without a moron like her, his plans wouldn't have gone so smoothly either. The red-haired lady was in disarray when she asked Master Gu what plan he was talking about. Her confused expression immediately changed to epiphany when she realized that Master Gu was trying to make her use her divine weapon. It was at that moment that she also realized that Master Gu was not injured at all, and Master Gu acknowledged that she was not that stupid after all. But the red-haired lady couldn't make sense of the situation. Even if Master Gu wasn't injured, there was no way that a mere quasi-god realm cultivator would be able to escape the divine weapon's attack. So she didn't understand how Master Gu was able to stand there in front of her unharmed. 
Master Gu started to emit his purple aura as he questioned the red-haired lady for calling him a mere quasi-god realm cultivator. Her eyes were about to pop out of their sockets due to terror as she looked at Master Gu. He looked extremely terrifying with his black eyes and glowing purple iris. He shrouded himself in his purple aura as he told her to take a closer look to see for herself what realm he was currently in. As Master Gu's aura started to come at her, the red-haired lady's face twisted with fear when she realized that he was the inheritor of demonic arts. But before she could say a coherent sentence, she started to groan in pain as he aggressively placed his palm over her face. The red-haired lady tried to get out of Master Gu's grasp by grabbing his arms, but it was no use. The red-haired lady's eyes were bloodshot as Master Gu continued to grab her face, and while grinning, he told her that she was too naive to use a mere divine weapon to try and kill him when even a true saint couldn't put up a fight against him. The red-haired lady's body started to crack, and a golden light was seeping through those cracks. Tears filled her eyes as she continued to groan in pain, and Master Gu's evil face was reflected in those same eyes. Her body exploded, leaving only her pair of wings. The blank tint in Master Gu's eyes began to dissipate as he looked into the distance, and he apologized for not having the habit of listening to people pleading for their lives in front of him. Meanwhile, the other cultivators who had gathered around the Divine Weapons avatar saw that it was starting to disappear and wondered what had happened. As the fire started to dissipate, the cultivators rejoiced when they saw Master Gu in it, and the presence of the red-haired lady from the Feather Clan disappeared. They assumed that he must have won and praised him for being such a genius that even with his cultivation origin damaged, he was still able to kill an enemy with a divine weapon. They immediately rushed towards him to check on him, and as they gathered around, worried about him. Master Gu reassured them that he was fine, he had just used up some of his life force, so he wouldn't be able to use his cultivation to fight for a while. The other cultivators looked at each other guiltily as they blamed themselves for being too weak. Instead of helping Master Gu in the battle, they had just ended up dragging him down. As he wiped the blood off the corners of his mouth, Master Gu told them that there was no need for them to blame themselves. It was his fault. If he had not underestimated the inheritor of demonic arts, they wouldn't be suffering like they were earlier. While Yi Liu Lai cursed the Feather Clan for using their divine weapon and breaking the agreement, Yi Langshan addressed the fact that the situation had escalated into a much greater issue. Since one of the ancient immortal clans had dared to raise their hand against Master Gu, there was no assurance that they wouldn't do the same to the rest of them. Kai Ling called for everyone's attention and told them that they should spread the word and inform their families and sects about what had happened. They must make those ancient immortal clans pay for their mistakes. Wang agreed and added that they couldn't leave things as they were. Sweating profusely due to pain, Master Gu weakly smiled and told them that he had to trouble everyone to do so once again. Meanwhile, the surviving members of the Feather Clan were rushing to escape and spread the news that Miss Yu Jing, the red-haired lady, had fallen. Master Gu's subordinate noticed them and asked for instructions on what they should do about them. Master Gu glanced in their direction and coldly instructed his subordinate to kill them all. While Master Gu's subordinates confirmed that they understood his instruction and quickly chased after the Feather Clan, at a distance, Gu Zioner was dismissing her sword. She turned her back at the mob of cultivators that were crowding around Master Gu, and she looked relieved as she clanked in their direction and said that she knew Master Gu would be alright, and there was no way those morons from the Feather Clan would be strong enough to fight against him. She then glared and looked annoyed as she remembered how Master Gu manipulated things to get her involved and make himself look like a saint at the same time, and she realized that she would always end up in trouble every time she got close to Master Gu. On the other hand, the news of Yu Jing's loss has reached the cliff where the young geniuses of the ancient immortal clan had gathered earlier. A survivor from the Feather Clan knelt in front of the group as he reported what happened, and the other natives asked Tai Ming's sister if they should fight since Master Gu seemed to have finally exhausted all of his strength so it would be a great opportunity for them. One of the Snake Clan told them to forget attacking Master Gu as Yu Jing's actions have already caused them to become the target of every cultivator from the outside world's wrath. And with how things are developing, even if their goal was only to kill Master Gu, they would only serve to exacerbate their conflict with the outside world. Hai Ming's sister was deep in thought, and she agreed with what the guy said, as Master Gu wasn't just strong, but he was also incredibly sly and clever, so they were not able to determine if he still has other tricks up his sleeve. As she walked away from the survivor, past the other natives who had made way for her, she told them that their current priority was to return home and think of methods to survive the wrath of those orthodox factions from the outside world. She scowled as she told them that Master Gu was intentionally guiding the conflict between all of them and that their relationship with the outsiders had deteriorated to the point that they could no longer tolerate each other. While thinking that they had to be careful with fighting Master Gu and not give him any opportunities to take advantage of them, 
Meanwhile, at the Feather Clan's residence, the elders were holding a meeting. One of them was so mad about Yu Jing's foolishness for using the divine weapon against Master Gu without their permission that he slammed his fist on the table beside him. He was mad that they had all fallen into Master Gu's trap. One of the elders was worried that the Feather Clan would become the criminals of the ancient immortal land if the conflict continued to exacerbate. But another elder told him that there was no use for them to debate on things as Master Gu was probably planning to trap all of the ancient immortal clans. To which another elder agreed and said that the other clans wouldn't just let it be. Yu Jing's grandfather was shrouded in an ominous aura as he said, Master Gu has such a cunning and cruel mind despite being young, so we can't let him be. I express my sentiments that I would rather go all out and fight against them. One of the elders was strongly against the idea, as Master Gu held the title of heir to the Taoist Immortal Palace. She reminded them all of what that meant. They were all speechless. Then the elder from earlier slammed his hands onto the table as he stood up and expressed his exasperation about the situation. He said they couldn't kill Master Gu and that he wasn't willing to accept defeat, take things lying down, and let Master Gu do whatever he wished with them. The head of the clan sat there quietly, seeming deep in thought. He then suggested that they should have a talk with the Dragon Clan, as the issue ultimately had something to do with the true dragon plaque they possessed. He mentioned his fear that in the times to come, the ancient immortal land would be wrought with turmoil. In front of a vast ancient settlement, a rift in space formed above the gates. Master Gu emerged from the rift, telling himself that it was time for him to reap what he had sown. Looking down, he felt pleased because Hai Ming had truly not disappointed him. Two disciples of the Black Eagle Clan stood before the Peifeng, discussing the mission to hunt down Master Gu two days ago. One asked the other why the mission was cancelled, and the other replied, advising him not to mention it. He explained that Hai Ming's sister, Yan Yu, was worried that Master Gu had another trick up his sleeve. Thus, they had to retreat, and he expressed disappointment at wasting such a good opportunity. The disciples were startled when Master Gu suddenly stepped onto the ground in front of them. They asked him who he was. Confidently smiling, Master Gu told them that he was the infamous Master Gu they were talking about. As they learned his identity, they became apprehensive and confused, wondering why he had come to their clan. Taking a step forward, Master Gu declared that he was there to reclaim what belonged to him. He swiftly attacked, passing by the two disciples with a smile on his face. While meditating, Yan Yu was alarmed by the sense that someone had invaded their clan's territory. She stood up and wondered who had the audacity to commit such an act. She immediately suspected Yi Ling, the heir of the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation, and the inheritor of demonic arts. She scowled and assumed that the intruder was sly and cunning, indicating they had no good intentions. Meanwhile, Hai Ming meditated in his room, surrounded by a purple aura. Sensing a presence, he rejoiced upon recognizing it as the presence of the omnipotent emperor. On the other hand, a large group of Black Eagle Clan disciples had gathered, all glaring in the same direction. Their glares were directed at Master Gu, who had seemingly already defeated several of their members. They blocked his way, cursing him for daring to provoke them recklessly. Hai Ming and Yan Yu arrived at the scene simultaneously. Yan Yu was immediately surprised to see Master Gu, wondering why he was the one invading their territory and how his injuries had completely healed. Her face filled with horror as she considered the possibility that Master Gu had never been injured in the first place. Two disciples of the Black Eagle Clan stepped forward blocking Master Gu's path and threatening him not to take another step. They emphasized that the place did not belong to the Chengsheng Gu family, warning that if he disturbed their ancestors, he would only regret it. Master Gu looked ominous as he hid his hands behind his back and told them that they all really failed to understand how precious life was. Suddenly, someone yelled at them to stop right where they were. While the aura from Master Gu's hand started to dissipate, the Black Eagle Clan looked up and recognized their elder, who was emerging from a warp in space and instructing all of them to back away immediately. While still floating in midair, the elder asked Master Gu what he was trying to do. Confidently smiling and looking up at him, Master Gu responded that he was only there to take back something that belonged to him. The elder calmly placed his arms behind his back and asked Master Gu what it was he was after. Without hesitation, Master Gu told him that it was the Heavenly Emperor of Reincarnation's platform. He also declared that he was after the entire Black Eagle clan as well, pointing at the clan disciples in front of him. This surprised them, made them mad, and caused them to curse at him. Meanwhile, the Elder was surprised and wondered how Master Gu knew about the reincarnation platform, which was an inheritance that the ancient immortal clans have been taking turns watching over and using for meditation. The Elder started to land on the ground, and upon seeing his reaction, Master Gu directly told him to stop wasting his time, as he didn't have the qualification to negotiate or talk to him. He suggested that the Elder should ask his ancestor, who was at the Supreme Realm, to come out instead. While the Elder was enraged and mocked Master Gu for speaking arrogantly, the clan disciples were also enraged by what Master Gu had said. 
they suggested to the elder that they should kill Master Gu as if they continued to let him be, the Black Eagle Clan's reputation would be ruined. They believed that since Master Gu had come seeking death himself, the outside world wouldn't be able to say anything. Master Gu was unfazed, he even confidently told them that none of them realized that they would all die if he desired so. Standing at the center, Master Gu released a shockwave of aura, followed by a different type of aura that linked all of them together. He told the clan that it was the source of his arrogance. Everyone, including the elder, was surprised, and they all bent over and clutched their chests due to the sudden pain they felt, it was as if someone was squeezing their hearts. Everyone was now kneeling on the ground, groaning and complaining in pain. The elder asked Master Gu what kind of trick he was using, thinking that what they were experiencing was more terrifying than the slave mark. Master Gu approached the elder, who was reaching out to him, and asked if it was really important for him to know how he did it. With veins popping out of his shaking hands, the elder was about to touch Master Gu's clothes as he asked how he could control whether they lived or died. But before he could touch Master Gu, he collapsed on the ground. The elder was now lying on the ground, but he was still extending his arms, trying to reach Master Gu. Everyone, even Hai Ming, was now kneeling on the ground. Their faces were pale, and veins were popping out of their bodies as they all experienced terrible pain. With everyone bowing around him, he opened his arms and looked up at the sky, expressing his delight with the situation. He told them to remember that from that day on, he was their master. While some of her clanmates were already lying unconscious on the ground, Yan Yu was still able to sit up, gritting her teeth as she endured the pain. She surmised that the method Master Gu was using had something to do with the slave mark. He knew about the existence of the reincarnation platform, which no one else should know aside from the heir of the Emperor of Reincarnation. Thus, he must have given Master Gu the opportunity to do something to their slave marks. While observing Master Gu, who was delighted to see them in pain, a thought came into her mind, Master Gu could actually be the true inheritor of demonic arts. Master Gu seemed to have sensed what she was thinking as he looked in her direction and smirked, which surprised her. Suddenly, a strong gust of wind came towards Master Gu, catching his attention. As the wind kept getting stronger, someone called Master Gu a brat. Up in the sky, the silhouette of a winged person was the source of the gust of wind. The clan disciples rejoiced when they recognized that it was their ancestor, and their ancestor was mad at Master Gu for daring to do such a thing and looking down on the elders. The ancestor was an old man with long gray hair. He was the one who was at the Quasi Super Realm, and the clan disciples were glad that he had come to save them. As he looked up at the sky, Master Gu seemed glad that the ancestor had finally revealed himself, and he told him that he was nothing but a slightly bigger ant. The ancestor was enraged, a combination of black, white, and red auras swirled around him as he spread his wings and called Master Gu an arrogant brat. His eyes glimmered, and steam was coming out of his mouth as he held his hands together, and mocked Master Gu for thinking that he could do anything he wanted just because he was able to defeat the younger generation, Long Tang and Yu Jing, so he was going to teach him a lesson. But before he could finish his sentence, Master Gu glared at him and commanded him to kneel. Master Gu's aura was so powerful that it seemed like a gigantic, sinister version of himself was hovering his hands over the ancestor, binding him with chains of aura. The ancestor was petrified and couldn't do anything as the chains pulled him and smashed him flat into the ground, while the rest of the clan disciples called out to him with worry. The clan disciples could not believe that their ancestor, who was at the Quasi Supreme Realm, was suppressed by Master Gu. Meanwhile, Haiming was kneeling in pain as he wondered who Master Gu was and why he had the scent of the Omnipotent Emperor. Suddenly, a whirlwind of purple aura came rushing towards the scene and hurriedly pleaded with Master Gu to spare the clan. It was the ancestor who was in charge of the clan, and he immediately bowed to Master Gu as soon as he landed on the ground. He requested that Master Gu follow him for further discussions, but the clan disciples insisted that he kill Master Gu as he had invaded their territory and killed their clan disciples. But the ancestor told them to shut up, calling them fools as he informed them that if Master Gu had wanted to kill all of them, they would all have been dead at that moment. While thinking about how Master Gu likes to pretend that he wasn't that strong when he was so extremely powerful that even he, who had been far away at the Grand Hall, sensed him and felt worried. Master Gu was pleased at what he heard and told the ancestor that he liked smart people like him and told him to lead the way. While they were still on all fours due to pain, the clan disciples were enraged and cursed at how the ancestor humbly bowed down to Master Gu, following his order and leading the way. At the Heavenly Eagle Palace, four elders and four clan disciples stood before Master Gu and offered him a seat on the throne on the raised platform in front of them. While thinking about how Master Gu was able to instantly suppress him despite being at the Quasi Supreme Realm, he ordered one of the disciples, Yan Yu, to serve Master Gu some tea, to which she immediately complied. She poured tea into a cup and served it to Master Gu, who asked for her name. Hai Yan Yu meekly told Master Gu her name and introduced herself as a Black Eagle clansman. Master Gu drank the tea and acknowledged that it was not bad. 
he also praised her for being sharp, as she remained still and knew what was good for her. Hai Ming was stunned, and the ancestors did not say anything. However, one of them, the one with spiky brown hair, though he remained silent, was obviously angry. He was scowling and questioning why the other ancestors were allowing the crown jewel of their clan to serve an outsider, and why they were showing such servitude towards Master Gu. While some of the others greeted Master Gu as their master, not all of them did the same. One even cursed silently in his head, unable to accept that Hai Yan Yu, a warrior of the Black Eagle clan, was reduced to serving tea. Master Gu placed the empty cup on the side table and stated that he knew there were some among them who despised him to the point of wanting to kill him. His voice was filled with menace, and the tip of his finger glimmered as he pointed at the people he intended to set as an example. He pointed at the ancestor with spiky brown hair and two of the disciples who did not greet him, including the one who cursed him in his head. Their nerves started to show on their faces, and blood began to spurt from their eyes and mouths. The three of them were pushed back, and their bodies were dragged along the ground, leaving the rest of the clan stunned in surprise. Master Gu looked down at them and, with the same menacing tone, reminded them that death was the best end for those who attempted to betray him. The three ancestors immediately knelt and bowed down, their heads on the ground, as they pleaded for Master Gu to cease his fury and offered to surrender their clan to him. While Hai Yan Yu looked at Master Gu with horror-filled eyes, he calmly accepted the ancestors' request and reassured them not to worry. He claimed to have a kind and gentle disposition and confessed that he didn't actually like killing others. He told them that as long as they were loyal to him, there might be a chance for their clan to swallow up the rest of the clans and rule the ancient immortal land. The ancestors rejoiced and sincerely thanked Master Gu with all their might as they pledged to dutifully abide by his wishes. Master Gu now walked up a very long set of stairs with Hai Yan Yu towards a mountain with red, stormy skies. While Hai Yan Yu walked behind Master Gu, he called her and told her that, since she was perceptive and sharp, he would let her help him gather the essences of the other clan's geniuses. Hai Yan Yu appeared apprehensive upon hearing what Master Gu had said, as she seemed to have an idea of what he was planning to do with those essences. Master Gu did not provide any explanation, and he just smiled sinisterly as he told her that the path to the ancient immortal land would no longer be shut, and it would become the best breeding ground that he could have. Hai Yan Yu was silent for a moment, and then she bowed down, assuring him that she would do her best. They had reached the location of the reincarnation platform, where a gigantic lotus-shaped platform was in the midst of a red and black aura storm. Hai Yan Yu informed that usually, only the elders who had achieved a high level of cultivation were allowed to come to the platform and be enlightened by the reincarnation law's mysterious energy. Master Gu grinned as he saw the reincarnation platform, and a white aura escaped from his eyes, which Hai Yan Yu immediately recognized as reincarnation energy. Master Gu summoned a bottle in his hand. He quickly jumped onto the platform, and Hai Yan Yu marveled at the sight of the reincarnation platform opening. It was her first time seeing it clearly. As Master Gu started to meditate in the middle of the platform, the bottle floated above him and began absorbing the storm of aura that shrouded the area. Hai Yan Yu was amazed as she witnessed Master Gu simply devouring the strength of the platform, while the elders required meditation to understand it. The aura seeped into the mark on Master Gu's forehead. As the aura escaped from his eyes, he grinned with triumph, knowing that he had acquired another life insurance because the reincarnation mark would allow him to return to the mortal world even if the essence of his spirit was broken. He then started planning to pluck some feathers from the Black Eagle clan. On the other hand, an elder of the Snake clan slammed his cane on the ground and cursed, accusing the Black Eagle clan of being traitors. He felt that the mark on their reincarnation platform had been tampered with, which surprised a disciple standing behind him. He immediately ordered the disciple to gather the clansmen and inform them that he had something to say. The disciple confirmed his understanding and bowed down. The elder was deep in thought as he stared into the horizon. He stood at the head of a giant snake statue, contemplating how the ancient immortal clans were in complete disarray. If the orthodox factions from the outside world planned to invade them at that moment, their clan would have to find a way to preserve themselves in such a situation. Meanwhile, the great elder peered through a space hole, watching the cultivators fight against the feather clan. When a close-up image of Master Gu's face was shown, the great elder became enraged, pointing at Master Gu and describing him as wicked and cunning for leading the ancient immortal clans to their deaths. It seems that the great elder was talking to another man with shabby clothes and a creepy smile, who told him that Master Gu was their family's chosen one. Even though he had never seen him before, he had definitely heard some rumors about him, so he was not surprised that he was capable of such things. The great elder calmed down and noticed the man's current strength. He asked if the man was planning to disrupt those ancient immortal clans. The man told him that he should go and help the young master of their clan who had been bullied. 
The Great Elder did not understand this, as the man was Gu Ziyaner's ancestor and it was clear that Master Gu was trying to harm the ancient immortal clans. The man looked determined and told the Great Elder that he should not dare to stop him, as Master Gu was the young master of the Gu family. He then frowned and gritted his teeth, saying that he couldn't do something as atrocious as killing his own family member. The Great Elder remained silent and appeared deep in thought, as if he had caught on to something. He then laughed, stroked his beard, and said that he would gather his old bones and accompany the man. Huge ships, horses, monsters, and other kinds of transportation emerged from multiple portals above a palace. The shabby-looking man and the Great Elder floated above some troops, both gazing out into the open. The Great Elder glanced at the troops behind them and observed that everyone was at the Divine King realm. He remarked that he never thought the Cheng Sheng Gu family would pay such attention. The man laughed and said that he did not arrange things, it was done by Master Gu who used his position as the young master of the family to request the family to send those forces. The Great Elder looked wary upon hearing that it was done by Master Gu. The man noticed the Great Elder's reaction and asked him why he seemed to care more about Master Gu's actions than the Gu family does. The Great Elder stroked his beard, closed his eyes, and explained to the man that he paid attention because Master Gu was the heir of their immortal Taoist palace. The man simply laughed and suggested they start to depart. Meanwhile, Yulu Lai and Yilangshan, who appeared to be riding one of those ships, bowed down. Their uncle acknowledged that the clan had already heard about the events in the ancient immortal clan, and it was inevitable that the place would become a stage for various factions and forces to play their own strategic games. Yilangshan sought clarification from their uncle if what he meant was that their training had ended. Their uncle confirmed and assured them that he would be the one ensuring their safety. He mentioned that the ancient immortal clans had gone too far, and it was time to demonstrate the strength of the ancient celestial families. Yulu Lai approached their uncle and informed him that the ancient immortal clans primarily targeted Master Gu and showed them great respect. However, their uncle warned them not to underestimate Master Gu, as without him, they would not have had the opportunity to involve themselves in such a matter. Yu Langshan was surprised when he finally understood what had happened and praised Master Gu for being truly shrewd. Gazing into the distance, their uncle told them not to worry about Master Gu's safety. The Cheng Sheng Gu family reacted swiftly and furiously to the situation, sending a large number of elites as support. It was the Feather Clan that would be in trouble, but thanks to Master Gu, their Yi family was able to secure a piece of the ancient immortal land. On the other hand, as the ominous ship of the primordial demonic sect appeared in the sky, the other cultivators below it panicked and ran, while one of them looked up and wondered why a hardline sect like theirs had shown up at the ancient immortal land. While looking up at the massive vessel towering over them, one of them remembered that the force backing the maternal side of Master Gu seemed to be the primordial demonic sect. The man beside him was shocked by the information, stating that the ancient immortal clans were definitely dead. Meanwhile, Master Gu held another purple feather in his hand, staring intently at it. He sat on his new throne, still gazing at the feather, and smiled as he thought about the information he had acquired regarding Yu Mingkong hiding at the Hundred Mountain Range. He believed that the birthing place of the Divine Spirit must be located nearby. He considered that Yu Mingkong was truly intent on keeping everything for herself, but without her, he would have to wait for the Divine Spirit to appear and determine its location, losing the initiative. Standing up, he instructed Hai Yan Yu not to let anyone know that he had entered their territory. She respectfully bowed and agreed to his command. While Master Gu pondered how Yu Mingkong was his lucky star, she meditated diligently at the Hundred Mountain Range, surrounding herself with strands of her golden aura. Suddenly, she furrowed her eyebrows, feeling unsettled and annoyed for no apparent reason. She calmed herself down and continued meditating, reminding herself that the divine scripture was meant to help her obtain a perfect, true immortal body, so she needed to refine it quickly. A couple of hours later, seven different colors of aura formed a trail of light that seemed to enter a space barrier. Yu Mingkong felt horrified when she realized that someone had triggered the forbidden array she had set up. Worried, she looked up and considered how the Hundred Mountain Range spanned at least 3,000 miles, planting traps in every void. She warned her guards about the presence and aura of a couple of powerful enemies approaching their direction, and instructed them to prepare for interception. The guards quickly rose into the air, seeing the streaks of light approaching them. Yu Mingkong noticed that it was Master Gu, Yin Mei, and his other subordinates. Nervous, the guards asked Yu Mingkong what they should do. She remained silent, deep in thought, while she stared at Yin Mei who was flying right behind Master Gu. Yu Mingkong looked furious as she commanded her guards to stop them, and her guards nervously looked at each other, conversing through their eyes. They were thinking about the same thing, to try and stop Master Gu was to die a worthless death. However, even though they thought that way, they still followed Yu Mingkong's orders and blocked Master Gu and his companion's path. 
Vaster Gu gleefully smiled at Yu Mingkong, acting as if it was a coincidence and told her that he never thought she would be there too. One of the guards who blocked Master Gu's way explained that Yu Mingkong had ordered them to do so, while the other one seemed depressed, thinking about how they would suffer when Master Gu and Yu Mingkong fought against each other. Despite this, Master Gu politely smiled and told them that it was fine, as he probably did something to make Yu Mingkong mad at him again. Master Gu used his skill to warp the space and appeared in front of Yu Mingkong, asking her what was wrong and why she was not happy to see him. However, instead of answering his question, she asked him why he was there. Meanwhile, Yin Mei didn't look too happy as she observed Master Gu and Yu Mingkong. She felt that Yu Mingkong was quite hostile towards her and wanted to kill her. Yu Mingkong was shrouded in a dark aura as she stared coldly at Yin Mei, paying no mind to Master Gu, who was talking to her about how he was wondering why she would be there and that he noticed she had been arranging quite a bit of stuff in the area. Yu Mingkong glanced at Master Gu as she told him that her motive for coming there was the same as his. Yu Mingkong was so surprised when Master Gu held her hand, smiled at her, and told her that the situation was perfect. Her face turned beet red. While she was still blushing, Master Gu leaned in close to her face, wearing a smug expression, and told her that he was still a little upset that she didn't come to visit him when he was injured. Yu Mingkong's expression immediately turned cold as she smelled Yin Mei's scent on Master Gu's clothes. As Yu Mingkong turned her back on Master Gu, saying that his injuries were none of her concern since she was not the one who hurt him, Yin Mei watched them from a distance, witnessing how Master Gu teased Yu Mingkong for being so cold-hearted. Yin Mei clasped her hands as she realized that Master Gu seemed to like Yu Mingkong. Yu Mingkong glanced back at Master Gu when she remembered Yu Ling and confirmed with him that he had already killed him. Master Gu replied that he had helped her kill Yu Ling, the one who had bullied his fiance. Yu Mingkong immediately exploded in rage when she heard Master Gu claim that he was helping her kill Yu Ling when he was the one eyeing his inheritance. But Master Gu calmly shrugged his shoulders and reminded her that if she hadn't been bullied by Yu Ling, he wouldn't have known who Yu Ling was, so she shouldn't blame it all on him. Yu Mingkong's fire was immediately extinguished, she couldn't refute what Master Gu said, and it felt like a huge walk had comically been placed on her head. Yu Mingkong's guards marveled at the sight of her chasing Master Gu, yelling that he shouldn't dare think of using her as his scapegoat. Meanwhile, Master Gu took a step back and teased her for being mad at him again, suggesting that she should learn to be more mature. Suddenly, Master Gu raised his two fingers, and a golden light gleamed at their tips. He then materialized an enlightenment cushion in the palm of his hands, which made Yu Mingkong stop in her tracks. Her eyes widened with surprise as Master Gu told her that he wouldn't tease her anymore and handed her the enlightenment cushion, explaining that it was part of Yi Ling's inheritance from the Emperor of Reincarnation. Yu Mingkong stared intensely at the enlightenment cushion. She couldn't believe that Master Gu was just giving it to her when even those in the sacred realm would desire it. Then she remembered that the issue with the feathered clan was also because of her. Swiftly, Yu Mingkong snatched the enlightenment cushion out of Master Gu's hand and turned her back on him, prompting Master Gu to ask if she wasn't going to thank him at all. Meanwhile, the system notified Master Gu that Yu Mingkong had a change in attitude, resulting in him receiving fortune and fate points. This made Master Gu smile smugly and refer to Yu Mingkong as his little sugar mama in his head. As Yu Mingkong stored the enlightenment cushion, Master Gu glanced at her and, with a smile on his face, pointed out that it seemed she really liked his present. Yu Mingkong narrowed her eyes in suspicion and asked Master Gu why he was suddenly being so nice to her. She murmured that in the past, it was considered great when he wasn't ignoring her. Master Gu suddenly grabbed her by the waist. While Master Gu told her that he hadn't realized before how attractive she was and hoped he wasn't too late in realizing her beauty, Yu Mingkong was too startled to respond. Her eyes were wide open, and she was blushing. Master Gu dragged Yu Mingkong away from their companions and suggested they go see what mysterious things were hidden in the mountain valley. Yin Mei then gave an order for everyone to spread out in all four directions and keep things safe for Master Gu and Yin Mei. Master Gu and Yu Mingkong landed on the ground. The golden aura started to dissipate in the area, and Master Gu figured out that those were traps that had been laid there for a long time. He recognized that Yu Mingkong was capable, to which Yu Mingkong responded that the divine spirit would be born somewhere around the area, so it was only natural that she had to plan things more carefully. Walking ahead of her, Master Gu pointed out that he had figured out that she knew things about the divine spirit except for the time at which it would be born. Yu Mingkong was surprised and could not believe that Master Gu could calculate when the divine spirit would be born. While Yu Mingkong still couldn't believe what she had just discovered, Master Gu, with his back turned towards her, was smiling mischievously. In his thoughts, he was laughing because he never thought Yu Mingkong would be that easy to trick, which made him realize that the divine spirit was about to be born soon. After a moment, as Master Gu continued to walk in front of her, Yu Mingkong directly asked Master Gu if he was planning to leave her behind later to grab the divine spirit for himself. 
Master Gu stopped in his tracks and, without turning to look at Yu Ming Kong, asked her if she really thought of him as someone who would do such a thing. Yu Ming Kong asked if that was not the case. With a downhearted expression, Master Gu glanced at her and acknowledged that it was how she had always thought of him. He then turned to look at her, his eyebrows furrowed and his face anguished, and asked if he had ever done something to harm her that made her so cautious of him. Upon seeing his pained expression, Yu Ming Kong looked worried as she answered that he had not done harm to her, but in the back of her mind, she was thinking that at least at the moment, he hadn't yet. Master Gu crossed his arms, turned his back on Yu Ming Kong, and said that those who don't know about them would most likely think that he had done something terrible to her in the past. Yu Ming Kong thought that he was right, he had used her as his scapegoat and killed her in her past life. While intently observing Master Gu, Yu Ming Kong saw that he seemed to be really angry about what had happened. With Master Gu throwing a tantrum in front of her, she thought that his sudden change in nature must have been influenced by her regression. On the other hand, Master Gu, who was frowning and having a tantrum, thought that even though he had considered taking the divine spirit for himself, since Yu Ming Kong had already guessed his plan and exposed it to his face, he should care about saving face. Both Yu Ming Kong and Master Gu, who was still looking upset with his arms crossed, appeared out of a warp in space at the same time. Yu Ming Kong tried to talk to Master Gu and appease him somehow, but she could not say a complete sentence as every time she tried to say something. Master Gu interrupted her by exhaling sharply through his nose with his mouth closed, which was his way of expressing annoyance. Yu Ming Kong was now feeling down and guilty, wondering why she felt like she had lost something important. She then thought that perhaps her obsession with Master Gu was not just to take revenge on him. They arrived in front of the Immortal Gate. Master Gu looked up, recognized the Immortal Gate, and figured out that Yu Ming Kong had found the gate a long time ago, but she didn't know how to open it. Yu Ming Kong was surprised when Master Gu turned to talk to her and told her that since she didn't believe him, she could go in first when the Immortal Gate opened. Or if she was worried that he would attack her from behind, she could also choose to follow after him instead. Yu Ming Kong looked crestfallen as she looked at the ground, telling Master Gu that she believed in him. Master Gu sarcastically told her that it was an honor for her to believe in him. Yu Ming Kong did not react to his sarcasm and went down to business. She told him that there were only two ways to open the Immortal Gate, one was to wait for it to automatically appear on its own, and the other was to use the Ascending Divine Record to open it. Master Gu smiled knowingly as Yu Ming Kong expressed her worries that the ancient immortal land would be in complete disarray by the time it appeared on its own and the disturbance would catch the attention of many supreme experts. However, she had heard nothing about where the Ascending Divine Record might be. He was thankful as he saw that the system shop was selling the Ascending Divine Record, but he was surprised that it cost 18,000 fate points, which was so pricey. Then he contemplated and realized that if he didn't purchase it, he wouldn't be able to get what he wanted. Yu Ming Kong's eyes were wide open in surprise as golden streaks of light passed in front of her. To her surprise, Master Gu had materialized the Ascending Divine Record in front of him, and she couldn't help but exclaim and question him about how he had it. Master Gu did not answer Yu Ming Kong's question and proceeded to throw the Ascending Divine Record into the opening of the Immortal Gate. As the portal started to open, Master Gu told Yu Ming Kong that he would be opening up the Immortal Gate and asked her if she wanted to go in first or enter later. Yu Ming Kong was surprised yet again when Master Gu told her that they would just see whose abilities would help them get to the Divine Spirit first. She was touched and thought that Master Gu was always thinking for her. She felt guilty as she looked down again, offering to stay out there to guard the place for him. She told him that she wouldn't fight with him over the Divine Spirit, and she also apologized for what she said before and for misunderstanding him. Yu Ming Kong closed her eyes and told Master Gu that if he was worried that she would sneak attack him, he could kill her at that moment and she wouldn't retaliate. Even if she did, she still wouldn't be a match for him. Upon hearing what Yu Ming Kong said, Master Gu rolled his eyes in annoyance and said nothing. Master Gu then glanced at Yu Ming Kong and observed her, wondering if his sudden change in attitude made her nervous. He figured out that Yu Ming Kong seemed to really care for him, to the point where she would let go of the divine spirit that she had been planning for, and to the extent that she wouldn't care if she died. He never thought that she would be someone like that. A strong aura of purple, gold, and white surged upward and pierced through the sky. Yu Ming Kong's expressions were a mix of surprise and horror as the immortal gate opened in front of her. Master Gu noticed it, so he asked her why she was suddenly looking as though he had wronged her, and why he would want to kill her. When Yu Ming Kong was about to respond that it was because of his secret, he cut her off and told her that he would never kill her. Yu Ming Kong blushed, and she was expectant when she asked him why he would not kill her. But when Master Gu told her that it was because she was more useful to him alive than dead, her expression turned grim, and she was speechless. Yu Ming Kong bit her lip as she reminded herself how cruel Master Gu was like that. As Master Gu quickly entered the gates and told Yu Ming Kong that he was going, and it was up to her if she wanted to follow after him. 
Yuming Kong recalled that in the memories of her past life, the immortal road would be open for half a month, and only those who had reached the peak of immortal's power would be allowed to enter and understand the secrets of how to become a primordial immortal. As she thought about how cautious and clever Master Gu was with his schemes, she stomped her feet on the ground and cursed, hoping that nothing bad would happen to him. Crossing her arms, she became mad when she caught herself worrying about Master Gu. She could not believe that she was still concerned about him. As Master Gu traversed through the gate, he looked back at Yu Ming Kong, then smiled and called her a dummy in his head. He reached the other end of the gate, which led to a vast and enchanting land. Glowing, cute little spirits surrounded Master Gu's feet as they landed on the ground. He immediately summoned his bottle and, as he looked at the spirit hovering over the palm of his hand, he wondered how many realms he would be able to break through by using the energy of those divine spirits. He smiled sinisterly as his bottle started to absorb the small spirits, saying that he was really looking forward to it. Someone extremely fast was intensely battling against monsters. It was Gu Ziner who simultaneously blocked the attack from behind her with her sword and attacked the monster in front of her with a kick. Afterward, she used the force between her sword and her enemy's weapon to maneuver herself in the air and deliver a turning kick to her other opponent's face. The beast slammed into the ground with such force that dust and rocks were thrown in all directions. However, to Gu Ziner's surprise, a mace suddenly appeared above her. She was unable to dodge the attack and crashed into the ground with great force, similar to what had happened with the beast she had just defeated. The beast that attacked Gu Ziner was furious with her and cursed her for killing his clansmen instead of being chosen and desired by him. While Gu Ziner was still lying on the now broken ground, the beast unleashed his move, the devouring earth-shattering thunder, and told her to just die. Quickly, Gu Ziner stood up and retorted to the beast that no one would want to be with someone who looks like a pig. She prepared for her move, the three-way green flare slash. However, before she could execute her move, the shabby man from earlier beat her to it and performed the same technique. An intense blue aura appeared, shredding the mace into pieces, including the beast that wielded it. The shabby man stood in front of Gu Ziner, and she asked him who he was and why he knew their Gu family's divine skill. The shabby man glanced at her and smiled, presuming that Gu Ziner was stunned by his handsome appearance and cool entrance. Little did he know, Gu Ziner looked at him uncomfortably and wondered how long it had been since he brushed his teeth. A few moments later, Gu Ziner crossed her arms and found it hard to believe what the shabby man, Gu Nanchen, told her that he was her ancestor. She narrowed her eyes suspiciously and questioned why she should believe him. Gu Nanchen scratched his ear, contemplating how he should answer her question. Suddenly, the Great Elder appeared in a warp in space behind Gu Nanchen. Gu Ziner greeted him gleefully and inquired about his presence on the ancient immortal continent. The Great Elder informed Gu Ziner that Gu Nanchen was indeed her family's ancestor. As the Great Elder stroked his beard, he cast a sideways glance at Gu Nanchen's arms, while Gu Nanchen draped one arm around the Great Elder's shoulders and smiled at Gu Ziner, asking if she believed him now. Gu Ziner stared at Gu Nanchen in awe and concluded that since he was her ancestor, he must be incredibly powerful. She quickly bowed her head to the ground before Gu Nanchen and he chuckled at how obedient and cute she was, while the Great Elder sighed and requested for Gu Nanchen to get off of him. Gu Ziner looked at Gu Nanchen expectantly as he grabbed her arms and reassured her that no one could bully her, not even Master Gu, as long as he was there. Gu Ziner's eyes twinkled as she confirmed with Gu Nanchen if what he said was true, that he could even beat Master Gu. Gu Nanchen crossed his arms, proudly confirmed, and told Gu Ziner not to worry as Master Gu wouldn't be able to harm her with him around. Gu Ziner seemed disappointed as she asked him if that was all he could do, and Gu Nanchen was surprised that it was not enough, so he assumed that she was thinking of asking him for help to kill Master Gu. Gu Ziner brought her palms together and smiled as she denied that it was not what she was going to ask. She then told Gu Nanchen that she was wondering if he could help her suppress Master Gu's cultivation to a realm lower than hers, to which Gu Nanchen asked why she wanted such a thing. Gu Nanchen's mouth was agape, and his eyes widened in disbelief as Gu Ziner pumped up her fist, and declared that she needed his help to suppress Master Gu's cultivation to that of the Sacred Emperor realm so that she could completely obliterate him in front of the others. The Great Elder calmly stroked his beard and said nothing when Gu Nanchen approached and whispered to him, confirming that Gu Ziner hated Master Gu. Gu Ziner asked Gu Nanchen if he had not properly investigated things before coming, as there was something fishy regarding what happened in the past, and Gu Chang's hidden talent seems to be spatial talent. Upon hearing what Gu Ziner said, Gu Nanchen was surprised because, although the Dao Bone was amazing, compared to spatial talent, it was not as important or essential. He questioned how a demonic monster like Master Gu could be born into their Gu family. As Gu Nanchen laughed and acknowledged that Gu Ziner knew everything, praising how great it was that she understood Master Gu's effort, the Great Elder was startled, and it seemed that he had realized something. The Great Elder quickly turned his head to look at Gu Nanchen, 
his mouth agape and his eyes filled with horror. On the other hand, gigantic ships surrounded the Feather Clan's abode. One of them was the primordial demonic sex ship, and the cultivators who had gathered below the ships couldn't believe that the primordial demonic sect would arrive so suddenly and block the ancestral site, waiting for Master Gu to arrive. They also discussed how mysterious and powerful the Chengsheng Gu family was, and speculated that if a war were to break out, it definitely wouldn't be on a smaller scale. A man with large, red eyebrows and golden armor asked someone how they would explain the Feather Clan's attack on Master Gu with a divine weapon, while multiple disciples behind him chanted to eliminate the Feather Clan. He was stepping on the face of the young master of the Feather Clan and told him that everyone in the Feather Clan deserved to be eliminated. The young master, whose eyes were filled with tears due to pain, recognized the primordial demonic sect and asked them if they truly intended to instigate a war with his Feather Clan. He also threatened that they would be punished for bullying them. The man simply smiled and told the young master not to be in such a hurry as Master Gu has yet to arrive, so the show has yet to start. Meanwhile, Yu Ming Kong was guarding the immortal gate, and she sensed a spiritual energy with the runes that had been leaking out. Her eyes widened with surprise as she felt the presence and aura of someone in the sacred realm about to come out of the gate. Meanwhile, Master Gu was protecting himself with a purple sphere as blue lightning kept attacking him, to the point that the sphere started to crack as he traversed through the immortal road. Master Gu was covered in bruises, and he anxiously looked back thinking that the heavenly thunder was incessant in its chase. Yu Mingkong stared at the gate with anticipation as she wondered if what she sensed was Master Gu's true cultivation level. She thought about how he had reached the sacred realm when he was only around 20 years of age and how it could really be the start of a nightmare for anyone who caught Master Gu's eyes. As Master Gu stepped out of the gate, Yu Mingkong stood in front of him and said nothing. Master Gu's clothes were tattered, and his upper body was exposed when he stepped out of the gate. He cursed and questioned if the heavenly thunder was really trying to kill him. Yu Mingkong tried to stop herself from laughing by covering her mouth with her hand. But a burst of air escaped from her nose and mouth, making a sound that caught Master Gu's attention. Master Gu wrapped his arms around Yu Mingkong's shoulders and teased her, saying that if his body was that nice to look at, then she should feel free, as he was going to be her husband anyway. This made Yu Mingkong blush and yell at him to put on some clothes. But Master Gu did not stop there and told her that he would let her take advantage of him, to which she yelled back, saying that no one would want to do that. Both of them looked at the immortal gate that was about to close. Master Gu said that since it was opened before its designated time, it wouldn't be easy for it to be opened again. Yu Mingkong told him that it was not important, as no one knew that he had entered before them. Master Gu agreed, acknowledging that aside from her, no one else knew about what happened. Hearing what Master Gu had just said about her being the only one who knew about the things that had transpired, her face went pale and her eyes filled with horror. While she pondered what Master Gu meant, she assured him not to worry, stating that she wouldn't speak a word about the recent events to anyone. Master Gu glanced at her, observing her change in behavior, and recalled the Chinese saying being afraid of the rope after getting bitten by a snake, which perfectly described her current state, being afraid when he had merely mentioned those things in passing. He asked her why she seemed so nervous and assured her that he knew she would never betray him. Summoning his bottle, blue streaks of light started flooding out of it. Yu Mingkong was taken by surprise as she found herself surrounded by the little blue spirits, known as divine spirits. Master Gu turned his back on her and calmly walked away, mentioning that these spirits were painstakingly gathered for her. However, he advised her not to overthink it and to consider it as though he was giving her what he had left over. Yu Mingkong stared at his back in disbelief, contemplating how Master Gu had given her these spirits obtained at great risk to his own life. Pursing her lips, she pondered how things would have been wonderful if she hadn't said what she did to Master Gu earlier. She decided to call out to him and ask if he was truly planning to walk away like that. A few moments later, a streak of purple light moved in the direction of one of the ships. It was Master Gu, now dressed in a different set of clothes. As he landed on the ship, multiple people kneeled and greeted him. Master Gu smiled knowingly, looking straight ahead, confident that his own strength and the puppets he possessed were more than enough to defeat multiple ancient immortal clans. While the ship of the primordial demonic sect traveled alongside his ships, he also contemplated gaining support from his mother's faction. If the Feather Clan intended to kill him, he planned to use them as an example. Smiling, he gazed into the distance, thinking about the great elder who still owed him a favor and should have arrived at the ancient immortal land. He was also aware of the ancestor from the Gu family, though he didn't know which one had come. Nevertheless, he would find a way to seek their assistance. With numerous ships surrounding the one he was on, Master Gu called out to everyone, instructing them to follow him into the Feather Clan's ancestral site. Four disciples of the Feather Clan intercepted the ships and called out to Master Gu. They hovered over where Master Gu was, demanding that he release their young master and telling him that if he wanted to fight, he should face them honorably instead of taking their young master hostage. Master Gu glared at them, 
looking clueless about which young master they were referring to. The man in the golden armor, who had caught Master Gu's attention earlier, landed on his ship and tossed the young master to the ground. He told Master Gu that the young master was the person they were looking for and that he wanted revenge for his childhood sweetheart. With his face beaten and one tooth missing, the young master still had the guts and energy to threaten Master Gu, vowing to kill him to avenge Yu Jing. When the disciples of the Feather Clan saw their young master, Yu Xuan, they demanded that Master Gu return him to them. Master Gu smiled when he realized who Yu Xuan was and thought that the two brainless idiots truly matched each other. Using his aura, Master Gu lifted Yu Xuan off the ship and agreed to the Feather Clan's demands, telling them to catch him. Master Gu infused his aura into Yu Xuan's chest before hurling him towards the Feather Clan's disciples. One of the disciples caught Yu Xuan, and the rest rushed towards their young master to check on him, noticing that Yu Xuan's chest was now glowing golden. The disciple who caught him was startled when Yu Xuan's body began to crack and intensely shine with a golden color. Even his eyes glowed intensely as he cursed Master Gu and asked what he had done to him, as the spiritual energy inside his body ran amok. The disciple started to figure out what was happening, but it was already too late. There was a huge explosion in front of Master Gu's ship. As the smoke dissipated, the man in the golden armor bowed behind Master Gu and told him that since the conflict had already begun, he would take his men and kill all those from the Feather Clan. This made Master Gu sigh and tell him to stop saying that he would annihilate the entire clan, as he must know whom to spare and give another chance. Master Gu let out a sinister smile and said that if the Feather Clan continued to be disobedient, they would have to let them kill each other. Multiple streaks of light hopped off Master Gu's ship and charged towards one of the Feather Clan's floating abodes. Meanwhile, Gu Nanshan, who was hiding with Gu Zioner and the Great Elder on a warp in space, acknowledged Master Gu's strategies and actions as befitting their Gu family's young master. The Great Elder calmly stroked his beard and thought that they truly were family, with even their way of thinking being the same. Gu Zioner grabbed Gu Nanshan's cape, she seemed worried about the Feather Clan's sacred realm expert, but Gu Nanshan thought that Master Gu had something up his sleeve, as he observed that Master Gu looked confident. Master Gu hovered over many of the Feather Clan's flying disciples and called their attention, warning them that it was their last chance to choose whether they wanted to surrender or die. People inside the building expressed their disdain for Master Gu and told him that if it weren't for their agreement with the outside world, they wouldn't have bothered to fight against a brat like him. They even declared that the Feather Clan was not easy to bully and called his tactics of pushing them around utter nonsense. They were the Feather Clan's elders, and they were in a panic because the Dragon Clan had yet to reply to their request for help, even though everything had happened because of the true dragon plaque they possessed. One of the elders said that the only thing they could do was to ask their ancestor to return from seclusion to help them. Master Gu mockingly looked down on them and thought that both the Feather Clan, and the Black Eagle Clan had wings, but the Black Eagle Clan was far more clever. Master Gu ordered his men to kill the Feather Clan while some of the disciples were below them, ready to fight. An intense fight ensued, but Master Gu's troops quickly overpowered the Feather Clan's disciples. The disciples were so enraged that their eyes were bloodshot as they told Master Gu that even if they were to die, he would never be able to taint the prestige of the Feather Clan's name and that he should pay with his life for killing both Yu Jing and Yu Xuan. As Master Gu started to emit sparks of his aura, he looked down on the enraged disciples and mocked them, saying that they didn't have the ability to kill him. However, their cultivations weren't that low, so it would be perfect for him to test himself since he hadn't crossed blades with anyone since breaking through to the next realm. Master Gu looked ominous as he emitted a crimson lightning aura and lunged down towards the disciples, declaring that he would christen his sword with their blood. With a swift zigzag motion, Master Gu struck one disciple after another, and the disciples' bodies fell down towards their abode like flies. He kept lunging downward, and as he almost landed in the abode, the divine weapon, spinning golden wheel, wielded by two disciples, greeted him. Master Gu was unfazed, he kept lunging downward and used his sacred treasure, the heaven-piercing ruler. It destroyed the spinning golden wheel in an instant, and the disciples wielding the divine weapon were hit by its crushing force and thrown backwards. The force of the heaven-piercing ruler was so strong that it managed to pierce itself into the abode and damage it. Meanwhile, Gu Zioner was so surprised by what she had just witnessed that she could not say anything. While Gu Nanshan called Master Gu a brat and commented that he must be trying to face the entire group of experts from the Feather Clan all by himself, Master Gu hovered beside the heaven-piercing ruler and turned to look in Gu Nanshan's direction with a sly smile on his face. Gu Nanshan was surprised by what Master Gu had just done and thought that with Master Gu's current cultivation, he should not be able to tell that he had hidden himself there. 
However, he started to doubt himself and wondered if he was mistaken. As the heaven-piercing ruler dissipated into thin air, Master Gu turned his attention toward the elders who were shielding themselves, panicking to summon their ancestor. And he called them cowards for sending the younger generations of their clan to face him instead of coming out themselves. Master Gu landed on the abode and told the elders that they had two choices, either concede to him or try in vain to kill him and die by his hands. The elders responded by threatening him, saying that he would die a painful death for doing many terrible things and manipulating everyone through his tactics. Master Gu looked confident as he told the elders that they were mistaken because their clan was the one who tried to kill him in order to gain favor with the dragon clan. Therefore, they couldn't blame him for seeing through their plan and foiling it with a plan of his own. One of the elders confronted Master Gu and asked him if taking away the lives of his granddaughter, Yu Jin, and the Feather Clan's young master, Yu Xuan, was not enough and if he was trying to push them to the brink. He was about to threaten Master Gu, but he was not able to finish what he was saying as Master Gu slapped his face with the back of his hand and told him that he was all talk and had no intention of fighting himself. Then he asked him if he was trying to use words to resolve the war between them. Master Gu disdainfully looked at them and told them that they had cultivated for at least a few thousand years, but their courage had all but gone to shit, so they should just stop wasting his time and die. One of the elders was provoked, but another elder stopped him and told him not to fall into Master Gu's trap. Master Gu closed his eyes and calmly smiled, saying that since they were not planning to make a move, he would do so himself. But Master Gu's smile was wiped off his face, replaced by an inquisitive stare when something caught his attention. A lady with six golden wings appeared in front of Master Gu and told him not to push his luck. She was the Feather Clan's ancestor, a quasi-sacred realm expert of the third rank. The Feather Clan rejoiced that their ancestor had awakened, as they believed it would ensure their victory in the fight, and Master Gu would surely meet his demise. As her feet landed on the abode, she immediately mentioned the Gu family's act of killing her brethren and destroying their clan grounds. Her wings dissipated into a fiery aura as she walked past the elders and demanded an explanation from Master Gu now that she had made her presence known. With a sinister expression on her face, she threatened that she might accidentally turn all of them to dust if she wasn't provided with one. 